Tableau is the most widely used data visualization tool in the world, and the average salary of a Tableau developer is $110,000 per annum. A quick scan through the current job openings reveals that top companies such as Facebook, Dell, and General Motors are looking for Tableau developers. So, keeping the importance of Tableau in mind, we have come up with this full course. This course will be taken by Mr. Vivekanand, who is a data visualization consultant with 10 years of experience. Now, before we start off with this session, I'd like to inform you guys that we'll be coming up with more such full courses on artificial intelligence, data science, and cloud computing. So please do subscribe to Greek Learning's YouTube channel and click on the bell icon so that you have a notification of our upcoming videos. Now, let's have a quick glance at the agenda. We'll start off with an introduction to visual analytics. Then we'll see how to connect our data with Tableau. After that, we'll understand what are dimensions and measures. Going ahead, we'll work with the different types of charts in Tableau. Following which, we'll learn about storyboarding in Tableau. And finally, we'll work with dashboards in Tableau. So let's start off with the session. I guess the whole um, uh, a formal structured approach of data collection typically started off in the 80s, if you think about it, in a, in a more structured manner. And yes, obviously, there was a lot of hesitation. New technology was coming up. Uh, we always noticed that at some point in time, no matter how much data was being collected at some point in time, the upper curve, there was always a gap between what was understood versus what the data was available, right? Obviously, a lot of other things, Y2K scare and all this thing in there. And like towards the end of the decade, when all this myth was vanishing, there was more adaptability and all that. So obviously data collection got a bit better and better and we just kept going on and on at it. So all of a sudden in the year 2013, uh, IBM had done some survey, okay? And they published these numbers and it came up in some Time magazines and all that. And a lot of people were really aghast when they saw these stats put together. These two numbers, 90% in two years, when the numbers put together, it means something, okay? Any guesses? These two numbers put together. Probably that 90% data was collected in the last two years. Absolutely. Absolutely. You nailed it. 90% of the world's data had just come in from the previous two years of the time span. Okay. So 2011-12 gave 90% of the world's data. So imagine the kind of gap versus availability. All of a sudden, the pattern changed to something like this. There was a huge, there was a wider gap. People had to kind of really go towards it and bridge it. And now they say there is opportunity and all that, and which is why now... We keep hearing all these big terms, fancy terms. You guys are sitting here possibly because of this, because of this huge increase in data. I mean, people feel if you don't do something, you'll get left behind, right? All right. So uh, again, as you're learning, you're learning multiple techniques. Data visualization is one of the techniques. It's a very vital technique. It's a science. It's not an art. Clearly, it's not art. It's not some. It's not your whims and fancies. It is a science that has to be used, right? So um, we'll kind of work it through a structured process and th th this is going to be completely hands-on. Okay. Unlike your other sessions, I mean, you, it's going to be very less of, th this is the only first few slides I'm ever going to put up. There's no more slides here. Okay. It'll be completely hands-on. So um, reason why um, this is given a lot of importance um, by everybody is not because I'm saying it or not because you are, you like it or it's easy or not because of that. If you actually think about your human brain's makeup, right, anatomically speaking, a very large chunk of the human brain is actually devoted towards vision, right? And so we can clearly see things, our neurons are well trained to see things. And more importantly, we are very good at spotting patterns. We can spot patterns and trends very well, provided you do things right, okay? You got to do things right to make sure it happens. Now, that's the catch to it. You got to understand how, what, what, what will kind of add to its strength, what will add to its weakness. The square and rectangle, for example, was a strength. So you guys got the number three and four instantaneously. But the circle was a weakness to your brain. So you guys were not able to understand that right. Okay, so we've got to kind of explore things like these and so do what is right for the brain. If you can get that right, it will solve your issues very, very largely. We'll talk more about that. Okay, I've broken this entire 16 hours of our interaction to a seven stage process. Okay, I'm not going to go in this order necessarily for you all, but this is your framework. You've got to always keep recollecting these points in your head when you are trying to understand this. If you take an approach in this seven, eight, seven, eight points, 
you will likely to be you you you're at a point of getting a better understanding over the uh, over the entire uh, data science basically okay okay to start with you need to understand um what is cognitive perception okay what does this mean what is cognitive perception english no sigma no t stat no f stat no z stat nothing It's simple english what does this mean yeah okay now suppose you want to now the tableau is mm -hmm. over I'm pretty sure a lot. For example, your company is a You you learn something. Um, so when you when you when you uh, fair enough. You 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 kind of close. Okay. Yes. Somebody said something else. Somebody had something else. You saying? Perceiving by experiences. Uh, yes, experiences play a big role in perceiving it. Yes. Again, uh, kind of kind of you you guys still have the same point. Experiences and kind of constantly seeing something tends to get you to understand something. Sure. Anything else? Well, say sales forces. Uh, can you elaborate? Give me an example. Usernames and usernames and passwords. Drag and drop it. Simple as that. Okay. It's a no brainer. Nice. Interesting. Okay. All right. 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 Okay. Uh, you want a Facebook report? You can bring in all that multiple links to bring. Fair enough. Facebook fair enough. Okay. All right. Um, here is where we're going to talk about um, the strengths and weaknesses of the brain. Okay. Um, like I said, uh, if you do things to support your brain, you'll get your answers right. If you don't, you it'll not work well. Now, um, in other words, if I need to kind of defragment this, cognitive perception is what you see is what you get basically. When you see something, how effectively are you able to understand and make sense out of it now? Now, taking this to a data or approach, when you see something, how quickly are you able to spot the trends and patterns so I can get some quick decisions in the, out of it? That's what it is, right? Now, the best things, or the, the, this works very well when you guys are able to get the answers in the absence of a conscious thought. Think about it, like a reflex action. If you hit a 105 centigrade hot water, hot, hot boiling hot water, you'll take your hand off instantaneously. So you need to be able to react in that kind of a speed, basically, right? So we will support the brain to do things like that now. We'll take a simple example, okay, to start with. Let's say I have three divisions that I'm taking care of. I'm not telling you what the division is. I'm not telling you what the metric is. I'm not telling you what number it is. All I'm saying is I have three divisions. My first division, I'm just going to highlight it in a green color. The second division in amber color, third in red color. What do these colors mean to you? Good, bad, and mediocre, right? Now, you guys, there you go. Without even understanding or knowing what it is, you know that that metric is going good. Do you think about how your brain just processed it? So, culturally, we know that some colors are good, some are bad, right? So, you kind of caught that, right? Cultural expectations, and you learn constantly, yeah, taking back what you said. We'll take another example. Take another example, okay? Let's say I've got 10 companies, okay? 10 companies, and lay, say the first company is blue, green, yellow, orange, pink, maroon, gold, silver, orange, gray, gold, different colors. Have the colors now imparted any meaning to your report? So colors or something, so something when used for the sake of being used does not aid in cognitive perception, rather it will lead to something called as visual clutter. Okay, that's another point. Now you've got to be very conscious about this. Uh, even the finest of softwares that you use is going to generate clutter by itself. So you need to have a very conscious eye to remove elements which is going to cause clutter. Now. The way this works is, now this doesn't matter. You can even work in a something something as basic as an Excel platform, it doesn't matter. Most rudimentary uh, platform ever you can think about. Even in an Excel platform, you guys can make it nice and clutter-free provided you are able to strip out certain elements from the default view. We'll take us, let's talk about this for a minute, okay? I want you guys to ponder this, put this thought in your head for a minute. Any data view that you see, is a combination of data ink and non-data ink components. Okay, data ink and non-data ink components. And I'll tell you what that means. Say, for example, you are 60 of you here. Suppose I want to take your, uh, say, some score. See, you all have given a data mining courses, right? So you've done that. I'll say, hey, listen, I want to look at this class, get their marks for data mining, and I want to pick up the top four or five or something, or some logic in here, okay? So I take your names, I take your score, I can make this into a bar chart, possible, okay? If I saw this from high to low, I'll exactly know the top three or four, I'll get it. Now, all I wanted to get this chart out was just your name and your score, okay? With this alone, I can pretty much get your charts out. Data Inc. Now let's look at what are some non-data ink components. Huge titles, 
colors for all the bars okay grid lines some unnecessary trend line excessive charts excessive labels excessive dot points uh, very thick borders very dark concentrated colors think about a chart that looks like this now so what will happen is you guys will rather than focusing on the bar chart and the top four you'll be looking at all the other distractors so your focus is more gone to your non data ink now anytime any visual dominates more non data ink that leads to clutter so you got to be able to consciously bring down the non data ink component to the bare minimum okay it's required but not to such a point that it dominates it so that's something that you should be your approach towards your visual clutter again we'll look at examples constantly and then you'll know how to remove this i'll keep talking about this every now and then okay okay choose an appropriate display mechanism what do you think this is very very important most important correct choosing a chart type to best explain your business problem okay uh this is where you got to take a very very clear stance and a very strong grasp about what charts to create when the good thing is it's not very hard it's pretty simple okay now um every data that we have is broken into discrete and continuous variables data is always this okay a combination of this is what is going to drive your chart choice let me ask you throw a simple question at you one discrete variable and one continuous variable what's the best chart choice what is the first chart that comes to your mind histogram is not one discrete one continuous this is one discrete and one continuous bar bar not even line bar bar just a bar chart nothing does a better job than a bar chart now let's take another kind of a field i'll give you a date variable and a measure called sales what's the best chart choice not histogram histogram so be be careful about histogram please please take it off your head histogram is not a chart histogram is a different chart okay just take uh, take it off your just erase it from your memory line chart why, now tell me why why do you say line chart in this case trend, trend is one thing you look for in a line chart okay what next there are a few things to look for in a line chart trend is one then what so uh, key takeaways like one thing is you'll find there what's the trend for the overall line is it going up going down going flat okay that's the first thing you look for in a line chart what else what else Mm -hmm. no right right now i just want to know um the line chart is designed so we are now on the line chart i just want to know what are the key elements you look for in a line chart don't differentiate just tell me what you see in a line chart you'll see a trend ups and downs peaks and troughs or other peaks and troughs i want pointers like that okay peaks and troughs okay so you can see where is your highs and lows great what else what else trend is one peaks and lows or ups and downs whatever okay same thing then what one more there is actually two more two more to pattern for what so that's the peaks and troughs okay so uh modify that a little bit modify that i just want the correct term for it you probably got it got it right but i want the right term for it that's the peaks and troughs that the same thing uh sorry pardon me forecast no forecast is what is is a derivative that's one step ahead before that first first let's get the basics of a line chart uh you can in fact if you want to look at performance between between two times i'll choose a different chart so i'll come back to you okay just give me a minute sorry exactly a recurring pattern yeah a recurring pattern so what's that you call them as seasonality or being cyclic exactly right so these are some key first basic factors first basic steps these are the first four things you look for in a line chart okay peaks and troughs trends uh recurring patterns for seasonality or being cyclic exactly let me ask you a question suppose i am trying to plot the sales of a walmart store um for about four years of data how the sales for a walmart look in the month of december Hi. How the sales for the month May look like compared to December? There you go. Exactly what you said, right? Every year on your uh, same thing. Yeah, it's seasonal and it's going to be repetitive, cyclic. It's going to keep being cyclical in nature. So these are some key things you look for on a line chart. Okay. Histogram is different. Who has a histogram? Um, what? When do you? When? It, what, what is the difference between a histogram and a bar chart? They're not the same. They look like the same, but they're not the same. What is a histogram made up of? it is a count of frequency it's a count of a frequency okay so uh, if i need to make a histogram what is the variable type i've got to have one how many continuous variables one exactly you take that one so i have sales for say 100 days okay i'm going to basically create bins artificial buckets and count the number of transactions which and make it look like a bar chart 
that's not a bar chart very different okay they two fundamentally different things so don't mix histogram with the bar chart okay now this is the meat of our learning guys okay if you get this right um you'll pretty much get most of it right i must say okay um this has some techniques has some methods and of course we'll explore multiple options some basic charts custom charts um and so on and so forth so we'll really spend some time on that okay and i'll and and it's quite simple in tableau we can create multiple options of charts it's not all that hard so we'll really get the hang of it right uh dashboard design i'm sure you all know what dashboards are all i'm going to tell you is just three things when you guys want to design a dashboard okay uh you all do you all design dashboards at work do you all make dashboards at at work for yourselves okay so there are three factors three things three large guidelines i'll give you first and foremost you have to be able to get the right content relevant content consistent content so you need to give a give a give it a, a lot of thought on what content has to be put inside a dashboard that's an entire field of study okay again we'll talk about that we'll see how to kind of get the right content how to we take some examples the second part of your dashboard design is your actual physical layout of the dashboard okay first is your content what goes into the dashboard then the actual layout of the dashboard okay and the third pillar of your dashboard to work is your interactivity okay interactivity now obviously if you don't make it interactive you made a ppt you made nothing more than a ppt so you don't want that happening right so you need to have a combination of all these three to make an effective dashboard okay content layout and interactivity again we'll make a first dashboard before we take a first tea break today tab okay with some charts and all that so we'll make one in that i'll talk about these three factors in it as well okay okay the uh, next thing i want to talk about is something called explore visually okay one of your most under utilized parts of visualization basically okay um which part where are you all right now in your uh, capstones is it started okay so um that case make it a point you guys don't know no don't don't miss sunday session for sure okay on sunday i have a small activity plan wherein i'll be able to give you a good start a head start on your capstones okay so i'm going to take a data set completely unknown data set okay um all i'm going to do is basically uh make you guys do some very simple techniques in it okay and i'm going to get you guys to run some simple techniques make some simple charts choose the correct all these all these techniques no minimal clutter correct chart choice try to amplify cognition put them into a dashboard in a method slightly different methodology okay uh, and i'll make them all interact and all that and it is a data that you guys have no idea about you guys are going to see for the first time but once you guys have this dashboard designed to explore visually you guys will be able to simply be able to talk about the business like really well like you know the whole thing really well you'll be able to explore patterns hidden patterns um patterns that you didn't even expect in the data okay so that's something which i think will be very very efficient useful for a person who's trying to see a data for the first time and if you folks are working on your capstones right now i would recommend you start with this start with this and then start whatever techniques you want to look at it will help you to get a clear lay of the land you'll be able to generate more hypothesis with that you'll be able to kind of really pick it up in a very efficient manner so uh sunday we'll look at how to work this out okay another um interesting uh talk is about how to analyze visually okay this may sound similar to your previous few points but this analyze visually and uh choosing your display mechanism okay point 3 and point uh 7 there is a connection in this now so you guys can draw and if you want to so what this does basically is uh when you choose a chart choice we took an example of a bar and line chart okay so that's one thing now let's take a couple of scenarios suppose i want to take um just the say this is a class of about say say 60 of you here okay now, i want to take 60 people's marks and i want to look at a bar chart a bar is doable a smaller number of records okay now let's say i want to slightly up the game a little bit instead of looking at 60 people let's say i want to take in about say 100000 people 100000 records if i need to bring in records of all the 100000 people into a particular chart or into a particular screen how do you think that's going to look like you think it's going to clutter you think it's going to clutter or looks messy or cramped and spaced or too big a scroll bar you know all these issues can happen now just because i've got more data you can't blame it saying it's cluttered okay now this is not a clutter issue this is not clutter clutter is something that you have to be able to ensure that it's not there when i have more number of data points you can't call that as clutter 
it's like saying, hey, a store is selling five products. I can make a bar chart. If the store is selling 5,000 products, it's going to be cluttered. I'm sorry, that's not the way it is. That's the business. You should be happy selling 5,000 products. Okay. Now, there are techniques to display this data. There are some special techniques which we can bring in here, which are what I'll talk about here in this case. Um, so it's like this. To, put, to, put, to put, give a layman's perspective right now, okay? Yeah, suppose I'm standing right here, okay? And I can see all your faces. This is one kind of an insight, okay? I'm able to pretty much see what are your laptops, what you're wearing, what color clothes you're wearing, uh, so on and so forth. I'm able to clearly see what's at near sight. Now try and put me on a high-rise building, okay? In a very high-rise building that's say 700 stories, okay? Can I see your faces any longer? I cannot. When I'm in that altitude, when I'm that height of a building, what can I probably see? Specs of buildings, like say uh, smaller things. If there is a, another high-rise building, or make me stand in the moon, okay? Or put me in a much higher, put me in an airplane, okay? From an airplane, what do I see? A bird's eye view. I can see tall high-rise buildings, okay? What looks massive to me from here might look like just like a speck on top, okay? That's another view. Now, this is an insight. That's also an insight. Me standing and looking at your face is an insight because I've got smaller data points. But if I'm put in an airplane and I'm seeing outside the window, then I see just specks in there. That is also an insight. Okay, now here's where you got to keep in mind. Now, just because you are in an airplane, don't, uh, with an airplane, I can never see your faces. I can never do that, okay? So if I need to look at something more specific, I choose an exact chart choice, take some charts for smaller sets of data and show this. When I have very large data points, my intention is not to say, hey, listen, what t-shirt is he wearing? From an airplane, I can't do that. Okay, if you want me to find that, I'm sorry, you're mistaken. Then you've got to change your approach a little bit. But if I want to see what is an overall view, where are the water bodies, where are the high-rise buildings, what does it look like, what's the terrain look like, that's the answer I'm supposed to get from a high-rise, from an airplane, right? Now, that's what this analyze visually will do. It gives you a bird's eye picture. You can put in lots of data, plenty of data, and get a high-level picture of what is happening. We look at some techniques for that. There's something called as trellis maps. Uh, something called a stable lenses, uh, time series, geospatial mapping, plenty of techniques are there. So we'll explore some ideas in there. It will give us some ideas. We'll use that as well. Absolutely. Tree map will be a part of that as well. Yes. I'll use tree maps in that as well. They'll all come in there as well. Yeah. Tree maps with different, uh, some options in there. Okay. We'll talk about that. You kind of said it right. Yeah. And lastly, we want to make storyboards. Okay. Storytelling. <clears throat> Quite a, a need of the art. Uh, how do you transform boring information or boring data into interesting stories? Okay. Uh, again, I'm pretty sure it'll be very vital for you guys in your capstones. Once you guys have done your analysis, if you are not able to present your idea in a nice appealing manner, no matter what work you've done in, uh, it, it goes for a toss. So presentation is very important. So also spend some time on that too. Okay. Make it fine and look it nice and clean and crisp and to the point. Make it attractive. Uh, make it funny, make it interesting, don't make it too boring, um, also helps. So we'll in fact uh, do one thing today before we leave, I'll make you guys do a small story today as well. So today that's something that I have kind of gotten planned here. Okay. Again, I'm not going to go in this specific order. I'm going to keep jumping orders. Uh, whenever something relevant comes up, I'll, I'll highlight one of these points. You guys can then relate back to these points. But this is your framework of your next 16 hours of our interaction, basically. Okay. So this is it. Okay, so let's get, uh, do some hands on right away now, okay? All right, I'll, I'll talk about the different uh, Tableau products later, okay, when uh, I'm wrapping up the session, but I'm gonna keep this for the last day's talk. So right now, let's not uh, spend some time on this. I wanna quickly jump into some hands on work for you guys right away, okay? All right, so uh, this is the interface. How many of you have used Tableau before here? Any, okay, so about two, three, okay, about, Okay, okay, quite a bit of you guys. So you've done some work. What level of work do you guys do? What level of work do you do, by the way? Okay. 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 And what about you? Uh, what like what what kind of work do you do normally? Okay. So what kind of uh, dashboards? Uh, I mean, uh, okay. 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 So, uh, well, let me ask you in terms of usage. I mean, have you, um, have you done things like LOD calculations and sets and all that? Have you done that? Uh, some advanced, uh, mapping techniques. Have you done that? Have you tried some geospatial? 
uh, have you tried uh, you use parameters and all that you know how to use parameters uh, actions and all that you guys know all that okay okay fairly okay good now okay so you guys have a fairly decent point and sorry you said something you also somebody's put up your hand there you also similar some of these guys supporting yeah and, and, and somebody had uh, yeah there's no change to that okay i'm not going to make it to visual table okay cognitive elements to action so your i'm going to work and i'm going to make you ask you guys have done some work in that you done some put up i want to bring in sales okay i'll drag it off sales and to my region mm. do is it's going to auto okay all right all right so Uh, for you guys who have done some work initially might seem a bit of bit like a recap or uh, may seem a little thing but as we go on i'm sure you might find i'm pretty sure you'll find some changes okay so we'll hopefully something has been done right now okay sorting order again i'll do sorting techniques it is already sorted the current mm -hmm. is end of the day yeah on the last day so um, on the last day uh, once i'm get that done pass all the basics uh, we'll talk about how to create some um, we will we'll I'll, i'll show you how to create a regression model in r i'll i'll be integrating r in tableau the last day wherein i'm going to create some models in there so we we're going to do visual regression we we'll talk about some clustering we'll talk about some uh, uh, simple forecasting techniques time series forecasting we'll talk about uh, uh, computing z scores you know that kind of stuff in there so i have a few ideas as well and i'll show you how to do a couple of things and then from there you guys can actually build on i'll show you how the integration happens with that it becomes fairly simple you can really pretty much build your skills from there onwards okay so let's begin guys okay all right so uh the ones who are seeing it for the first time okay it's just some basic housekeeping rules before we start uh you got to keep in mind that this tool does not um generate any data from it okay it's not like an excel platform where you can type in records and then start to do some reporting you need to feed it a structured database otherwise it's not going to work okay So when I say structured database, data has to be in the form of rows and columns, either a grid or a matrix. Okay, a data frame or a matrix is required. Um, unstructured is what, like I say, there are ten photographs. I can't just upload ten photos and say now find me an insight. Okay, or unstructured text and do some text mining. No, it does not work well in that kind of a space. It must have a structured database. Otherwise, it's not going to really work. Rows and columns are very very important. Okay, now having said that. um any structured database something as simple as an excel file or a csv file or a pdf table can be easily imported it's not really a big deal at all uh you can also bring in some more structures some more uh, complex structures like sql databases and hadoop tables and um salesforce reports you know that kind of google sheets uh, i uh, uh, uh yeah so so there, there are there are multiple other some web data connectors okay odbc connectors there are plenty of that so if you uh, scan your eyes on the on the blue part of your screen here okay this contains all your native connectors okay now there are two variants one that says connect okay this is what the second says to a server there are two variants of connections basically okay now the connect to a file the first bunch of drop downs are all your local files okay local files like somebody it's it, it means if from a layman's terms if somebody emails you a file you can use it it's something as simple as that okay so it's in any shared drive or some or any drive or uh your c drive or something it should be as a local file basically like an excel file property okay now if you look at this server options okay your frequently most used server options are the first view in here okay but if you also click on this tab called more okay you'll find that it's going to open up an entire um plethora of options for you to choose from where you can pick up different kinds of server based files in here as well okay simple thing now suppose you want to if anybody uses salesforce now the tableau and salesforce have been merged i mean they've taken over i'm pretty sure a lot of synergies will take place now okay say for example your company uses salesforce now uh, who has salesforce here anybody uses salesforce in the company okay so you know what in your salesforce when this happens um when any uh, transactions happening suppose people are updating their uh, their sale uh, lead life cycle the guy who who he or she is going to work on salesforce is going to ensure that he updates it on salesforce so basically all that is doing is it's collecting reports or collecting data from each and every person into a salesforce platform salesforce can also build visuals it can also create its own visuals i'm not interested about that all i'm concerned is the data that is being collected on salesforce the report okay the actual numbers the date of transaction or all that kind of data okay now i can actually connect that data from those reports into tableau now all i have to do is look for a connector Now let's say for a minute here, where it is, say Salesforce is somewhere here. Here, it's as simple as that. All you gotta do is here, you know what? Look, see if you have a native connector, okay? And if you find it, give it a click. 
it is going to open up a pop up browser for you to ask in your usernames and credentials once you input your usernames and passwords you can actually find where the table is drag and drop it and start working at it it's really as simple as that it's that easy it's really not a it's a no brainer really okay um now first look for your native connectors see if you find your native connectors in any of these different options okay in case you don't find your data structure anywhere in here there is always an option of going to an odbc connector as well okay that's like always a backup as a backup plan okay they can also and you might need to perform a few extra steps but that's always an option to bring in any database that you don't find here as well okay and there's also a web data connector which is also very very versatile uh, you want to bring in twitter feeds you want to bring in your facebook report you know you can bring in all that from a web data connector there are multiple links to bring them in here so again it's fairly fairly a easy task of getting in data but this is a very an important step you have to have data brought in first otherwise nothing will proceed further basically to start with okay now let me click back on this and i'll get back my previous screen okay um you guys will also find um a training set of options on your right side part of your screen okay i would say when you guys are learning your uh, learning this keep this as your last resort okay i'm 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 a i'm a tableau certified trainer by the way okay so i can tell you i I've, i've i've kind of seen the way it happens and uh, I, i've done some videos myself but i'll tell you look at the video this is the very end okay by the way most a lot of content um that i have used to create this has been taken from my certification itself so i have a lot of typical certified material but some places i have made my own examples where i felt that they were not good enough so i've made my own examples here and there as well plus i find problems in my consulting practice of often so i take off some real time examples also okay but you will find all the basics will have similarities from tableau and mine but do i made some modifications here and there now in terms of your learning skills okay i would say firstly today is going to be pretty easy for you guys you guys will walk off saying it's pretty simple it's going you you will pretty much get the hang of it mostly you'll not have a big issue but starting tomorrow i can expect you guys to feel some hiccups you need to obviously be able to put in something if you're going to find you'll be doing so many small small things that you'll be worried how am i going to remember all this okay so if you guys are thinking you're going to become experts in 3 days i'm sorry that's not going to happen okay you're not going to become experts in 3 days you're just going to experience all that's going to happen okay um it's a fast paced course it's meant for you guys to give you as much as you can in a short span of time your only intent guys is to repeat what i'm doing i'm telling you honestly just recreate it if you are able to remember it it's a bonus if you can't remember it does not matter go back and see the videos okay that's the way it has to work you want to take down your notes please take down your notes that is your call i completely support it okay but don't try and become experts i mean if you become good for you i'm very happy for you otherwise don't kill yourself or don't get uh, you know don't get baffled at that at that thought okay it's not going to happen i can tell you that starting day 2 day 3 you're going to start to feel the heat on so i'm i'm telling you right now okay um that's fine but it's it's a common thing it's not a unexpected thing it, it will happen okay uh what you can also do is uh, i have also given you guys some uh, pdf guides uh, which i made a few years back in your uh, lms folders there's a zip folder called uh, self help material and data sets it's about uh, 25 mb worth of file okay um 25 mb worth of files it has lots of files and folders and all that i'll tell you how to use them tomorrow tomorrow once i have an example i'll i'll really pick it up but that contains a lot of uh, pdf files in it all the major topics that we're covering here i have given step by step instructions saying drag and drop this here drag and drop this there click here click there you know to that point of level so if you are a pdf kind of a learner you're a printout kind of a learner you can use that that's another so resource for you to learn reference material okay so videos is one second is these pdf files third thing is now tableau has uh, for every version of so if you guys go onto the website wherever you did the download there are PDF, there's a pdf online guide by tableau themselves pretty good guide okay it's, it's about uh, 72 mb or something it has several pages in case you guys want to look at something else you guys want to look at extra material you can go to the pdf guide it's a, i could not upload it because the lms could not handle that but just go online and download it that is again a great resource you guys can use that fantastic resource last resource must be this videos come here in the very end okay so wait till the end then come back and use this you'll be able to layer your learning in a much better structured manner okay that's something i i've experienced and i'd like to share with you guys okay all right so let's uh, begin and uh, import some data to start with okay now 
I'm going to bring in an Excel file to start with. Okay, simple Excel file. Uh, there is a training data set that normally gets downloaded as a part of your pre-downloads. I'm going to use that for a large part of our training because it's easy, it's convenient and all that. And of course, we'll look at multiple techniques in that. Okay, now I want you all to click on this uh, tab called Microsoft Excel under to a file, please. We're going to import an Excel file here right now in this console. And uh, it's going to open up uh, some location, okay? I'll tell you where this location is, okay? So you guys will keep looking at this multiple times, even tomorrow and sometime day after as well. Uh, you probably want to make, write, make a note of it somewhere so that you don't forget the location of this uh, file, okay? If you all, yeah, you all click on your tab called Documents, please. Documents. Under Documents, you'll have a folder called My Tableau Repository. It comes as a part of your pre-downloads, okay? So go and double click on your My Tableau Repository. You'll have a bunch of subfolders in the My Tableau Repository folder. Open up the folder called Data Sources. Data Sources, okay? Done, okay? Within Data Sources, you'll have your whatever version that you have. If you have a 2019.1 or an 18, you'll have that version. So open up that number, 19.2 or whatever, okay? You'll have another folder called EN US, US, okay, it should be EU, okay, it doesn't matter, okay? Double click on this, you'll find a sample hyphen superstore, okay? This is a data set that is given by Tableau themselves, which is great for training and learning, okay? And especially most of you are using for the first time, I'll say learn everything from here and then move on to your own data. Initially, this is easy to learn, okay? And then you can use your own data, you'll get better results, okay? You'll get more confidence, so start with this, to start with, okay? Great. Double click on sample store, <coughs> sample superstore. Okay. And you're going to have a screen that looks like this in the next few seconds. It'll prep your engine a little bit to give you something like this now. Okay. Now I'll open up the Excel file also in parallel and then explain to you a little bit about data structures. So you guys can keep that as a part of your plan as well. Okay. So just wait for a minute. I'll open up the Excel file. Just the way we saw our uh, Tableau workbooks, right? In our Tableau workbooks, you have your sheets called orders, people in returns or table names or whatever in here, okay? You got these structures in here. Now, if I actually open up the Excel file in parallel, okay? You'll notice that that also has the same thing in terms of sheet names called orders, people in returns, the three sheet names in here. Now, if you import uh, data from SQL or something, you will, instead of finding sheet names in here, you'll find table names. So you'll be able to find whichever tables you want to bring in, you can drag and drop them. So these will be table names. You can go in there, you can drag and drop it here now, okay? Your first task is to know uh, which sheet or table that you want to primarily analyze, okay? So we're gonna look at the orders sample superstore for a minute, and then we'll kind of get a hang of this now. This contains three sheets in here, three sheets or three tabs, okay? Called orders, and there's something called people, and there's something called as returns as well. There are three different tabs in here, okay? Now, the orders tab contains all the information that we need for today. This tab called people and returns, there are some additional sheets, which I'll use them later to show how to join and blend them. But right now, let's not worry what order people and returns. It's only the order sheet that we need right now. Okay, now, rules to follow. Very, very similar, or is this, it's the same as the way you structure an Excel file for a pivot table. The exact same rules follows for Tableau as well. I sometimes think Tableau is pivots on steroids. Honest speaking, yeah, exactly, that's what, that's what it is. So it's, it's, it's as simple as that. So you need to follow the same rules, okay? So think about this, what are some rules for a pivot table? Rows and columns, structured database. Your first header contains, first row contains a header, okay? Every column is a variable, every row is a transaction, yes or no? Okay, in, and, and here's an extra rule. When you follow, when you maintain uh, variable types, okay, be consistent. Suppose you have a numeric variable in a column, it's all numbers, don't corrupt that with some dates or text or something, don't mix that. Suppose you have date fields, a proper date format. It must have a month format, it must have a date format and a year format, okay? It doesn't matter if it's MM, DD, YY, DD, MM, YY, but the format matters. You must have a date element, a month element, and a year element. If you have time, time is also okay. You can have date month time as well, doesn't matter. Okay, so that's something you'll take care. Now, there are some other fields here as well. We'll talk about that, okay? Now, every row, if you put in any row of data, each row must contain a unique transaction, 
Okay. Again, I'm repeating this. Every row must contain a unique transaction. Okay. Row one should not have anything to do with more than one transaction. That's what I mean here in this case. Let's understand what that means for a minute. Okay. Your uh, first column is your row ID. Okay. Your serial number of your transaction, basically index or whatever it is. There are about uh, 9995 rows or 9994, excluding the header. Close to 10,000 rows of information is what I have here. Okay. Great. Order ID, some alpha numeric order ID for customer. Okay. Order date when the customer purchased. Again, you see there's a proper date, month, and a year format. Okay. Then there's a shipping date when the item was shipped to the customer. Okay. Shipping modes, the three, four types of shipping modes. First day, same class, whatever in here. Okay. Customer ID. Each customer has a distinct customer ID detail. Okay. That guy or he or she has a name as well. That's what is in your customer name. They have been broken into different segments for whatever analysis. Column I now contains a field. Okay. Text field. But now we're talking about geospatial fields. Okay. Countries, your cities, states, your postcodes, all this can be geospatial in nature. Okay. Why geospatial? Exactly. They contain latitude, longitude in, inside the particular variable. If you want to put in India or United States, they have lat long values. Now that's going to help you to drive your mapping abilities. So we're going to keep them now to ensure that. So again, um, all the generic countries, all the countries, states in the world, cities in the world, they will get populated by themselves as long as you ensure correct spellings. Spellings are very, very important. Okay. Don't put an I N D A and expect it to understand it's India and don't then complain that India map is not coming. That's not going to happen. Okay. Spellings are very, very important. Okay. It will also help, by the way, it'll also help if you name the headers, right? Call it country, city, state, stick with generic nomenclature. Generally, they get picked up much easier. Even if you don't, doesn't matter, but I'd say it's a better, it's one little extra step. I mean, how does it matter? Call it country. Just see if you can do that. It kind of helps. Okay. All right. So, your country, which country he or she came from, which city, which state, which postcode or zip code they came from. Okay. Moving on, there's something called as region, column M, M as in mother. This data set contains transactions only for the US. Okay. The US map has been broken into four regions, east, west, uh, central and south. Your eastern states like your Massachusetts, your uh, New York and DC and all is broken to east. West is your California, Nevada, your Oregon and Washington and all that. Okay. South is your Florida. Central is your Texas, your uh, Louisiana, those kind of states. Oregon, uh, sorry, uh, whatever, North Dakota, some, some states in there. Okay. That's there in here. Now this field region, would this be a geospatial variable or not? No. Why? It can be for any country, right? East of India, east of Europe, east of Africa, east of Australia. Okay. East is not a way. While it's closely connected to geospatial, it's not a geospatial. So you got to have that sense of differentiation. Okay. So that's where it is. Okay. So product ID, what did he or she buy? What was the category? What was the subcategory? What was the item name that he bought? Different levels of data in here. All these are your different other text fields now. Okay. Your last four columns contains the actual numeric fields. Okay, or your continuous fields. Um, how much sale came out of that transaction? What was the number of items that they buy in terms of quantity? Uh, what was the discount offered as a percentage to the guy, if at all any? Okay, starts from zero, goes up to one at max. And what is your profit or loss for that particular transaction? So this is your data. This is your transactional data. Again, if you notice, every field was talking only about the same transaction. Now, this is what I mean by a unique transaction. Okay. Every row must contain unique transactions. Make sure that you guys have this. This is very, very important. Uh, on day three, I'm going to deliberately give you guys some structures which are faulted and I'll tell you how this fails. if you don't have this right. So it's kind of important to have this structure important. Okay. All right. So let's go back into Tableau now and let's take the sheet called orders. What we need now, you guys have to perform a customary step. When you are importing data for the first time, okay, any structured database, all your sheets or your tables will be appearing in this part of your screen here. Okay. You guys have to do this. You drag and drop whichever sheet or table into this option called drag sheets here. Just bring it in here. And the moment you bring it in there, in a few seconds, it will populate the actual data table in front of you. You must see the screen. 
until and unless you don't see this you cannot proceed further okay otherwise it throw back an error you have to go back and undo it and it's a headache might as well just take it right okay few more things but i'll not go too deep into this last day i'll talk about this you can set in connections for live and extracts which i'll talk about on the last day okay live is what real time dashboarding but i'll tell you how to use it and when and where it works more on a server i'll talk about that later again okay right now just know that this is an option to get enable a live stream of data okay extract is extracting just part of a data that's what it is right now just keep this much in mind we got to go last day i'll spend time on this i'll talk properly on this with an example okay now <clears throat> in terms of uh filtering data or see again this ta the, the tableau desktop software that we have is not a data cleansing layer okay there is something called as tableau prep if in case you guys have used tableau prep there is a layer called tableau prep which is basically meant to do all your cleaning uh, cleansing and all that now say suppose i've got i've got 10000 records okay now say for a minute i want to clean some data i don't want to bring in all my data into my records into this uh, engine now using this part of my software i can filter certain rows away data consists of rows and columns okay what i can do here is right now if i want to i can filter certain rows away i cannot remove columns right now in this case because sometimes columns also take space that might also be completely useless you'll be bringing columns for no reason so it will have extra workload suppose you have lots of data it takes up a hell lot of processing time you may not want to have some unnecessary columns as well there are ways to treat it but as far as this part of it is concerned we can right now remove certain rows of data i'll just show you how it is but i'm not going to filter any data in this tab called filters okay and add a filter if you actually uh, click on this add option and click on add again one more time okay you notice that it's going to populate all your variable names so say for example i only want to bring in uh, records from the southern region of the us okay let me say i go to this field called uh, region here okay and uh, if i click on okay i'll be able to choose a filter for the variables that i want to bring it along so by doing this i can filter rows okay so uh, that's an option that we can it will kind of improve the efficiency of the uh, engine if you don't have a need to bring in unnecessary records this is one option but right now i'm not going to filter anything i want all the data so i'm going to just cancel it okay i'll talk about this a little later again i think there is some more things to work in here on day 3 when i have an example i'll induct you a little better here but right now i want to jump in and start to create your visuals i want you all to click on this tab called sheet 1 okay and it'll take you next into your screen right away so here's where all the action happens all your visuals all your dashboarding storyboarding everything happens in this screen only henceforth okay now first things first first things first the software does not okay data is broken into dimensions and measures okay what is a dimension what's a measure not you guys let them answer the ones who not uh, seen it well, what's a dimension what's a measure the ones who not seen it before please answer it they're all columns they're both columns but what column is a dimension categorical in other words they are discrete what's your measure continuous variables okay now the uh, tool does not understand what is meant to be put inside a dimension or a measure by itself it does not know when you guys import data for the first time okay you got to check for two things first if the data type is correctly being identified or not okay how do i know the data types here your cat look at the category called abc it's a text field abc you look at your uh, city it has a globe like icon okay it has order date contains a calendar like icon you need to check for all these data types firstly okay and look at your measures it has all your numeric fields in there your sales and your profits and your uh, quantity and discounts and so on and so forth so you need to first check if the data is correctly getting identified sometimes it may not okay if it is not getting identified all you have to do is click on that on that particular icon let's say for example this category wants to be changed to something else just click on the abc icon itself it will help you change the data type okay so first modify this treat this as your first give it a, give this as your first treatment the second thing you'll do is um if you actually look through one of your dimensions there's a field called row id okay tell me something this row id should this be a dimension or a measure what should this be a dimension or a measure it's a number so what now dimension or measure dimension. why dimension it's an identifier okay it's an index now this now this data set is a training data set you've been shielded from a real time problem 
when you are importing data for the first time, it does not know what is the dimension or what is the measure. It just works on data type. It is going to put all the numeric fields in the measures, all the non-numeric fields into your dimensions. Row ID now happens to be a dimension. We know this, okay? But the tool will not be able to identify this in the first row. So you know how it would look like? Look, I'm going to deliberately mess it up. So I'm going to drag and drop this row ID into my measures like this. It will be sitting inside your measures like this, the first row. Your first task is to identify these flaws and make sure that you treat it. Just the way I, I dragged and dropped it wrongly, make sure that you take it back in the correct shelf in there. That's your first task. So, uh, do you understand what's a row ID? Excel file, you saw the row ID. Index, you got that. Uh, is that a discrete or a continuous variable? Let me ask you that. The row ID. Should it be discrete or continuous? No. Sales is continuous. Does it make sense to add row number ID number 1 plus 25? Index number 1 plus index 25 doesn't make sense. But sales in the first transaction plus sales in the 100th transaction, will, might it have some sense at some point in time? Yes. So hence, it makes sense to keep sales as continuous. Your row ID is not. The fact that it is numerical hash variable, it does not make it to become a measure automatically. Sometimes you will have to treat them as dimensions if required. In this case, it should be correctly identified. Here, in this case, it happened, but it won't happen all the time. So you've got to do this consciously as your first task. Uh huh. Okay. 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 So then that will be a dimension automatically. If it's moments alpha numeric moment, there is any uh, codes in it. Alpha in it, it becomes automatic dimension. You can't add five uh, B seven five plus one. No, you can't add it. So it becomes a dimension automatically. So that's not an issue, okay? Only if it's purely numerical, you have a problem. Be careful about that, okay? Let's say, for, for example, you have a, you're looking at uh, some housing data. I'm saying each property, I'm saying uh, this is the first house is a two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom. For number of bedrooms, I say three, four, and five, okay? Why these are numbers? I could have very well called them as three BHK, two BHK, one BHK. But the fact that I've called it as one, two, three, four, five does not make it into a number where I can use for math. That's a case where I can't keep it as a measure, it has to be a dimension. I have to treat it. The tool will not know this. By default, it will put it into a measure. But you have to treat it to a dimension. So that's your initial treatment that you have to do. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, you, you can, you don't have to. See, so again, you don't have to change everything. Yeah, you can, ex exactly. It's coming from the data. It's coming from the data. Exactly. Oh, you mean, oh, exactly. Yes and no, if it's put as 1 and 2 or 0 and 1, it will probably, 0 and 1 is binary. That's still okay. A binary, yeah. If it's 1 and 2, suppose, for yes and no, it will go into a measure. But it's not a measure, it's a dimension. You have to treat it, like you said. So you have to have that understanding. So you need to know your data completely well, guys. You should know thoroughly your data before you even start to work on this. You should know what data type is each, where it should be, it should be a measure or a dimension. That's your first homework you will do. And then you will start to play with this, okay? Right, so I'm not going to start to create some visuals now to begin. Okay, so a few more uh, quick rules and we'll start. If you actually scroll through your uh, dimensions to the very end and your meshes to the very end, you'll find a few itilized fields, okay? Just, just check this out. I just, I, I'm going to hi highlight this. A few itilized fields in here. These are fields that are getting populated automatically. Now, whether you like it or not, they're going to come, Okay. I'll, I'll talk about the measure names, measure values in a bit, but let's talk about the others right now, okay? I'll, I'll show an example for the other ones. Now, let's say latitude and this longitude generated. These are the lat long values coming in automatically from the software. Only because when you guys imported the data set for the first time, you made sure there were correct spellings for your cities, countries, and states, and postcodes. So it has checked its repository of geospatial variables, and it's found a match so for those matches, it is returning lat long values from the console. That's what is happening. Okay. These are automatic. Okay. Number of record is pretty simple. I'll say, hey, count the number of records for transactions in New York. How many transactions in Los Angeles? I can do that. Okay. How many transactions for tables, shares? I can get that. That's what it is. Your measure names and measure values, I'll talk with an example. They're used for creating pivot tables. I'll tell you that much. 
I'll make a pivot table, show you how it works at that point in time, okay? In the next few minutes. Your uh, marks cards, color, size, text, and all that, these are, uh, you know, there are seven steps you spoke about, cognitive perception and all that. This will help you to amplify your cognition, basically. We'll see how to use them at some point in time, okay? Rows and columns where you'll actually do drags and drops, okay? This one uh, view called show me on the right-hand side topmost corner, that's like a cheat sheet, okay? It's a guide to choose a chart choice, basically. Okay, sometimes you have variables. You want to know what are some potential charts I can create. Show me is a starting point, how to choose a chart choice, okay? But I'll tell you how to use it optimally. I'll give you some examples on that as well, okay? So I'm, I'm going to click on this right now, so I'll just hide it off, okay? And I'll use it now, right? Okay, so, all right. So all you guys go to your measures called sales, please, to start with, and double click over sales. What chart is this? What chart is this? Bar chart. What's your total sales for the data? Total sales is what? 2300. 2300, okay. So again, this has a lot of similarities to Excel. As you guys, like I said, it is pivot on steroids. Believe me, you'll experience it more and more. Check this out in your, um, uh, you know, these base uh, indicators, summaries, you get the number of items, total sales, you know, all these metrics will come right there. 2.3 million, in fact, 2.3 million dollars, in fact, that's the total deal, okay? And there are also tool tips, fabulous tool tips. If you actually hover on top of the object, it will give you a tool tip of that particular thing as well. We can go to a point of customizing tool tips, like writing sentences and making custom tool tips. We can make custom design pop-ups and tool tips. A lot of things are possible. We'll do that later, okay? But right now, let's explore this now. Now, I want you guys to go to your field called category, okay? Drag and draw this category to your field called columns. Okay. So I'm able to now successfully break them into three categories called furnitures, something and something. Okay. Um, in your screens, I'm guessing you'll find it look better. Your uh, furniture label has probably fully come in for you, right? Your uh, technology has become technolo in some of your screens, if I'm not wrong, right? Yeah. And office supplies has come in two lines for you guys, if I'm not wrong. Okay. Fair deal. We'll fix it up. We'll fix it up. My screen resolution is a little different, so it's kind of shrunk all my variables. Okay, doesn't matter. Now, I'd like to put in labels on all these bars in here to see how much of sale came from each of these bars. Okay, so, so guys, on your toolbars, you notice a small icon called T that says show mark labels. Give it a click. You'll be able to put in the labels for whatever data points you have on your chart there. Okay, so that's your data labels, okay? Now, I have a small, um, quick, common sense test to perform, okay? Just to test your brains and all that. Um, just take a look at the ceiling for a minute, the ceiling, okay? What shapes do you see the most? Okay, hang on, squares, okay? I'm saying I can see more than squares. Think about this. If I can actually think about this, you know what, if I want to make it in here into a sort of an A shape, guess what, I just do the letter A. I'm not trying to draw the letter B in this case. Check this out. I can draw the letter C. I can, I can write any alphabet. I can draw anything. I can paint my face in here for all that I care, okay? I can, try, I can paint the Mona Lisa, okay? But why do we not see this as the first scope? Not your fault. It's our, the way the brain has been designed. The brain likes to see objects in its most simplified form, okay? Or it tends to simplify complex objects into easy objects. This is the actual logical reason why we always sort the data. Never ever leave the charts unsorted, okay? So there are a couple of sorting techniques here, okay? Um, in your toolbars, if you check it out, there is an ascending sort and a descending sort. You may give any of the one sorts, okay? Give, it, give any of them a click, doesn't matter, okay? Right, so that's simplified. Three bars, not a big deal, but then when there are many bars, trust me, it's a big deal, okay? It matters. Okay, let's try something else now. In this particular chart, in this particular chart, my labels are completely hidden. Okay, for me, because of my screen size, and some of you have labels, furniture has come right. Office supplies in two lines, technology has become technolo, in your cases, I'm sure. How do you think we can handle, how do you think we can optimize this particular problem of labels? Some suggestions, some ideas to fix labels. What do you think we can do? I want to read the label correctly, clearly well, okay? As much as I can. What are some tips that you might, some ideas? 
inke make it diagonal and see i i know you use excel a lot but trust me sometimes in excel when you know think about this many times don't you have a sense of ambiguity which label goes where when you see diagonal there is a problem so yeah. increase the space you know i can do that now hype again extreme scenario let's say one word is uh, got two characters other one is 100 characters how that look like so again it's not going to justify yours right somebody said something look what you just did the first thing i said is don't add clutter now you've gone and added clutter yourself there's no clutter but you put an extra clutter so no so you've officially added clutter so don't do that so don't do that i heard someone saying this yeah easy technique simple technique put on the bar i mean how much can you okay again very long bar if it's a if it's a word with say 100 words how much of a bar is it going to occupy as you going to go or top to bottom or 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 left right bit of an issue better idea the of the uh, oh yeah nice okay that's now you're talking okay F fair deal so um give us a click guys see there's a little icon say swap rows and columns give it a click look what happens it's going to orient your bar chart from a vertical into a horizontal bar and look at the labels it kind of handles the labels issues for all of us even for me it got fixed for you also it gets fixed by and large this rectifies the problem of inconsistent labels or lengthy labels they fix up by and large okay okay we gave this chart two treatments we sorted data because the brain likes to simplify it we also swapped the data because labels were not very clear now two treatments were done there is a, scen a scenario a particular situation when you would never sort bars like this you would never swap them like this when would that be why is that date when it comes to date fields you always want to read date from left to right it's never a top to bottom dates i don't care how inconsistent or how irregular it is i don't care the brain is going to collapse but the, i want to see the whole up and down patterns that's the whole point of a date chart date is the only case where you never do a sorting and a swapping like this okay rest all is fine other cases you have to do this all right so let's rename the sheet okay um i'm going to call the sheet as uh, category sales okay now um i'd like like to open up a new sheet another new sheet okay in my uh, thumbnails below where i'm clicking right now there are three small thumbnails okay the first one is to get an extra worksheet the second is for a dashboard third is for a storyboard i'll use the three of them today but right now i wanted to pick out the first one that says new worksheet okay you can keep adding more and more sheets and let's work on sheet 2 for now okay let's do a small um, another kind of a report right now okay what i want you guys to do is to first create a chart for me this field called a uh, subcategory okay drag and drop this subcategory to your rows shelf please okay how many uh, sub categories do we have in total the ones are counting please don't count if i give you 1000 you'll be counting forever or a million you'll be counting forever yeah similar to excel okay see in 17 rows one column you must be looking right there okay yeah yeah let the answer you know this yeah yeah let the answer yeah okay all right so um this field called uh, region i want you guys to drag and drop regions into your field called columns please do this okay so all i have is a structure of a report i have 17 items where i'm able to go to see them in four different areas four regions in the us okay now i'd like to create a pivot table basically okay my table is going to contain sales and profits so i'm going to drag and drop my measure called sales okay and i'm going to simply drag and drop it into this box called abc until i see this icon called show me wherever inside doesn't matter leave it anywhere it's going to create a pivot table as is okay that's done sales summarized across different cats category sub categories across different regions now i want to do the same thing for profit as well i'll drag and drop my profit measure i'm going to bring it back into the same place where i brought it until i see this show me icon and when you let go of the mouse you'll be able to find your sale and your profit in your screen at the same shot now i want you guys to take a look at this chart for a minute we brought in four fields sub categories regions sales and profits but your chart seems to have some extra elements here what are they look at the rows columns look at all that there are some extra elements that's come in there which you didn't even bring them in the first place i brought in subcategories 
I brought in rows. I brought sales. I brought profits. It's got some extra things right now. Look at your filters. Look at your uh, uh, rows. What's all there? Measure names. You never brought measure names, but they came in themselves. You see that? Yes or no, guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now that's what happens with the help of measure names and measure values. You remember these last two uh, italicized fields I spoke about? These things have come there by themselves. Okay. Now, what this does is, suppose you make a pivot table. You're going to try bringing the same in the same place to make a table. You're getting more than one measure. Okay. So, how many measures do we have totally? Four exactly. So I've got four, but right now I've just brought two measures. Okay, two out of my four measures. So, if you look at your filters to start with, your filters has got a measure name because it's filtering two of the measure names out. Your discount and quantity has not been brought there. It's only getting in sales and profits. Okay, now having filtered only for the relevant measure names. If you notice in your rows, there's a measure name. You know why? Because you first have your subcategory, which is all your subcategories. Then you have your measure names, which is your profit and sales, which is again your second item in here. And if you look at your different columns, they have your regions for your central, east, west, south. Now measure values. How does that? How does that work? Check this out. Measure values are one controller to bring in all the measures at the same time in the same place. Measure values contains all the measures, but the fact that I've got only two measures. This works in comparison with the measure names. If I filter some measure names, measure values will also get filtered automatically. Okay, so in this case only sale and profit has to come because I got filtered. Now that has a small icon called T on it. That T icon, will, by the way, refers to a text. The fact that it's a text, you got a pivot table, and here is your order of profit and sales, sales profit, exactly what you have in there. That's how measure names and measure values typically work. Okay. You don't need to remember this, but I'm just telling you how this works. Just FYI. Okay. All right. Now, a, a big irritant, a big irritating factor for a person when he makes a report is scroll bars. I say as much as you can try and eradicate them, eliminate them, at least minimize your scrolls. Okay. You can't. You may not always be able to get rid of it, but try and see nullify them as much as you can. Now, I have a simple solution here. A very simple solution. See, I have a scroll bar that runs top to bottom. Okay, I'm saying instead of having a scroll bar running from top to bottom, I seem to have a lot of extra white space in my corner. Why can't I use that instead and try and cut the scroll? That's my logic. So all I'm going to do is a very simple rearrangement, and that's something that you need to play around with. Understand every time, each time it may have a different situation, but always give it a play and see what works well. Okay, now measure names. Okay. Try this. Drag and drop your measure names to a field called columns, and look what happens. It will definitely, in this case, treat your pivot table a lot better, and you will have a much more cleaner looking report. And this is something that I might definitely subscribe to. Okay. All right. Time to answer a few questions. Okay. I'm not. I'm going to give you a few seconds. If you don't answer a question, I'll move on to my next question. Okay. But I need. I need some answers real quick. Okay. Okay. Help me spot. The subcategory having the highest sale. Help me spot the subcategory having the least profit. Look at the report on my face. Okay. Help me spot the subcategory. No. Help me spot subcategories having losses in more than two regions. Time up. Okay. Help me spot the subcategory having the highest profit in the highest region. Okay. Done. Okay. Time up. Time up. Time up. Time up. Time up. No more answering. Okay. Done. If somebody asks you to answer questions like these, kill him. Okay, first of all, okay, kill him. But I'll make you guys answer all these questions in the same speed, same amount of time. But I'll kind of make this a little more easier to look at it. Okay, the same data, but I'll show you how to now read this to answer these questions in a visual manner. Okay, same data, but a bit differently uh, oriented. Open up another sheet, please. Drag and drop your uh, sub categories to your rows shelf, please. Okay. Drag and drop your regions to your columns, like you did before. First two steps are the same. There is no change to that. Okay. Now this time, I'm not going to create a pivot table, but I'm going to make it into a visual table, and I'm going to use some of your cognitive elements to amp uh, some elements to amplify cognition. So your I'm going to work on your uh, brain strengths, and I'm going to make you answer some questions, and see how your brain is able to spot patterns in this manner. Okay. 
Now I want to bring in sales, okay? Not as a pivot table. So I'll drag and drop sales and I'm going to place it in my columns after my region field, okay? So what it's going to do is it's going to automatically make this into a bar chart, okay? Now, we just realized that when there's a bar chart, brain likes to see the object in its simplified form. So please, for the love of God, sort it, okay? It'll make your life a lot simpler. So let's give it a descending order sort. Give it a sort. It, if you think about this, after you do the sorting, it looks a lot less messier, doesn't it? Because it is now simplified, okay? Okay, sorting has been done right now, okay? The current sorting order, again, I'll talk more about sorting. There are multiple sorting techniques. You know, it is sorted right now. It is already sorted. The current sorting order is such that if I add the sales of phones in my central plus east plus south plus west, phone is my highest selling item. Okay, if I add the sales of fasteners in central plus east plus south plus west, it's a least selling item. That's the current sorting order that I have, okay? Just keep this in mind. That's all you need to know. Sorting is done, okay? Time to bring in profits as well. I'm going to ask you all to drag and drop your profits into your card called color. Okay? And let's for a minute understand how this is still being oriented. The length of the bar is still some of your sum of sales. Your sorting is still the same, but the colors of your bar is now going to be explaining to you as profits. If you see any bar with a darker orange color, it tends to go into a loss. If it goes into a darker blue color, it tends to go into a profit. Okay? This is the way in which this chart has been created now. Now tell me, which is the highest selling item? Most the highest in terms of sales? Phones. Okay. What your least selling item? Okay. Which items has which item has the highest loss? Tables where? East, okay. Which item has the highest profit? Copiers, where? West, exactly. Think about this. Same questions I asked you before. Now you guys can answer it much faster. Okay. Help me, okay. Let's take one more question. Help me spot subcategories making losses in more than two regions. Keep going. Tables, then? Okay, then? Then? Machines? Machines? Okay. There you go. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. So now you guys can process a lot more information much faster. Same data, but shown in a manner to now appeal to your brain. Because now I tapped on your brain. Okay, the earlier case was a rich view, but not meant to give you guys quick answers. Now patterns are standing out. Okay, that's what you do. These are some small techniques that you'll adopt to kind of really make you things stand out. Okay. All right, let's try something else. Open up another sheet, please. Uh, if I look at a... Field. Okay, I know you answer this, but one more time. I take a date field and a measure. What's the best chart choice? Line chart. Nothing does a better job than a line chart. Four things you guys mentioned. You said trend. He said highs and lows. He said seasonality. Okay. And uh, cyclicness. Okay. We'll see how, whether all this now comes into play now. Okay. Let's now do this. Now, the tool has also been taught that the moment it finds a date field and a measure, by default, it will make a line chart. Okay. So that's going to happen now. You're going to wait and watch now. So, and we read date from left to right or top to bottom? Okay, so your date is going to go to your column. So drag and drop your order date, okay, into your field called columns. Sorry. Okay, um, the date field in the Excel file, what format was it there in, in the Excel file? Date, month, and year. It had a proper date format, but here you notice that it's going to try and give it to you a year of order date. Now this happens with your date fields. Date fields have natural hierarchies. Yes or no? Whether you like it or not, you can, if I give you four years of data, if I give you 365 times four days, you can give me the value for four years or four times four quarters or four times 12 months. Okay, I can, I can give any kind or I can take 365 times four as well. Okay, I can have any kind of thing as possible. Dates have this natural property. So that's what you're now witnessing now. Okay, now, Take this measure called uh, sales again, okay? Drag and drop sales into your row shelf. And by default, it is going to make a line chart because it has been told anytime you find a date field and a measure, your first chart choice should be a line chart. So it happens by itself. It will happen on its own, okay? Okay, let's go with the trend. What is this trend telling you? Increasing, increasing. So if you're the head of sales, will you be happy with this trend? You better be. You better be. Yeah. If you can be happy with this, then God knows what will make happy. This is a good trend. Yeah. It's going. It's increasing. So yeah, it's, it's not bad at all. Your sale is increasing year on year. And if you are, uh, if this is any indicator of your future, then you're good. For, good for you. If this is your forecast, your uses for a forecast, your next year is going to be probably better. 
So that's the indicator I'm getting right now. So sale is good. Trend has been answered so far with this data. Okay, now I want you to do one thing now for me. In your year of order date, okay, I want you folks to click on the plus symbol one time. The year of order date, click on the plus symbol one time. What do we see now? It's not just quarters, years and quarters. You see all the four years and all the four quarters. So you're seeing four years times four quarters, so 16 data points, okay? Okay, what is the insight coming out of here now? Quarter four has a higher sales and Q1 has your least sales. Guess what you just answered? You answered your uh, seasonality and cyclic pattern. That's exactly what you answered. In the first case, we answered trend. Now we're talking about seasonality and cyclic patterns. That's exactly what came out here, okay? Why do you think Q4 is the highest? Holiday seasons, which country is this? The US. So obviously their holidays are falling in the quarter, fourth quarter, okay? Typically the Thanksgiving, their Halloween, their um, Black Friday, Christmas, and all that falls in the last quarter, obviously, so that's where it is. If we had to see a sale for India, when do you think we would have had a higher sales? Whenever Diwali falls, wherever Diwali falls. Diwali is normally either 1st of October or middle of October. If it's in the beginning of October, what happens? It's a good chance that people shop early for Diwali. Nobody's going to buy on the day of Diwali. Okay, it's going to happen like a week or 10 days before. So sales would have been clocked for September, meaning Q3 would have been high. Uh, but if it fell, say, end of October, then Q4 is going to be higher. So that's how typically we see sales here. On the last day, we'll take a data set for India. Okay, and we'll make some analysis, do some Indian retail analysis, okay, where we'll actually find this kind of a pattern, where it won't be as per calendar year, but Diwali will drive the highs and lows for our sales. We'll, we'll see that on the last day, on the, whenever is your last uh, your day four, we'll, we'll work that out, okay? All right, so that is done. Now, I want you guys to click on the quarter of order date one time, and first things first, easy or hard to read? Okay, there's a reason why your brain is now saying it's hard to read, okay? First things first, just because a tool does something, don't blindly follow it. This is the classic case, okay? You gotta then take a stance. You'll find it can do some brilliant things, but this is something I will not subscribe to. There is a scientific reason why our brain is not able to read this, okay? An average human being has four ROM chips in his head. Okay, four ROM chips, okay? Now RAM and ROM, RAM is long term, ROM is short term memory, okay? When you guys are trying to make some interpretations, you are not trying to do this to memorize this for life. You want to quickly get an answer and run out, okay? And get done with this. Um, I'll take, I'll, I'll just prove it to you, okay? See, suppose I want to memorize your names. I'm seeing you all for the first time. I don't know when I'm gonna see you next, or I may never see you all again, okay? If I try to memorize your names, it is out of purely out of a short term interest because I want to be able to call you in the name, using names the next three, four days, okay? So I'll say I start with his name, I go down here, by the time I go to the third or fourth name, I, there's a good chance his name is going to slip out of my head. Short term memory, okay? But ask me my mother's name, I'll never forget it. My dad's name, I'll never forget it because I was born with it. It's my long term thing. That's long term memory, okay? <clears throat> Same thing happens here. <clears throat> now, four ROM chips is what an average human being has. Right now, we're seeing how many lines? Four times, uh, let's say there are 16. Um, oh yeah, 16 lines are, are, is what I'm seeing here. Every line or every chunk is demanding one ROM chip from us. So for us, it looks cluttered, hard to read, call it whatever, but our brain is just not able to read this pattern because our brain is now overloaded and it's not able to read the pattern. So I now have to support your brain to read it rightly, okay? Now, here's what we do. The first line chart we saw was the year on year increase. I got the overall trend. Year four is the highest increasing trend, we got it. The second line, the quarters came well. We said Q4 is the highest, Q1 is the lowest, one said Diwali, one said so Christmas season, yeah, holidays, all that pattern has come on. We've got the quarterly insight as well. It's time for the monthly insight now. I want to see how months are faring. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to slightly simplify this view, okay? Now, the year of order date, keep it the way it is. It is this quarter of order date that's causing this issue. Okay, so I'm going to drag away this quarter of order date from this view. And I'm gonna keep it somewhere either here or in your measures or anywhere in here. You know, as long as you see a red arrow in it, you're good to go. Take it out of your screen and uh, check it out. It looks a little better, slightly easier. Slightly easier now? Yes, no? Okay. Some of you might have scroll bars in your uh, screens as well. I'll uh, help you take that out as well, okay? 
because you're running from a left to right screen, that might be also a bit of an irritating thing there. Now, here's what you do on your uh, toolbars. Okay, look where I'm clicking. There's a tab called standard. Okay, when you hit this option, if you don't want a standard view with a scroll bar, you may either say fit the entire width or fix the entire view onto a screen. So I can see the whole screen utilizes all the space for my chart. So it's a little better now, easier to read. Okay, now tell me what is the pattern coming here. I want some answers now. Give me some answers now. What patterns are coming out? Slight dip in October. Slight? Slight dip in October, okay. Okay. Feb is what? Feb is a dip, okay. All right, okay. Yeah. What somebody said mid year, what? Mid year, what? Mid year is typically low, okay. What about March? March is a peak, okay. Okay, let me let me let me let me let me stop you all right here. You're all consistently trying to look for uh, repetitive patterns. Am I right? You're trying to find a good month, a consistently bad month, consistently a good period. That's what you're all. Everybody has the same answer. If that's your intent, I'll make your life even more simpler. <clears throat> Why four ROM chips? I'll make your brain focus on uses one ROM chip, one ROM chip for this entire view, and then see how this view gets better to read. Okay. Now all I'm going to get you all to do. Take this year of order date and drag and drop it. There's a card called color. Look what happens. It's still going to have all your four years of data, but all the lines have basically been superimposed on top of the other. So now your brain is able to understand this as just one single image and not four images. So now you guys can read this patterns better. Now tell me the good months, peaks and lows. Now tell me consistent peaks and lows. October, he said, is a slight dip. That was a slight uh, drop. Okay. Uh, what about September? September is a is a peak. Okay. November, December again. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, what about uh, the first part of the year? Feb is always on a dip. Yeah. Your peaks and lows are coming much higher and easier. April is what? April is always uh, is a spike. Okay. Is no April is a spike. Oh, April is a dip, and May is a dip. Yeah. May is a dip. Okay. There, whatever it is, you guys now know how to read it. Okay, you guys can get it. Now, um, so 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 see how your brain is now able to easily get it. See, all of us know how to read the chart. It's just about how to make it easy to read. Now that's where is really the smart act, smartness of making it better. Okay, I have a small question. Okay, uh, when do you think people are shopping for Christmas? More. November, right? Looks like November shopping is higher than your December shopping. Okay. Uh, sorry. Thanksgiving is one option and assuming it's all Christmas shopping, um, there's a good chance that these guys must have um, promoted like an early bird sale. Think about this, December, if you are going to stay there and you celebrate Christmas, you are going to buy a present, you're going to buy gifts for sure, okay, whether it's November or December. But if I'm smart enough to say, hey, listen, um, instead of you shopping in December when I know you will, I don't have to spend that extra money on marketing on you all. But if I can say on the month of uh, November, if I can give you guys an early bird special, I say come early and get an extra discount for the month of November. If I can encourage you to sh get earlier, shop early, I have not only really secured sales for November. December is going to happen in any which case. So I've done a do. I've got to do two month bonanza. So that's what I'm thinking. So maybe something like that could have happened, or could be Thanksgiving, could be whatever. But obviously something has happened right here in this case. Okay. All right. So good. Let's rename the sheet. Call this sales trend. Sheet four, call it a sales trend. That's just a small formatting. It happens. I mean, that's okay. That's a small formatting thing. Uh, that's a real quick formatting tip. If you want to do that, I'll talk more about formatting, but right now don't do this. You do a right click and you can do an edit access or format. You can change it off typically. It's possible. Okay. Uh, we'll spend some time on that later. Right now, let's not worry about that. Okay. I'll show you. I've got a case where I'm going to spend some time on formatting. Okay. Now let's make another uh, chart. Guys, please name your sheets. Huh? Very important. The ones I'm naming, name them because I'm using. I'm going to use it for a dashboard eventually. Okay. I'll talk about that. Let's. I'll talk about the filtering bit and uh, at some time. So right now let's make the sheets and then we'll do all the filters. Okay. Give me some time on that. I've got it all planned out. Don't worry. Okay. Open up another sheet. It'll break the sequence otherwise. So let's not do that. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, but it's pretty much covered. I can tell you that multiple techniques. So uh, I'd like to do something more now. Um, I want to understand uh, how am I doing, um, say, geospatially. Let's make some maps. Understand how some data is. Okay. I have data. 
I've got latitude, longitude variables, okay? And I have states, countries, cities, towns, whatever. I have all this data. Let's see some data on a map. Again, a very effective way to see data patterns. Something may always come up. So I would like to utilize that part of the mapping technique, okay? Now, let's uh, take a simple approach. You all can click on show me, okay? Enable show me. I'll show you how to use this. Like I said, show me is a cheat sheet. Okay, it's a great starting point to create charts and all that. Um, if you know what chart choice you need to create, nothing like it, it you'd probably get that as practice. Okay, but in the beginning, if you are not sure what charts to create, you need to, you have say three or four variables. You decide to make some analysis with three, four variables. How do I choose a chart? Well, show me can be a great guiding, guiding point. Don't trust it blindly, but use it as a guiding point. Okay. So that's what I'm going to now look at it now. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Now, at this point in time, nothing is going to work because it's not enabled to choose any chart. You may click anywhere. Um, there are a couple of maps in here. Okay. Um, say you place it on any chart. Say I've kept this on a pie chart for the moment. Okay. Okay. But don't use it ever. So it tells you what the chart is. Okay. It tells you what is the condition for a pie chart. You can read the chart name and the prerequisites for the pie charts. Okay. For a pie chart, if at all has to be created, it must have at least one dimension, at least one dimension, and must have at least one measure. So you can use a combination to make a pie chart. Absolutely, yes. Think about it. That's the way your pie chart is, okay? Uh, sales versus number of executives. Okay, pie chart is possible, doable, okay? Anyways, so all I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna click on a measure called sales at the moment, okay? So that variable is now Highlighted. Now, notice as you clicked on a variable, your show me is getting activated. Some charts are being enabled because for a combination of one variable, these are the potential charts that you can create. I want to add more variables. Okay. I want to also bring in a field called state in my dimension. So I want you to hold on to your control keys on your keyboards. Okay. And select this dimension called state also. So you'll have two variables selected like these state and your sales okay and now for another combination now notice more charts have been enabled okay now for this combination of a dimension and a measure the software is suggesting this one particular map chart but i'm not going to take that that's not the correct map here okay this like i said is only a starting point there are two kinds of maps okay we'll once you do both, you'll understand. Right now, choose the second map, not the first one. The second map, okay? Not the one that is recommended by Tableau. How many of you are getting the map of the US, a proper map of the US, complete map of all the 49 states, 50 states, okay? Okay, how many of you are getting a map like this, like the world map grayed out? Yeah, and how many of you are getting these? And so the ones who have a grayed out map, do you also have these unknowns? Okay. This is a very simple setting issue. Okay. It's not a problem. Okay. The guys got the US map, sheer dumb luck. Okay. I'll tell you why. The, their computer is set to the US. The data is also the US. So they're sure goddamn lucky. Okay. Ours has been set to India. So from an Indian setting, we're trying to find the US map. So for us, not going to happen. It's a simple setting. Suppose we had the Indian data set on the last day. The ones who don't get the map today on the last day, We'll get it, they won't get it, by the way, okay? So they'll have to make the setting. That's gonna happen. So we'll, we'll, we'll see that. Yeah, you, that's me. that means you are, you've got the same setting as mine. Your map has not come out yet. Okay, so we're gonna fix it. We're gonna fix it, we're gonna fix it. I'll show you how to fix this up. So you have these unknowns, right? Yeah, we're gonna fix it. Now, I want you all to click on the unknowns. The ones who have the US map, take a break. Nothing, okay? Next two seconds, take a break, okay? So we'll have to fix our settings up. Now, we guys, Click on the unknowns and I want you guys to click on edit locations. Okay. All right. The ones who have the US map, I'll make you all come to the same setting, but you guys don't have to change anything. I'll just get you how to come to the same setting. You need to have a different approach because you didn't have unknowns. I'll still get you to come here. Okay. Now the others wait. Okay. Others wait. Don't do anything. Okay. This is only for the ones who got the complete US map. You guys click on your options called map. Okay. And choose edit locations. You'll also come to the same screen. Okay. But you guys can wait. You don't have any work to do. Just watch. 
All right, now here's the deal. Check it out. The ones who don't get the map, like me, your country has gotten picked up as India. So your map that you got, the US map, you're supposed to sing USA because your setting has worked for you. Like I said, sheer luck, nothing else. Now, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find where is Alabama within the Indian locale. If I try to find a Tamil Nadu in the US, it's not going to happen. So that's what is happening here. If I can change the setting to the correct country, that will work. Now, if I can change this from India to the USA, it will work in this case. However, there is a bit of a catch here, okay? If I can change it from India to whatever, I can change it off, but I'll not do this. What if I have India and the US? Or three countries, okay? Then what's gonna happen is, for me, I would have got India for the setting, because this is India. These guys got the US, they'll give the US map. But if I have India and the US, I'll only get one map and he gets the other map. Not okay. Now, instead of letting to a particular setting, I'm going to let the database create a hierarchy. Okay, so what I mean by that is, think about this in your Excel file. We had one column called country. Yes or no, you remember that? One column called country, which had United States. I am going to let that drive the hierarchy. I want to say, hey, listen, don't stick to a particular country setting. Rather, let the variable drive the hierarchy and then choose whichever country state it is in. Okay, so um, all of us can do this. Choose on your country slash whatever setting and choose from a field of country. Don't fix it to a country, but choose from a field called country and then you guys should be good to go. Click on OK. You'll all get the US map like this. Now we'll all be on the same page. If anyone does not have a net connection, a proper net connection, you may not get a boundary at this point in time. But that's... Uh, did you click on the unknowns? And then choose, where do you see India? Hit that drop down. And then don't fix it, field, call country, and click on OK, you'll get it. Okay? Okay, so what's the pattern coming out here? What's the insight? Wh which state has the highest sales? California. California, followed by? New York, okay, then? Texas. Texas, okay, so California, New York, Texas, then? Washington, Washington of North, okay, then where? Yeah, this, okay, California, uh, Wash, uh, New York, uh, Washington, uh, Texas, Washington, Illinois. Illinois up here. Okay, Penn State somewhere right here. Maybe a bit of Florida as well. Okay. Uh, any pattern so far? Not just West Coast. Uh, coastal. Okay, coastal is one analogy. Okay, but we also know that these states which have darker blue color are the ones which have big cities as well, larger economy cities as well, right? So I want to now confirm whether it's the economy that's driving it or the sheer location giving it an advantage, okay? It's like this. If I see, um, uh, let's say if I see, uh, I want to see the, the cities are exactly on the coast. That's my logic, okay? And then I'll be convinced. I know big cities are on the coast, but I still want to be able to see whether it's some other places here and there, okay? That's my logic. So let's uh, break this further. Now, when it comes to geo mapping, um, do you guys learn the, okay, uh, forget that, I'll, I'll talk about that later. When you guys are collecting data, okay, for the first time, and if you know you're going to be creating map charts, you have location-specific data. A good practice is to have multiple levels of data in terms of geomapping. Suppose I'm looking at state, also have a country, have a city. Okay, if I have a country, have a state. If I have a state, have a country and a city. If I have a city, have a state and a town, you know, have one, two layers above and below. One layer, at least one layer above and below. It typically helps to... Uh, broaden your analysis. So collect data and that's that's right. It will give you much better results typically speaking. Okay All right, let's uh, move on but first name the sheet call this state sales Okay, state sales Put up another sheet. Let's look at the city sales map as well. Okay. After this, we'll break for tea. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you guys to do one thing. Choose your dimension called city, okay, and choose your measure called sales. Okay, C city and sales. Click on your control keys using your keyboards. Select both the variables, okay. Go to show me. And this time, take Tableau's default recommendation called the symbol math. Okay, choose that. 
Okay, so let's hang in for a minute. Okay, a few more settings to change, then we'll wrap this up real quick. Okay, now um, the ones who did not get the US map last time, you all should be going to Tamil Nadu right now, just like the way I have. Okay, and the ones who got the US map, you should have a partial US map. US map, you'll also have some unknowns. How many unknowns do you guys have? The part of 353. Okay, right. All of us have some amount of unknowns. Okay, let's first focus on our problem. We are at a larger issue. Why do you think we are in Tamil Nadu? Okay, now the ones who have the, the Indian map like me, there's one dot in Tamil Nadu. Find out which dot there is. Exactly. There are same spelling names in both the places. There's a Salem in India. There's also multiple Salem's in, Mass in, in the US. There's one in Massachusetts next to Boston. Okay, so uh, same cities. Same city, sorry, cities with the same spellings across different locations can have this problem. How do I define this? Now, here's where I'm going to drive this data. Okay. If I can change my country setting, part of it will get solved. Okay. That's what the ones who have the US map have some dots, but they also have some unknowns. Okay. Okay. We'll fix all our unknowns together in one simultaneous shot. Okay. All of us now, 530 or uh, 352, right? 352, whatever your, yours is. I want you all to click on this unknowns together, all of us together. Okay, all of us together will click on edit locations. Okay, the ones who have the US map or the ones your setting says India, USA, you guys don't have to do this, but we first have to change our country first. Okay, we'll change our country. Now, check this out. While I'm not changing it yet, okay, focus on my screen. All these cities are unrecognized. Look at the error message. I want you to keep an eye on this. It's unrecognized at this point in time. Okay. I'm going to first change it to a field called country. So the US has gotten picked up now. And now I notice that I have 353 issues in my data. So I'm now matched with the same as what these guys have. So if I now look at my city tab where I have these yellow exclamations. Okay. Check out the error message. It is not unrecognized. But it's ambiguous. Okay. Why do you think in Alexandria is ambiguous? St states. Different states. See, country has been rectified. Because the fact that you've chosen USA or uh, field of country, you're not stuck inside the US. You're not beyond that. It's not confusing with the Aberdeen in England, by the way. It is not confusing with the Alexandria in Egypt, by the way. It's not. There are multiple Alexandrias within Egypt. It's like how we've got an MG road in every city in India. Okay. It's, like, it's the same thing. So they have the same city names in multiple locations. There is actually an Aberdeen in... Um, uh, in Texas between uh, Austin and uh, Dallas. There is also another second Aberdeen in Colorado. There's a third Aberdeen in the state of Michigan, in, in the state of Michigan that I'm aware of myself. So Alexandria, there is one near the Pentagon. When you drive past the Pentagon, you'll find a boat called Alexandria, which I've seen myself. You will find another Alexandria in Texas. I've seen them. I've seen the same. I have witnesses myself. So I'm sure there are multiple issues like these uh, on and on and on and off. So this happens. Doesn't matter. Irrespective of what happens, we're going to now let the hierarchy do the talking. All I have to do is say, hey, listen, doesn't matter which state it is in. I see there's a field called state or province. If I can say, if I can define the state from the correct field of state that my database has right inputs in, click it, look what happens. And then click on OK. You should be OK. All your errors and ambiguous values will vanish. You'll find all your dots in the US. OK. So last time, color was an attribute. Darker the color, more the sale. And this time it is what? Size. Okay, size is another factor to amplify cognition. Which cities have your highest sales now? New York. Okay, then? Then? LA, then? San Francisco, then? Seattle? Philly, okay, then? Where? Sorry? Philly, yeah, Philly, yeah. Philadelphia, yeah. Uh, Detroit, the Chicago, there is Houston. There's uh, Jacksonville in Florida. Okay. So all these cities are actually having higher sales. So I know exactly why my sales are going high or low. Okay. So while these are coastal cities, it's not the sheer coast. These are also larger economy cities. So I know that this state has done well because multiple cities have done well here. Okay. This state has done well because of the larger city. So it's a city that is driving the hierarchy, a city that's having the high sales and not the actual coastal location. Okay. But yeah, I'd like to kind of compare them. When I see them both together, I now get this idea. Okay. Let's rename the sheet, call this city sales. City sales. Okay. 
we'll quickly put this into a dashboard, okay? And then we'll take a break, okay? Just a two more minute task. I want to bring this into a first dashboard and then we'll take a break, okay? So we've got enough charts, four charts. I, I, I made a name four charts deliberately because I want to bring in a four charted dashboard into my screen to start with, okay? Your category sales, your trend, state sales, resales. Now, there are three things I spoke about dashboard creation, three, th three parts. Can someone refresh my memory for that? Three things for a dashboard. I mentioned three things for a dashboard to consider. No, there are three things you have to keep in mind, plan. Ah, okay, there is one then. Two more. Uh, sorry? Content. content then? Layout. layout. Exactly. Content, layout, interactivity. Three things. As far as content is done, I've got my content ready. I'll tell you why content. Because there is a field. Okay, now how do you how do you make sure that you get the right content? Or make sure you have decent, sensible content? Now, it does not matter which dimensions you guys pick up. The measures will drive your content. You stick to one measure, your content will remain relevant. Believe you me, okay? There's a reason why I made you choose sales and everything. Because I want to bring in relevant content. If I had made one sales and one profits and one discount and one the same, put them into a dashboard, it will be chaotic. Hell break loose. Okay, charts might be sensible, but when seen together, it might just be a mess. Okay, so not a good idea. So, stick with your measure. Stick with one measure. Uniformity in terms of measures, dimensions, go nuts. Okay, go nuts, no problem, no issues. Choose any dimensions, but measure, stick with one. You will have a better strike rate of creating a sensible dashboard. Your content will be more relevant, okay? So content is done. Individual charts have been built, okay? Each chart makes sense. We are able to read every chart. We've done the orientation, labels, highlighting. We've done the, the thing, mixing, merging, everything is done. So when you see all the four charts, individually you're able to read the charts. You guys are good to go. That's your first starting point. Now let's put them into a dashboard. Some small issues will come up, but we'll fix it up, okay? Right, now let's open up a new dashboard, guys. So dashboard is this little thumbnail icon, the second thumbnail icon between your worksheet and your story, okay? I want you guys to click that. This is the container that you'll have when you see a dashboard, okay? Now, first things first, okay? Uh, forget this for a minute. Just, I want to ask you guys, if you guys ever get a dashboard, if you ever see a dashboard, what's the best size that you think you can get for a dashboard? Best size for a dashboard? Common sense question. It's common sense. Screen size. Whatever device you're viewing it in, your screen should be fully optimized. Preferably without a scroll. Be it a handheld device or be it a tablet or be it a phone or be it a computer or be it a laptop or be it a theater. It has to be a, it should take the full screen. Preferably without a scroll, okay? Now, again, I gave you guys a magic number of four, four ROM chips. That's again a magic golden number for dashboards. When you guys are trying to make dashboards, keep this as a thumb rule. Don't stick, don't, don't swear by the phone number four, okay? But I'm saying four can become a three or a four can become a five or a six, but don't make four into 20. Don't bring 20 charts. It's going to look chaotic. It look clut looks cluttered. So keep the number to a decent number of four, you should be good to go. You'll have a decent looking dashboard, generally speaking, okay? So great, here it is. We'll now fix the container. We'll make sure our dashboard is optimally sized. We'll make sure that there is no scroll bars, no gray space and all that. And we'll do a small setting change here now. Now, there are multiple ways to fix it up, okay? Um, and it's good to have, good to understand how this works. See, there is a one touch fix. But that's something you've got to be a little cautious about, okay? Now say if you ch choose this option called size here, it's a default desktop browser of 1000 by 800, okay? If I make a selection out there for a minute, I see there are multiple options to play with. I can increase my heights and widths and all that, okay? And notice in this size tab, there are two drop-down tabs. There's a fixed size and a desktop, some two drop-downs here, okay? Now, Let's look at the second option for a minute, this desktop browser in here. If you actually choose your second drop down, okay, it'll give you all kinds of different options. It gives you a full screen option also, okay? Now, here's the deal. Suppose you guys want um, to have, you want to do, a, some, some people like to print dashboards. I don't, they do that. I mean, it's the most, it's the most, it's the most useless piece of effort. I don't know why people do that, but printing dashboards is, to me is criminal, okay? But people do that. Sometimes they print and hang them on their C-suites just to flaunt that they have a dashboard, okay? My clients do that, and I think it's absolutely criminal. Yeah, but if those, if you work for one of those, then unfortunately you choose one of these uh, templates, okay? 
but yeah if you want to view them on a device uh, there are options there is an option to kind of bring multiple things in here now what happens if i get to view them in multiple devices okay so this is your screen size okay he's got a different slightly different screen size everybody's laptop is going to be a little different here and there okay what if you guys are going to take it to a a tablet or maybe a phone or something okay then your screen size is going to differ okay now there is a fairly decent fix for all of this see again large orient thing is that most of our screens are luckily landscape most of our screens are landscapes okay and it's within a reasonable difference i can see all these laptops it's not that her laptop is not very different from his maybe a little smaller or a little wider okay but more or less it's laptop it's it's landscape now um i had a couple of rare cases i had where i had a problem i said there is a, there is an option called auto. let's first change it okay first go to this this option called fixed size hit this option you'll find a tab called automatic and when you choose this automatic you'll find that it fits your screen automatically this is a great approach provided we know we are reasonably similar okay fix size make it to automatic now suppose a, a, a particular client of mine okay what they did was they were trying to view all the reports on their handheld devices so like similar like phones okay they had their own in house um, device now that was a very old some stone age device that they had it did not have auto flip or auto rotate options there okay so i'll tell you what i did when i made the dashboard for them um i had designed it in a in a landscape mode okay which was fixing automatically for me it was sent to them those guys have seen from a server they had it on their phones when they were able to see their devices what was landscape on my screen went in a portrait mode for them so think what happened there was space wasted above and below it was a not a good it was not the best of my work i was not very happy about it i have another client um she actually has a 35 mm screen she has a theater to view her reports okay so she every morning she takes her coffee she sits in her in her theater to watch her reports she calls a meeting she does all her skype calls she does all her uh, overseas calls from her office what i designed on my laptop like this what look good my computer on her 35 mm screen looked horrendous looks all stretched out looked all very distorted looked look absolutely weird okay so a rare case i know it's a rare case but you just can't blindly trust the setting is all i'm saying you have to be very about who's going to view and what device and see how uh, do a trial and test run if it can look good then it's better so you know for that 35 mm screen i had to go to her office one time i sat on one of the uh, stations and i kind of had to format it and make it look nice because she was one of my largest clients i didn't want her to see a distorted looking dashboard so yeah had that happens as well just take be aware of where you're sending it to okay all right so right now we're good now um here's what i want to do okay in terms of uh, putting in a layout right now okay um say for a minute if i want to plan a layout okay this is what i'm in, i'm proposing so give me a second yeah see this is my dashboard we said four charts because four rom chips for a minute i'll just break them into four quadrants okay most english speaking cultures we either read left to right or top to bottom okay going by this logic my eyes are always going to be drawn towards this part of my quadrant to start with always okay and let's say i'm a left to right kind of a guy so this is my second screen makes this my third screen and this is my fourth quadrant most english speaking cultures do this if i do a top to bottom and left to right then this is still my first spot i look at this becomes my second screen this becomes my third spot and this is my last spot in any which case these are my two potential options i can look at so in other words all i'm going to see is either see data in a z pattern okay or inverted n pattern these are my two styles of seeing data so box 1 is my prime real estate i'm going to utilize that for the most compelling parts of my view so i can basically really capture the essence as much as i can okay and the last box that i he see here okay i want to typically use this as my last finishing point i want to conclude my story or my views in the last fourth point this is my approach of creating a layout layout okay i got four charts let me see how best i can take these four charts now okay now another approach to take here is of the four charts your category sales your trend your state and your city sales which chart shows a high level picture which is the highest level picture of all really your city shows 530 data points so that's not a high level picture 
स्टेट शोज ऑलमोस्ट फिफ्टी पॉइंट्स your category breaks your 10000 10, points into three points that's your high level picture okay so i'm going to use my category sales to come in my first quadrant cat sales i think here okay of all the four charts what is the lowest level of detail city so in my last quadrant i'm plan to bring my city sales okay my plan now two more charts are left with i feel state and city have a connection so i want to keep them side by side so i'm going to bring in my state into this part of my screen here Which is my trend right about here? So my line chart is going to come right here. This is my logic. This is how I would use a logic to build a dashboard every time, and a layout will be planned in accordance with this. This makes much more logical sense. Again, see these things are not written in these are not hand, they are they are not written anywhere. It's not as long as you have a reason as to why you're doing that. Please do that. For me, one and four, like I did it like before. Sure. Okay. Just one matches. For me, one and four are matching. If you want to swap them, then the choice is yours. I mean, if you have a if you have a logic, if you feel that that makes sense, then do that. It's up to you. Yeah, that's that's totally your call. Yeah, yeah, that's your call. Yeah, these things are not written anywhere, so you might as well. I mean, get a large framework. Overall, overall, get some logic. Get the Z pattern. Have a story. If you think it makes sense in your eye, then it's fine. I'm not going to. That's something I'm. That's that's okay. That's totally fine. Okay. So all right, time to bring these four views in here, guys. Four drags and drops. Your category sales first chart, you guys can simply drag and drop it. Now you notice that there are sheets here. You don't have dimensions measures any longer, so you can just simply drag and drop them. Every time you bring in a sheet here, it'll demand a tile. So I'm going to get my category sales, just drag and drop it there, and the whole dashboard is being displayed with the help of one chart now. Okay, right. Let's do the other three charts as well. Okay, so follow along as I'm doing. It'll be easier. Okay, then your sales trend. I said it's going to come in my second quadrant. Okay, my second quadrant right here. So I'm going to get my sales trend right about here. So I'm going to drag and drop my sales trend right about here. So notice when you drag and drop it, it demands a tile. The gray area is where when you let go, it's going to sort of sit there. Okay, so there it is. So my second chart is also coming now. Now, along with my line chart, its legend has also come in. Just keep an eye on the legends. Okay, just keep an eye. Then comes your state sales map. Let's drag and drop it here. Well, let's drop it. Not here. Not here. Not here. There. Right there. That's my state sales map, and its legend also came there. And lastly, the city sales. Drag and drop it. Well, not here. Not here. Not here. But there. That's my last chart. So all my four charts have been brought into my report. So that's it. Pretty much done. So kind of okay with the layout that I had. Uh, I've kind of got here now. Just a few more quick tweaks that will be done. Okay. Now. Uh, Time to remove some clutter. Charts individually are fine. I don't see a big deal, but I think this dashboard has some non-value-adding elements, which I think can be cleaned. Okay, here's where now you guys need to be sensitive towards all this. What do you think is some factors that we can do without? There are some things we can do without, and still have a good dashboard. What's that? Uh, color what? Color? You mean the chart itself? You mean the all these uh, colors here? The ones, okay, the one, okay. These are legends. F spot on. You you got it right. These are things which you don't really require. Okay, these three are legends. Of the three, which is the most non-value adding legend? First, second, or third? Last. Last. I mean, think about this. Absolutely right. Are you ever going to look at compare which uh, chart does this belong to? State or city map? Exactly. C city map. If the dot is, dot is larger, more sale. If it's smaller, lower the sale. the size will drive your chart not this stupid legend okay so guys no love lost okay no emotions ruthlessly just take it out okay take it out no love lost at all okay it's time to push ourselves a little more okay now what if i say i can educate you and i'm sure you can remember this your state sales map i'm saying hey listen the, the state is darker the sale is higher the state is lighter sale is lower can't you remember that much i'm sure you can i can teach you that much i can i can train you that much So going by that logic, I'm also going to remove this state, the the sales legend as well. Again, no love lost. Trash it. Okay, take it out. Doesn't matter. You can train this much. This much of training is possible. Okay. Now, this legend I've got to be a little careful. I can't say, listen, now remember uh, Indigo is 2015, Yellow is 2016, this is 2018. Even I just forgot. Short term memory, I forget. Okay. Even I can't. Remember. So now I can't push you any further. Then that is lunacy. Okay. Then he, I'll get fired for my work. So I need to keep it. But for me. This is one legend wasting all the space is criminal. Okay, so I'm going to now do something about this or this orientation. Now, 
click on the legend itself okay click right on the legend okay you will notice that in the when you when you click exactly inside the legend box it has three menu options on the side there okay there's something called more options the list this arrow that drops down this last arrow which drops down when you click that we'll talk about all the other things later right now there is something called as floating i want you guys to choose this floating option okay when you do that you notice it's no longer demanding a tile it will free float you can place it wherever okay you can place it wherever based on this location until it reaches the right spot and i'm going to leave it somewhere right here low of proximity leave it right there a few more minute fine tunes once you have brought it in there okay now this year of this legend okay it's a very small factor but to me these are pain points i don't want to see year of order date i know it's the year okay i know each one stands for a year so i don't need to see that text also even that to me is a uh, irritant i'd like to remove this text box inside this legend okay so right click exactly on it or just on top of the legend box okay there is an option called show title which is currently ticked if you click it it will untick it meaning the title will also vanish okay one more tweak i'm saying this legend i'd like to place it exactly on the same row not like one below the other this is another minor tweak for me but these are little tweaks these are little botherance that should it should trouble you okay that's when you are on the right track so there's nothing wrong if it troubles you it should trouble you okay now right click on this one more time there is an option called arrange items and let's arrange them onto a single row okay single row and it will basically arrange them onto one row notice that it's kind of going all the way so if you actually stretch this box a little to your right all the legends will nicely come there so there so i think i'm kind of okay with this sort of a legend i think i'm settled for this so this is where my legend is yeah yeah and i'm happy with this okay one more little layout tweak and then we can make this dashboard nicely interactive with just one last click okay for this category sales chart i have nothing better to show okay i don't have anything more interesting to show or nothing more compelling all i'm saying is why waste space use a full space for the chart okay like justified fully one simple real quick fix just right click on the chart on the on the chart where it's unutilized there's an option called fit okay and just say fit and fit entire view that's it that's also done so dashboard looks better nice and clean okay this is now got me the layout that i wanted whatever i wanted so two things of a dashboard is done content is done layout is done without any clutter time for the last part interactivity i'll do a very simple interactive feature very very simple interactive feature nothing fancy but even this itself is a is a mind blowing powerful technique to give you enough insights about the data okay so again they just four clicks literally four clicks all i'm saying is if you all have done uh, slicers and pivots very similar it will create filtering actions multiple filtering actions somebody said ask about filters well we'll this is one kind of a filter okay it's not the filter it's one kind of a filter okay so i want to now act use every item here to act as a filter okay all i want you to do is click on the first chart and when you, when you click on the first chart you'll have its four options on top there okay notice your third icon says use as filter when you hit that option notice that it will turn white in color that means that filter has been activated now do this with second chart go to your line chart use as filter then go to your state map click use as filter then go to your city map and use as filter all the four charts and that your dashboard is not ready for analysis your three parts are done content layout and interactivity is not ready let's now get some actual answers from this dashboard okay we we'll get some actual answers now now the way this works here is you have basically set every item every dot point of this dashboard to behave as a filter at this point it's a very simple filter okay so see if you minute now do something click on this uh, technology bar look what happens click on technology look and look at the other three charts you will notice that your other three charts values are changing something is interacting all you've done is nothing but filter this dashboard for the view of technology okay and now when i click on furniture the views will change i can see that my lines are looking different my state values have gotten different my cities look different when i look at office supplies they'll have a different value numbers are changing so it's actually filtering data for that particular item you've clicked okay 
you've done multiple clicks, you want to get back to your previous screen, want all your data back, hit escape on a keyboard. It will take you back to your original data, escape. Okay. Let's try one more. Okay, let's try one more. This one data point, November 2018, I'm saying is a really good month. I want to know why. What's happened special in that one month for the sales to go higher? Okay, so let's click on it and get some answers. Go ahead. All right, so talk to me. What does this tell you? What happened well there? What, what are some good indicators for the month? Interpret this view for me, please. Yeah, it was technology driven. Okay, for starters, what else? I can say many states have not sold for the month, in spite of which it's the highest selling. So it looks like there is opportunity. If I can still sell better, maybe it could have gone higher. What else? What about the state map? What about the state map, guys? Which states are really standing well? Okay, big cities and, and something more has come up as well. If you notice something new has come here now, which was not there before. Which one is that? Exactly, this state called North Carolina, was it there in the earlier case? I doubt it. Okay, so now my, my doubts are towards North Carolina. Okay, I want to know why, what happened in North Carolina for that month. Okay, once you guys have an indicator like this, okay, without thinking twice, go and click on North Carolina again. Okay, right there, same time. So you are at the same time period, okay, and now you're doing a drill down into North Carolina for that particular month, and let's see what the case is there. It, so in that particular month, when sales was the highest overall, and I found this one state stood out, it looks like technology is still the highest. And within North Carolina, there's one city that's standing out. What city is that? Burlington. Burlington. Okay, so it looks like Burlington. Okay, you know what? Let, let me click on Burlington also one more time. Let me also do a click on Burlington. Okay, so, well, it looks like Burlington had a high sale of technology. So there's a reason why sale was very high in that particular month. I think I sold a lot of technology items in Burlington for that particular month. And that's the answer I've got here now. So I can use a dashboard for something like this. I can keep doing drill downs. I can keep clicking in multiple levels until I'm able to seek the actual answer. If something is not doing good, I can get answers. Not do, if it's doing good, I can find answers. And I can keep doing smart drill downs and clicks to get some answers like this. Okay. Escape, all your data comes back once again. Everything comes back. Okay. One last uh, quick fix. When you guys um, talk about presenting this data to an audience, okay, let's assume that you're going to work on this platform, okay? And if you want to make this into a nice uh, presentable kind of a mode, uh, on, a, on a tablet desktop, notice there's an option called presentation mode, F7. And when you click on that right there, it kind of puts it on a nice PPT-ish kind of a style and you can still have a nice interactive interface. So this is something you guys could use in case you decide to put up a dashboard like this and make presentations and still not keep clicking. So when you do clicks, you know what? Your interactions will take place. But when you guys want to get all your data back and you hit escape one time, it will take out the full screen mode. Escape one more time, the data will come back. Okay. That's something I would recommend when you guys are presenting. When you do your capstones, you might, you may use this. This will come in handy for you guys. Okay. So great. Now, um, plan now is to build a story. Okay, we're going to build a simple storyboard. And uh, I'll give you a little, uh, a quick talk on that. Okay, before that, just one um, quick thing. Uh, if you look at uh, data, okay, if you look at all your data for a minute, let's look at date fields. Date fields have natural hierarchies in them. Yes or no? Okay, how, how so? Year, quarter, month. Year, quarter, month. The fact that you can make a day to year, a quarter, a month becomes hierarchies by themselves. Okay. Now, date fields have a bit of an extra catch to that. Okay. Um, between your dimensions and measures, which one is discrete? Dimension. Measures are continuous. Okay. But date is a special dimension. Yes or no? You can make it behave discrete or continuous. Are you all familiar with that idea? How does that work? How does that work? You, you can see again, you don't, you don't have to do anything. You can either see them as discrete buckets or you can make them continuous buckets. Simple logic. 
Okay. Um, if I see my dates from, let's just say from now till, uh, uh, say, say I've got, I've got three, six, five days of date. If I show a single state line for all the, all the dates, all the days, it's a continuous aggregation. There's no breakup. There's no bucketing. Okay. But if I decide to make them into months, what am I doing? I'm effectively making them into buckets. I'm trying to put them into some kind of a boundary. The moment the boundary comes, you're going to make them into discrete. That's the deal. So you can change the aggregation, the way in which you show the data. You can either make them discrete or continuous. The reason I'm trying to bring this is here is now let's say a small thing here. Okay. Uh, let's say a drag and drop, say an order date into my columns. Okay. All of you do this. Just take any date into your columns. Let's drag and drop any measure. Let's say number of records or something into your rows. Any, any measure. I don't care. Okay. So right now you see a line that looks like this. Data is broken onto four years and highest level of data. So I'm just seeing one single straight line. If I now hit the number of records, number of records into rows. Okay. Now, if I click on the plus symbol on the year, it's going to break them into four quarters. Okay. Four quarters and four uh, years, basically. So I'm seeing four years into four quarters. So 16 data points. Okay. Now, right now I'm saying that the data is broken into some sort of buckets. There is some kind of bucketing happening, which is why you see four broken lines. Okay. Four broken lines. If I can remove the bucketing effect in my date field, I'll see a single straight line. Point I'm trying to make here is now I'm seeing four. There, there are 16 data points. There's a Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. This has a Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. All the four years have four quarters. Okay. Now there is nothing wrong. Nothing wrong at all. If I join Q4 of the first year with the Q1 of the second year, data is not incomplete. It's, it's full valid information. Okay. So lines can be drawn from here to here. There's nothing wrong with that at all. When does it become wrong? If there's a Q1, Q2, Q3, I don't have a Q4. Missing information. Then I join this here. Then I am misrepresenting data. That is a mistake. In that case, I'll not join. But in this case, there is really nothing wrong in joining. Okay. So I'd like to see how I can bring that effect. So I can use it for some pattern. Say I want the overall trend. Four years overall trend. This will give me a trend for each line. I need an overall trend for all the four years. I'd like to perform a time series forecasting for which I want to look at at least two time periods. Then I must have at least two lines joined. Okay. So for things like those, I think I'm going to have to kind of change my level of detailing. I'll see how we can do this now. Okay. Now the date fields by default are a dimension. Yes or no? Date is a dimension by default. It's not a measure. By default, all your dimensions are discrete. But date alone, I can treat differently. Okay. Now let's do one thing. I want you all to click on the minus symbol on the year. So get just your years alone, all of you. Do this. Okay. Now, do notice here in the columns and rows. In my columns, where I have the year of order date, it's a blue colored variable. It's got a blue colored cell. Okay. If I look at the number of records, it's green in color. You notice on whichever chart you look at, any measure, measure is always green in color. Check any, any chart. Measure is always green color. Your dimension is always blue in color. Whichever chart, look at all the charts, you'll find the same deal. Your measures will be blue. Dimensions will be green. And all the four or five charts that you've made, you'll find the same deal here. Okay. So that's the way it works now. Now that makes a difference. If I can convert my date field into a continuous field, it will also become green color. Okay. And let's check it out. Right click on the date field for a second. And you guys will notice there are two sets of date aggregators, meaning there's a year, quarter, month to start with and the first on top. There's also a second year, quarter, month in this, in this part of your screen here. Okay. By default, it picks up discrete aggregation techniques. But if you want to change them to continuous, you can also do that. Now, what does it mean to me? Okay. So now I know how to make it discrete or continuous, but what does it mean to me in terms of applications? That's the more important part. Okay. This is all theory. The actual meaning of this is what matters now. Now check this out. I want you guys to look at this gray part of your, this gray headers. Okay. On the right side. I want you guys to look at that. That's the way in which you will get the output. You've got to decide what kind of output you need 
to best answer your business problem. There is no sure shot written recipe for this. It depends. It's a classic MBA answer. Depends. Okay. Every situation depends. You've got to take a call. So you're left in the dark. Okay. You're blindfolded. You have to find your own option. There's no other, there's no written rule. I can't say choose this or that. Whatever is your situation, you've got to choose the right appropriate aggregation. Now, let's say for a minute, if I choose the years, the first year or the second year, they're both the same yearly aggregation. It doesn't matter. It's, it doesn't really matter. But if I start to look at the quarters, both the quarters, the first one only says Q2, okay, but the second says a year and a quarter. So check this out. If I choose the, uh, if I, again, if, if I choose the first year for a minute, okay, the first year for a minute, okay, let's keep the year itself. Nothing will happen except that the data has become a full screen data and the color of the variable has turned green color. That's it. Okay, now when I click on the plus symbol one time, you'll notice that the year and quarter is still forming a line for you, but it gives you a continuous line there for you. Okay. So like I said, this might be a better way to show, if you want to show overall trend for four years, a single trend for four years, this might be a better way to show this. For each year's trend, then the previous thing might be all right. But you want to show an overall trend in some scenarios, then this might be appropriate. Time series forecasting, this might be required. Okay. So you got to kind of pick up what makes sense. So this is what your, this is the thought I just want to put into your head now. Okay. Okay, so this we've spoken about your date hierarchies. Okay, date as discrete and continuous fields. Tomorrow I'll talk about custom hierarchies as well. Okay, today because I want to jump into something more uh, fascinating. And I know you, you guys gave me a deadline, so I want to stop by 7.30. Okay, um, I'd like to build a story now with this part. Okay, now what I want you guys to do is first help me build a problem statement. Okay, same, let's take the same workbook. I have a dimension called subcategory. Okay. Drag and drop it into your rows, all of you. Do this yourself, okay? I want you guys to do this yourself. Drag and drop the subcategories to your rows, all of you. I want you guys now to analyze all your dimensions, okay? All your uh, subcategories. Um, there is one, okay, now, I want you guys to bring in sales and profit into a chart. Whatever chart you want to bring in, do that. I don't have a problem. I want you guys to help me profile one of your subcategories called tables. How is that table, the item called table, behaving in terms of sales and profits? So look at the chart, make a chart and answer. I want you guys to give me an answer. So I want you to make a problem statement and with that we'll start to build a story. I want a starting point for a story from you. Sales and profits. Look at that same, I, you all have seen the item called tables in subcategories, all of you? Yeah? It's a third last, second last item or something. Tables will be somewhere below. Now. Drag and drop a table, drag and drop profit, and tell me how is it in terms of sales and in terms of profits? I want one sentence for it. How do you find tables in terms of sales and profits? Overall sales, overall profits. One sentence. Please summarize it for me. It's a loss. It's a loss, okay. Uh, how, how loss making is it? In terms of a comparison, give me a quick, uh, in how many, there are totally 17 items. How low in terms of loss? Not, don't give me a number. Tell me in terms of ranking amongst other items. So is it the highest loss maker? Okay. Okay. So least profitable. Okay. In terms of uh, sales, fourth highest. Uh, who's not able to see that? Who's not able to get that point? They gave me a point. So table is fourth highest in terms of sales. In terms of profits, it's the least profitable. Okay. How many items do I have in total? 17. So... So going by a Pareto principle, my table is a very high significant sale maker, but I'm selling it something which is not making a great profit. So this is my problem statement. I would now like to analyze uh, ways and means to sort of break this uh, into, a, into multiple uh, views and build a story around this. Okay. So let's kind of prepare a blueprint first. Okay. Now I've, I've made a blueprint. Okay. And this is something which I've already planned. Now this is something that you guys need to now start doing yourself. Same thing, content, layout, interactivity is required. For a story, of course, you have a problem statement to make it additionally better. So I have this as well. So basis this problem statement, I'm going to create some specific content. I'll also plan layout. And while I make this layout, I'll also prepare some interactive features for my storyboard. Same thing. This will have captions, some extra features as well, okay? Now, this is something that you will first sit and break your head over. When you guys have capstone projects to look at, you guys will first do this planning, okay? I've done this planning, so I'm going to throw my plan right now on the board. You guys can follow my plan, but this is something that you'll do first. 
this takes time this is not this is basically nothing it's not any uh, it's nothing technological it's pure common sense it's brains pen on paper activity you got to brainstorm like how you guys plan to when you guys make a ppt don't you first plan how do you want to make a ppt what comes first what comes second third fourth what goes item goes where what kind of views what kind of pictures what kind of points what tables same thing here instead of all that i'm preparing the order of my slides and i'm also planning what content goes into it so that's my slight different approach for my story okay so i'll i'll draw a plan out here okay actually i'll uh, let me ask you guys some you know what i'll make it as per your uh, I'll, i'll kind of customize it to your need a little bit i'll take about 2 minutes if you guys need to analyze profitability for tables tell me what dimensions you think are relevant in your sense i i'm going to i'll take your opinion into into account tell me what dimension you think you think might make sense i'm going to start listing all that please tell me look at the dimensions measures i've told you profit tell me which dimensions you think will make sense in your you think you you're curious to explore which all dimensions you think you're curious to explore let's take a reasonable number okay um, you brought a discount okay discount is a measure so okay i you 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 jumped again but i'll still address your point i'll come back to your point so if i need to analyze discounts versus profits we are looking at two measures what's the chart choice for that for two measure chart choice no i've not done it here but you should have done this before in some other i'm sure you've done this two measures scatter plot so we do a scatter okay discounts versus profit i'll i'll bring it in one of my views i'll bring that okay so fair enough i'll start like writing things down i definitely must have sub categories because that is something which is my given okay i will have sales because i know it's going to say how much in terms of sales i need profits for sure okay and i'll also bring in discounts for for, for a fact okay great what other okay now enough of your measures dimensions now okay uh, segment is one okay uh, okay Pick up, okay, so when you when you're starting a problem statement, start at the high level picture and then build down. Okay, okay, so that's another option that I have. So you you can take segment as well, not an issue. Yeah, keep going. Sorry. Okay, product is probably a very low level detail. Product is a very very low level detail because I'll tell you. Okay, category. I I have sub category. Why do you want to go category? I've already got it. Okay, do we need country in this case? Is it is con is country required here? How many countries do we have here? So if I make a chart, I'm just going to have one number. Does it even make? Uh, uh, uh. So so what is the next best option? State, state, and then maybe a city. Some location-based metrics. Okay. Now you're talking. Let's say some location-based metric. Okay. So within location, I'll I'll talk about say state and city. Okay. I'll bring in two levels of detail. Okay. Anything else? Shipping mode. Um, how do you think that? See again. Sh- I'll, I'll give you a little idea. Shipping mode is basically. Uh, i'm passing on the cost to my clients a shipping mode does not affect my in this case at least in this case the shipping mode is not affecting my profit really because if i'm shipping it to you in first class because you asked for it you're paying for it it does not affect my i'm i'm the owner of the store if you want express mode you paying for express mode if you want normal mode you paying for it so that's not affect my profit in this case but with recent uh, like marketing strategies wherein one day deliveries from amazon they are using they are okay mode. okay in this case i'm saying no in this case okay maybe yes but in this case i'm saying no okay in this case it is not happening not not in this it is not impacting me so much okay see segment again okay let's do okay you guys are helping on segment let's do a segment as well okay sure i'll give you a segment as well okay what else one more give me one more sales is there okay date is talking trend okay let's look at trend wise as well at tr- uh let's first look at okay how many orders will that um, how that okay you can that mean there's no harm in that let's first take the date part let's take the date date i think date guys let's take a date date factor okay combination of order date and ship date okay we'll keep that for tomorrow that involves a calculation we we'll do that tomorrow okay and you can add this to a part of your story possibility is it okay hold on to that let's first take a date we take one date see how am i trending in terms of profits or losses for all my data okay so i'll take in a date field so i'll i'll bring in my date order date let's say order date combining i'll do tomorrow once i show you another technique okay then it will make more sense later okay so uh, i think this is good enough to start with this is this is only decent enough point with these variables i'll plan a layout right now okay with this variables let's say to start with 
I'd like to make a bar chart, okay? I'll use my different uh, subcategories. I'll first plot this value of sales in terms of all my subcategories. I'll sort them from high to low. And I'll say table is my fourth highest in terms of sales. The chart that you all see, okay? I'll move on to my second view, my second PPT. I'll take my subcategories again. I'll take the sales to be the length of the bar and I'll put profits on the color of the bar and say however tables are the highest losses. I'll give in my problem statement. First two charts have only introduced my problem statements, nothing else. I'm now going to take into account all these factors. Okay. Let's get in the third view as well. I'd like to now bring in some kind of an interactive view. Okay. So let's say I'm going to use this. I'm done with this. I'll be using all this. Okay. How about we take in um, the date as the next factor, okay? So I'm gonna bring in some date metrics in my analysis. Let's say I wanna bring in a couple of views here, okay? Say I'll plan a layout like this, okay? And uh, I'll take the same chart, subcategories. I'll call it S slash P, sales slash profit, okay? And uh, I'm gonna bring in a couple of uh, date views in here. Okay, so first thing is I'm gonna have a chart here, wherein in the um, X axis, I have my date. In the Y axis, I have my profit. And I'll have, a, I'll have a line chart and say here's how my profit looks like for whatever item for tables or whatever, okay? Now, I'd like to bring in a second view here. I'll have a date field here, same date field. I'll have a profit in the Y axis. And uh, this time, instead of a line chart, I'll make this into a bar chart. Okay, same data, just shown in two different angles, just for, just to prove a point, okay? What does a line do best? What's the best strength of the line versus the bar? When you see a line, what is the best thing about a line? Trend. You know what? A trend line. Let's spot it. We'll make it continuous and we'll spot the overall trend line, okay? So we'll look at that on the line chart. Okay, the next question, what does a bar do better than a line? Compare. Somebody spoke about comparing values and in in when I asked, first asked you, now it's answering a point. I don't know, somebody there asked me this, mentioned this. Comparisons happens better with a bar chart, any day. Okay, a line might not give you that level of precision, but a bar will give you that level of precise comparison of points. So I want to use that. The theme of my story is still tables and it's profitability. I have not forgotten that. Okay, all I'm going to do here is we learned the simple action called uses filter, didn't we? In this previous dashboard. For the chart on top alone, I'll use a filter. So when I click on tables, for example, I click on tables, these two charts will get filtered for tables. So I can then make my answers for tables, okay? I'm gonna keep this theme running, okay? So let's move on. So my date is done. Let's look at maybe the location next, as my next view in here, okay? Say, uh, I bring another set of views in here. I get the same subcat sales slash profit in here, okay? I get the state map for profits, the city for profits, okay? I'll have the users filter, okay? And you know what? I'll also bring in segments right now. I mean, I'll also bring in a segment view in, or I'll keep segment data, doesn't matter, okay? I'll keep it here, yeah. Users filter and when I click on tables, I'll have the table filtered for states and profits, states and cities. I'll know how much, which state is making, which state makes a profit for, or a loss for table and same thing for cities. I'll get the deal there, okay? I'll get in, say, one more view, okay? One more view. Let's say discount, okay? How about I say discount, let's say subcat, sales slash profit, okay? This will be set as a filter again, same deal, okay? I'll bring a segment now, okay? I'll, I'll, get, a, I'll get a view here, okay? Let's say I wanna bring a chart, a scatter plot for discounts versus profits. So in my Y axis, I'll have my discount profit. X axis, I'll have my discounts. I'll have whatever dots in here. It'll have a trend line, okay? And I'll also bring a segment filter here. So I'll also analyze segments versus my discounts and profits. 
Okay, so I can pretty much bring in most of my views. I'll see which segment is giving profits or losses. I can also see how is that versus discounts. I can bring in multiple approaches. And this is my plan to pretty much answer this. Okay, so I think yeah, this is a fairly decent layout of a storyboard. This is my plan. I mean, it's an approach I just took. I just made it up real quick. So again, you can make your own story layouts depending on what makes sense to you. But right now I picked up this layout. Okay, so let's say you finalized on some kind of an arrangement like this. We'll actually implement this now, okay? With a whole bunch of options and all that. Now, let's see what are the basic building blocks that we need to actually uh, construct or create for this particular report, okay? Now, let's say uh, this is your first chart. Subcategory sales is chart number one. This is chart number two. This chart will be used here once. I have the exact same chart used here. So I'm going to call it two. And the exact same chart used here one more time and one more time. So it's actually two charts, technically speaking, okay? Your third chart is your line chart for your dates. The fourth chart is your bar chart for your dates. Okay, four. Fifth is your state map. Sixth is your city map. Seventh is your scatter plot. okay? Now, these are my first seven steps. My eighth step, I'll set this filter for this chart alone. Okay, so it's chart number eight. Okay, that's done. So my ninth step, what I'm gonna do here, once I finish eight steps, it's now, I can see this is fine the way it is. That's also fine the way it is, doesn't require any change. So the ninth step, I'm gonna construct this bit of view as step nine, make a dashboard out of it and use it for my story eventually, what we did before. 10 step, I'll kind of construct this dashboard and call it step number 10. This becomes step 11. And the whole thing put into story becomes step 12 with captions. This is my plan. Okay, so we're gonna <clears throat> now follow this blueprint. You guys wanted to make some analysis, I've kind of brought in some of your views, okay? You, some of you mentioned product name, product ID, you can keep adding on. There's, there's, you can add multiple sheets to this, it can keep going on and on, but right now I think I'll stop here, okay? And I mean, it's iterative, you can keep really going on and on. But I, I guess this will give you a fairly good starting point. Okay, so let's begin. Let's construct all these individual elements. Okay, all right, so. <coughs> yes, please. Right, right, correct. So in this case, you made a problem statement saying you're selling something very well, but you're losing while you're selling. So can we, let's find answers whether you want to keep it or not keep it. Why is it even happening? You know, try and find some answers to address it. See again, you know, you notice one thing, right? There's one beauty of the story. This is not like a regular storytelling. When you guys write a novel or a story, um, if you're a storyteller, you probably need to know the ending to kind of make a story. Here, the good part is you don't need to know any ending. You know, this is good enough. What I've just done here right now is actually a, is pretty decent a deal. I'll tell you why. A simple, a simple thought, thought idea, a thought, okay? Let's say for a minute, I have this, this line chart here for a minute, okay? This line chart. Now, there could be three kinds of trends for this line chart. Either the trend could be increasing, or the trend could be coming down, or it's a flat trend. Either which ways, I have an answer. It doesn't matter. If my trend is going up, what does it mean? Good, bad, okay? Good, because your profit is increasing. Trend goes down, what does it mean? Decreasing. If it goes flat, neither profit nor, you're kind of on a stable thing, which is again not a good thing. You're working for something which is not really making any meaning. Do you see the, do you see the logic what I'm trying to build in here? I don't care what is my insight. It's the layer that matters. Let's take another example here. Let's say some state, let's say New York makes a profit for tables. Okay, let's say Texas, or let's say New York makes a loss for tables, bad thing. If New York is just medium, I'll say neither profit nor loss. So it's neither good nor bad. So guess what, same answers. Any city, same answer. For a scatter plot, as my, if I look for tables, as I'm adding more and more discounts, is my loss increasing? Is my profit increasing, decreasing, or the same? I'll, I'll get three lines. So if the line goes up, it means the more discounts I give, more, pro, more the profit is. If it comes down, that means the more discount, Less of the profit. If it's flat, if it's flat, what does it mean? 
it doesn't make a difference exactly so if it so in that case i'll say that case i'll twist my story a bit if uh, table is having a sale because of high discounts keep doing it because the more discount you give it does not have any impact on profit do you see what i just did so to me it doesn't matter what is the outcome I don't care about the outcome. So whatever outcome I get, I will just call it a scholar spade a spade and my story is done. I'll still stay relevant. I'll give answers right. Okay. So again, don't worry about the end statement. It's the problem statement that matters. From your problem statement, build your layout and then from there you can pretty much drive through any story. Okay. So let's start to build this. Okay. Let's look at... Uh, the first, okay, so I'm going to keep referring back to the whiteboard, okay, every now and then. Let's say step one, step two, I'm going to look at all these steps. So you guys can follow along with this if you want to. I'm going to make the first chart called my subcategories. I drag and drop my subcategories to my rows to start with, okay, and my sales in my columns to start with. Simple bar chart. Yeah, sorting. Somebody said sorting. I'm going to sort the data from high to low, okay. And I'm going to call this sheet as sales mix. Sales mix. Okay, sales mix. That chart has been built for me. Okay, done? Done? Okay? Right. All right, open up another sheet, please. <clears throat> so I'm planning to go a little slow on the basic charts. If anybody gets stuck, stop me, I'll stop. I'm intentionally going fast because basic charts, what we did before, I'm, I mean, if you get stuck, but stop me, okay? So uh, I'm going to open up another sheet. If you want me to slow down, please tell me, then I'll slow down, okay? But I'm deliberately going a little fast. So I'm going to drag and drop my second sheet called my subcategory into my rows, sales into my columns again, same chart one more time. So far, nothing different. The sorting happens high to low, okay? So far, no difference at all. And I drag and drop my profit into my card called color. <coughs> so far, okay? This is my second chart. However, tables has the highest losses. First chart, tables fourth highest in terms of sales. Now, tables have the highest losses. Okay. A little small talk about the color. Okay. Let's rename the sheet, please. Call it sales and profit mix. Sales and profit mix. Okay. Sales and profit mix. Now, a small talk about colors. Okay. This color that we see here, this orange to blue diverging, is used at a specific case in point. Do you know when that is? It's used in a very specific instance, this orange to blue color diverging. This color scheme is used for a particular set of audience. Yep, exactly. This is a colorblind friendly palette, by the way. Okay. People who are colorblind, do you all know what colorblindness is? They are the ones who can't differentiate between basically reds and greens. They all look the same. Okay. There are different variants of colorblindness, by the way. Um, there are different gradients. For some of them who are colorblind, uh, we may not even know we're colorblind because for what is to be seen at a normal green color, see this looks like a green colored chair. A person who's colorblind might see it in a very light tinge of a green. Okay, while you may think you can see the green, what you're supposed to be seeing, you see it in a little lighter shade. So there are tests to prove that you're colorblind. That is one grade of a colorblindness where it's a, it's a least of a variance. There is another grade of colorblindness where suppose you have a red and a green. Suppose you have a, say this is a red and a green, assuming, okay? They both look the same. They look like, they both look yellow. If they have a yellowish tinge, that's another kind of a gradient, okay? There's one more. You have a red and a green, they look gray. That's like the worst case of colorblindness. You're completely, color, completely colorblind. You're, you see it like, a, like an animal. You can't even see it. Some people have that as well. Now, you guys are, now those people are not legally blind. They're just colorblind, okay? They just can't differentiate between these colors, especially red and green. There is also some stats that's worth knowing. Studies have shown that one in every 10 white men are colorblind. Okay, so if you have a chance to get to work for a white audience, be prepared to face colorblind people. Okay, so you know, in that case, this is a colorblind friendly palette. This works. Um, I have tried this personally with people who are colorblind. I've got friends who are colorblind. They have, I've showed this to them. I've used them as guinea pigs and it has worked for them. And this guy said, I, I, I said, hey, listen, let me now try red green. I played with them. I, I showed this and then they were like, hey, now this doesn't work, but this works for them. So this is a tried and tested. I have personally tried and tested so I can vouch for this color scheme that it works. Okay. So, um, you guys can try it if you have any friends as well. Okay. All right. But right now, let me assume that, uh, you're all fine. Um, you all can see colors. So I'm going to change this to a red green. Okay. Because I can see red greens and I want to see if you guys can, well, if you can, good. 
Okay, how to change colors? Pretty simple deal, guys. Click on your color card. Go to edit colors. Okay, now there is an option called palette, and there is an automatic palette. This is what gets chosen by default. Okay, now if you choose this drop down, all the different color schemes have been made available for us. Let's choose the red to green diverging color scheme, please. This is actually a very effective color if you can see the colors and click on OK right now. Look what happens. I mean, to me, this is wow. I mean, I can really see the loss and profits because culturally, I know red is bad. It makes a loss. To me, I can understand this better. But if you can't see the color, then that's a problem. So, so again, take a call in that sense. Okay, right now, let's keep it to this. If anyone here cannot see it, stick back with the old color. Okay, no issues. The choice is yours. I mean, it's sensitive. I mean, some people may not want to talk about it. It's sensitive, but yeah. So keep it there. Let's not. Uh, there's no need to bring that out. But uh, as long as you can spot the color, that matters. Okay, great. Step one complete. Step two complete, guys. Okay, now time for the third chart. That you're going to make your line chart. Okay, going back to your blueprint. Okay, I want to make the third chart. Okay, the blueprint, which is your uh, profit over time. I'm going to open up another sheet. Drag and drop your order date to your columns. Okay. I'm going to drag and drop profit into my rows shelf. I'll have a profit line for this is my profit trend line. Okay. Now, in my columns, where I have the year of order date, I'm going to right click on this. We spoke about how to make discrete continuous fields. I'm going to ask you to choose your continuous month field, your second month basically. Okay. Choose your second month for the overall data. I want to see how the overall trend looks like for all my four years in terms of profits. Okay, I'll put the trend line, but I want to save some time. So I'm going to do it later. Okay, now here's what I want to do. I want to bring in colors also into profits. Okay, so I'm going to drag and drop my profit into my color card as well. So I'll get the color scheme here. Okay, so I can see profits and losses. Wherever there's a the zero line indicates negatives and positives. Okay, now while we're here, just a small point to bring in here in the blueprint. See this chart that we have on the board right now is basically chart number three. Now this chart is going to be made to interact with this chart on top because I'm saying use this filter. This one factor. Okay, when I click on any of the bars, this will change values. These two values, and when that is happening, there is a challenge with colors. See colors right now. Okay, I mean if you see your color values. Okay, I'll show you a small thing now. Now, all of you, firstly do one thing. First things first. I'll, before we even talk about this, this uh, chart number two is being used on all the charts above. Okay, if you've changed to a red green, please talk consistently all red green. Okay, that is your first rule. Individually, charts might make sense, but when you kind of integrate them, one red green, one orange blue, one yellow gold will not fly well. So make them all into red green if you've decided. Okay. Now, so I'm going to first change this color to red green. Also, one more thing is, I'll show, so okay, let's first do that. Then we talk about the other issue. Go to your color card, edit colors, change it to red green. Don't click on OK yet. Okay, hold on for a minute. Hold on for a minute. Okay, change the color scheme. Now, the um, if you look at this color legend, guys. Okay, color legend here for a minute. Just keep your eyes on the screen for a minute. There's a little black line that kind of uh, hovers around the transparent color scheme. What's that value? Zero. Exactly. Now, here's what has got to happen. This little dot that you see there always needs to stay at a value of zero. Do you all agree with me on that? If this value becomes, say, for example, if this dot value instead of zero takes a value of say thousand dollars, what happens in that case? Anything become below thousand becomes a red. So you're we are showing five hundred dollars of profit as a loss. Okay. If this becomes a minus thousand, then anything more than a minus anything anything. So even even a five hundred dollars loss might be in green color. There's a good chance that can happen. Now this color schemes can has to be locked. Now especially when you have interactive views like you see charts three four five six seven and all that. Okay. All these charts below. All these are going to interact with a chart on top. In such a case, your color schemes, your center values will change positions unless you don't lock it. You got to lock it. Okay, very simple task. It's a very very simple task. Just go to your tab called Advanced, and the center value, this box, just tick it. If you check that box on, your center value will be locked at zero throughout. Okay, this is a very significant step. Click on OK. 
Okay. All right. Let's call the sheet as profit trend. Profit trend. Okay. I'll put the trend line. Before that, I'll first make the bar chart. Then I'll do it finally. I want to save some time. Okay. See for the bar chart. Now the next chart, chart number four. Okay, one, two, three, four. Is an exact same replica. Of this. Okay. So I want to save some time. Wherever I've done some work, I'll utilize this. I've got the correct aggregation. I've changed the center value. All that is done. Put the correct colors. So I want to benefit from that. So I'm going to right click on the profit trend chart sheet name. And there's an option to duplicate the sheet. It makes an exact same copy. Okay. Called profit trend two. Okay. Now in your uh, second sheet called profit trend two, I want you guys to go to your marks cards that says automatic. Okay. This line is automatic, but now change this into a mark called bar. This will become your bar chart. Okay, so we've got our uh, four chart as well. Okay, now let's rename the sheet. Call this profit values. It's called profit trend two right now. Call it profit values. So guys, just follow along. When I'm clicking, I'm going to make sure the pointer is right there. Okay, so look for my pointer. You'll be able to capture then and there. Okay, profit values. Okay, now let's put the trend line on the previous chart. Okay, that's important. Go back to your previous profit trend chart. Okay. And just do a right click anywhere inside your um, chart where there's white space, right click anywhere inside. You'll get an option called trend lines. Simply say show trend lines. So that's my profit trend. Okay. So for a line chart, I have a trend and the value as well. So we're done so far with step one, two, three, and four. Okay. Okay. So far. Okay. All good. Anyone lagging there? Anywhere stuck somewhere? Let me know real quick. Which part? Okay, just go to your profit. Go, just right click. Trend lines and say show trend lines. You'll get it. Okay, done. All good so far. Okay. Anyone still wants any help? I can. This is a pit stop. Okay, I'm going to carry on. Okay, good. Uh, let's make a state map now. Okay, states for profits. I'll show you another shortcut to make map charts. Simpler technique. Okay. Don't have to go to show me every time. We'll make it, we'll build from scratch this time. Okay. So I'm going to all get you all to double click on your field called state. Double click on it. The ones who got the US map earlier will get dots across all your maps. You guys are one step ahead of us. The ones who had the setting issue like me last time, first change your setting. First get the unknown, click, click, click on the unknowns. Okay. All of you click on edit locations. First, change your setting. You'll all get this dot map of the US. Okay. You all know how to fix this. Last time I fixed it in the previous dashboard. Okay. Now go to your uh, marks. That says automatic and change this into a map mark. Okay. So you'll get the atlas of the US. It'll have no data, but the atlas of the US will come in here for us now. Okay. It's time to bring in the profit into this particular chart. Where will you bring profits into? Exactly. Drag and drop your profits to your card called colors. Done. Okay. What is wrong with this? Exactly. First you change your color scheme. One more, one more thing to do. What's that? Center value. The same challenge we saw in the previous uh, charts that also has a problem. So quickly change the color scheme guys. Red green is one because color has to be consistent. And advanced, your center value should be locked at zero. Make sure you lock that. Okay, click on okay. You're done. So this is my real state of profits and losses across all the states in the US. Okay. I'd now like you to rename the sheet. Call it uh, profits across states, please. Don't leave it some sheet number. Call it profits across states. Please take time to name it. Okay. It really matters in the end. We'll make the city map also with a bit of a, we'll make the city map similarly. Okay. Open up another blank sheet. Another blank sheet. Same thing. City double click. You guys will have number of unknowns. I've gone to Salem because uh, you know why my issue is same spelling. 
Now I can see it much clearer. Okay, now all of you guys first rectify the settings. 530 unknowns or uh, 350 whatever, 353 unknowns. Please first get your settings rectified. Edit locations, you all know that. So when you have done all this, you guys will have a map of the US like as it has uh, chicken pox in it. Okay. So that's done. Okay. You, sh you should have this map at this point. Nothing else has been done. Simple atlas is it. Okay. I, I now want to get some, um, I want to pick your brain on something. No, no, don't change anything. Just keep this for now. Where do you bring profits now? I'm saying no. Okay. First tell me, first tell me why no size. It's not about difficult. It's not about difficult. It's again not about a lot of data points. There's another reason. I'll tell you something. Color is the right answer. But I'm saying why, why, okay, don't, why color and not size? So, you know what? In this case, I have a limitation. The metric has a limitation. So, I cannot use size for this limitation, for this metric. Had it been a sale or a quantity that has positive values, then size would have been better. But the fact that I only have a negative metric, I, I, I can have a negative to a positive metric. I'm pretty sure I have. I cannot use size. It has to go into color. I can draw profits to my color card. Okay. Okay, so I have this, uh, and in fact, even this looks very uh, superimposed on data points. Let's first fix it up. Okay, let's first fix it up. What is the what are what are the two fixes for this? Color and your center value. Okay, please do this simultaneously. All of you fix it up. And I want to ask you some. I want to get some opinion on this. Okay. Click on okay. Make sure you do these color and uh, center value. Click on okay. 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 I have a. I'd like to get some opinion. How many of you like this chart? How many don't like the chart? Okay. So you're okay with the chart, you like it? You didn't put your hand up, so I'm asking you, you like the chart? I didn't like it. You did like it? No. Did like it, okay, right, okay. Who likes it? I like it. I'm saying it's the best chart of all. It's a fantastic chart. Why, okay, why don't you like it? Let me ask you. <clears throat> why don't you like it? It's not readable, okay, hang on for a minute, okay, okay. Time, time, for a, time to put your thoughts on hold, okay? Why do you think it's not readable? Why? Why? Your profits are less every time. So exactly. Not... Exactly. Your profits are. No, no, no. Hang on, hang on. Uh, stick to his point. Don't, don't go for it. Don't uh, sway from his point. He had a point. So what? Mean so. And max values are quite far away. And and, and and okay, that is one and and. Profits are smaller. And so. So this is near to white color. So and so. Is kind of same. So yeah, keep going. Well. to narrow down the range. No, 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 no. First, first talk. Tell me why many of my points are always white. Exactly. Profits are small. Profits are having low values. This is profits. There's no sales. It's only profits. Profits are, okay. The fact that you can't see most of your dots, <clears throat> it just means it has very low or very high. What? Profits. So what does it mean? No, 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 no changing. First, first answer this question. So what does this mean? profit impact is no, no, no. So when many of your cities are almost invisible, it's because of low values. Doesn't that mean, doesn't that mean that, 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 that one second, one second. doesn't that mean, I'll, I'll, I'll come to your point. Doesn't that mean majority of your cities are just about break even? So does it a good thing or a bad thing for the business? It's not a great thing. Exactly. It's not a great, it's not a great situation to have. Now, in one second, I can change your colors. I can do all this. I can, I can do one color and all that. But if I kind of listen to your uh, suggestion, if I made this change, I would have completely lost this fantastic insight saying, I would this strong insight saying many cities are doing pretty bad. This is my true state of affairs. Okay. Now, just because you didn't like the chart, I can't be bothered, honestly. But I, I, I can't skew the data. Okay. I can't misrepresent it. It's not about you liking it. It's about what is efficient and what is right. If you, can't, if you can't see many of the cities, right, that's because many cities have not had a high profit or a loss, okay? And that's the reality. Let's face it, okay? It's not all about trying to show things visually. It is not appealing because there is no insight. In this case, there's a clear lack of insight. A clear lack of a pattern, which you could not see, is a pattern by itself. So I'd say don't change it. If you change it in a second, you're just going to show something that it's not. This is the reality. Many cities have not done well. Yeah, there are there are extremes. Why not? So there are extremes. Why can't other cities also be in extremes? Is my logic. Why can't they also be towards the green? So why is that? So again, some cities are dragging it away from the majority. Again, I, I kind of agree. But most of them are not doing great. This is my reality. So I want to keep it exactly the way it is and not change it because of somebody's likes and dislikes. So 
So you need to argue like this. This is what I'm trying to say. When you don't see a pattern, don't be in a hurry to quickly change it or modify it because you're, you may not be doing the right thing, is what I'm saying. Okay, that's my, that is my argument to this. So another thing is, Tell so, me. Uh, in the previous uh, chart, mm -hmm. it shows that the states are like very dark color and all that. Yeah. If we drill down, mm -hmm. actually the profit is not that much. Exactly. Exactly. It's not that much. Reality. That's a reality. Overall looks high. But then when you look at each points, the reality is it'll come and bite you. When you, if you, if you, if I, in a second, I can make them to reds and greens. I'll make them so dazzling, so popping out, but I would have taken this powerful insight. I would have painted, uh, I would have taken you from reality and made it something else. So don't do that. Don't, um, don't, don't take the focus on the reality. Okay. And uh, reading the sheet, call this profits across cities. Okay, that's also done. Okay, time for the next few charts and then let's kind of put them into a story. Okay, so we're done with step six. Okay, so far it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's go to step seven. We're going to make the scatter plot with the segment filter as well. Okay, so I'll show you how to make a filter too. Now, uh, two measures. You were saying discount, you brought the discount factor. Okay, let's say we'll make a chart. We decide scatter plot makes sense. Okay. You obviously know this because you are, I'm sure you've done this enough. Um, between profit and discount, which is your Y variable? Really? Discount drives profit or profit drives discount? Discount drives your profit. Okay, discount is impacting your profits, not the other way around. So you wanna see how much it is. So your X is your discount, your Y is your profit. Okay, so let's make sure when you create a chart in the Y axis, you always have your profit, okay? so. Drag and drop your profits into your rows. There you go. Profit fell into my y-axis. That is done. Drag and drop your uh, discount into your columns. This is my data. Okay. Why am I seeing this one dot? Mm -hmm. mm. It's doing a sum of all my points. Total sum of profits total sum of discounts, which is really, really stupid. Okay. And that's why I see 16,600%, which is ridiculous. I need to break this up into levels of detail, de uh, levels of detail into the lowest level of detail if possible. What's the best level of detail for a scatter plot? Ideally speaking, most ideal level of detail is what? what give me a, give me a, you're right. By, to every individual level, right? Every individual point. You want to see each point as is. That is the best way of seeing a scatter plot. Exactly. Or something to the level of row ID. Yes, you can do that. There are two ways to do this. You can either drag and drop your row ID to your card called detail. That will give you one option. The same thing. Okay, that is one thing. Or the other way to work this out is go to your card called analysis. Okay, go to your tab called analysis. Okay. And you guys can simply uncheck this aggregate measures. It will also remove all the aggregations. It will have data without summing effects of some of some of sales and some of discounts. Now check out your uh, number of marks, 9994 marks. When I first opened the Excel file, it had 9994, So 10,000 records, everything is back in place. Okay, great. Let's uh, drag and drop profit here to the color card as well. Okay, why not? It helps. And color center value, please fix it here as well. Red, green, diverging, advanced, center value to zero, and click on OK, done. Right. And uh, let's also b break this as per segments, okay? So let's see how that works. Let's put a trend line for the scatter plot, okay? Like how you did for the line chart, do a trend line here as well. Right click inside, anywhere. Okay. Trend line and show trend lines. It's not a great insight. Uh, it's actually a little, it's slightly insightful, but I don't know how it will change for tables. So I'm not too worried about this for now. Okay. Let's uh, also look at a segment filter for this for a minute. Okay. I'll drag and drop my segment to my filter box. Just click on all values. Click on all. I'll talk more about filters later, but right now let's set a filter. Okay. Tomorrow I have an example to set filters that time I'll give you a little talk on that. Click on okay for now. Your filter called segment is set inside your filter box. Okay. And we'll analyze this as per each segment. Again, right now it's overall data. I'm more concerned about tables, tables versus segments. Okay. 
So we'll think about this right now. As long as you set the filter, you're good to go at this point in time. Okay. If you want to analyze it right here itself, you can do so. Okay. For that, you just well, you know, right click on the segment on the filter and say that show filter. You can get the filter right here itself. Okay. But you can now basically make a click here of one of the others. Okay. You can choose one of the two, and then you can see how this works. Okay. I would say uh, break this into a different option. Okay. Instead of having multiple select options, uh, slightly better is let's see one segment at a time. Okay, like a single select option, then multi select options because it'll make it'll do all or multi, all one select. Okay, so click on the drop down. Okay, you'll find a little drop down on your screens. Okay, and in that you can basically do a single value list like radio buttons. Okay, so let's look at that instead. Yeah, that's probably better for me. I kind of keep this for now. For now, keep all values. Don't miss it. Right now, keep all the values. Then the next screen, it'll have a different value. Okay, so right now, just keep all values. So I think we're good to go for now. We can uh, start to arrange them into a story and dashboard and see what the actual answers coming out. Okay. Now let's um, rename the sheet as well, please. Call this uh, profits versus discounts. And I think we've built all our basic building blocks. We are done until uh, step number eight, seven and eight. Okay. Seven, step seven, step eight is done. Okay, we're done till here. Now it's time to do the ninth step that is build the third comprehensive view, build this dashboard, okay? And then the storyboard comes in place. So we'll add the filters later. I'll show you how to bring it. Right now, first add the filter for now, drag and drop it, and in the dashboard, I'll bring it eventually. Okay. Now open up your First dashboard, please, for the story. What's the first thing for a dashboard? You do? Yep, make your size. Let's say automatic works for now, okay? So for now, let's set the orientation right. Your uh, default size, make this into a fixed size, into an automatic size. What we did before, same thing. Let's keep that setting for now, okay? And uh, let's bring in the, uh, the first dashboard. So I drag and drop uh, sales mix, no sales and profit mix. I get the profit trend below. And I get the profit values on the side here. Okay, this is my layout. And I just noticed a real quick flaw. I'm not gonna fix it up. Now first things first, I'm saying this legend is really not helping. I've consistently said that red is bad, green is good. Okay, and I've centered my value to zero, so that will never change. So in my opinion, this color legend is really not a big deal breaker. I'm just gonna take it out, because I'm not really like gonna add great benefit. I'll rather keep more space for my charts. Okay, data ink emphasis is higher now. Okay, I noticed also another small problem here. Okay, and just watch here for a minute. See this chart on top? This bar chart on top. I know we spoke about a little rule saying labels are better and all this. You know, we kind of did a swapping. Bar charts are better when kept top to bottom. Now check this out. If I keep this oriented like this, I have a scroll. And if I need to make the scroll all right, I need to push it all the way down here. And now I've shrunk these two charts to such an extent that it's really not going to give me a great value. I'm not happy with this orientation. So you know what? Sometimes bend rules a little bit. Okay. I'm, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to push it all the way up here and I'm going to make more space for this. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that I click on the sales profit mix chart. Okay. And I'm going to swap them and I don't mind compromising the labels. I don't care because I'm more concerned about these two charts below. So wherever you want to compromise something, decide what takes more dominance. Okay. Use common sense and uh, really work it out. It's okay to compromise some things at the cost of getting something better. Now, I want to make sure that this is the layout throughout. So I've decided that if I take the orientation messed up in one, I'll mess it up in everything. Okay, there is no change into this. This is a conscious call I've taken now. So in my storyboard, okay, I want to make sure it's nice and easy. I just do drags and drops and I run on. Okay, so I'm going to do something. I go to my sales mix chart first and I first flip it. I do a flipping here. Okay, flip it right here save some time. So later we don't have to worry about this orientation. Okay. Now also do one more thing, guys, this tab called standard, 
you notice that it's not fully utilized all the space. Okay, this little extra white space can also be utilized. So make this into an entire view. It will occupy the full space for this. It will save us time in the end. Same thing for your sales and profit mix. If you click it, the orientation has already happened because there you swap, but the full space is not utilized. Okay, so just make sure that you also choose entire view for this. So both the charts are properly justified. Okay, there. This is my little deal. Now, let me go back to my dashboard. Much better. Okay. And yeah, just one thing. I want to make sure that this also says entire view. So I'm just going to fix it up. Okay. And okay. Like I said, let's not forget the theme of my story is still tables. Okay. I'm not budging from that. I'm going to set the user's filter only for this chart. This is done white in color. And now let me click on tables and see what's the story for tables. Okay, so set this user's filter and click on tables. Let's see what the story is. So we're now ready with the third slide. Okay, now someone interpret this for me. What does the line tell you? What's the, what's the trend line telling you? So the more you're selling, the more you're losing. What about the bar chart? What does the bar tell you? Where's your highest loss? Which year has the highest loss? Last year? The last year especially has been dismal. Okay, so there. I just got my insight. I'll say the more you sell tables, the great, the more, uh, uh, more you sell, the more you lose. Uh, I'll say the last year, which is 2018, has been absolutely dismal. This is my insight there. I've got my insight for my third view as well. Let's uh, rename this dashboard and call this profits over time which is your geospatial. Okay. First things first, what? Your size becomes? Size becomes automatic. You all know that? Yeah? Okay. Let's orient it now. Sale profit mix on top. Your state map below and your city map to the side there. And let's enable this user's filter. Only for this chart on top, let's click on tables. Let's see how states and cities are performing for tables. This is the reality for uh, the item called tables alone. W what are we seeing here? What is this telling you? Yeah, exactly. You are now finding a silver lining in the dark cloud, basically. That's what she's doing. So Washington seems to make a pretty decent profit. Which city in Washington, by the way? 4,000. So that's a decent sized profit, right? I mean, amongst, and, and if you look at, I mean, see right now, if you see, if you're a cup half empty kind of a guy, then you look at the reds and harp on that. But if you want to highlight its opportunities as well, why not? See, so far table is not looking very promising between you and I, very high in sales, but low in profit. So I'm already kind of disappointed. And when I see a trend that's going bad every year, I'm doing worse and worse. But when I look at a quick mix, I find some amount of greens. It's not all red. Okay, had it been all red, then that would have been a cause of concern. But I find some amount of greens as well. So clearly something good has happened as well too. So why not we highlight that? So Washington and Seattle is my... Yeah, you have something else? Then uh, New York and... Uh, New York is a... Uh, yeah, New, is a yeah, New York is... A, yeah, and these two I think is... Which, which, which is this? Which one is this? Yeah. Illinois, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so and, and there's another... I think that's... Uh, What's that? What's that city? North Carolina. Yeah, you know what? Mention two good states. Look at, I'll say, look at um, the state of Washington and North Carolina. They are good performers. Okay, so I'm going to kind of highlight these two. Okay, Virginia, Virginia, Virginia. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Okay, all right. Call this geo spatial geo analysis. Sales profit mix on top, and I get the discount chart below. Okay. That's also done. Okay, great. Okay. And let's say users filter. I take the legend out. I'm not going to waste this legend. And this filter, I'm going to make it into a floating filter because I don't want to waste so much space for the filter. Like what I did for the first dashboard, you remember that uh, date legend, I floated it. I'll float this filter as well. You'll find an option to float. Scroll below, there it is, floating. Okay, and let's just bring it down to the bar chart, which has the actual reason for the, which actually works for this, okay. 
let's not forget okay now make sure that this is used as filter okay let's not enable this filter let's click on tables and let's first see what the deal for table is okay before we start any segments what is this telling you what's telling you Which is what uh, discount? What discount is that? This is not recent. It's this is not time, huh? Zero discount. You made um, you made you have you had zero percent discount, and there your uh, transactions have made profits. Exactly. So so discount discount in my opinion discount for tables is a problem. I'm saying um, do not sell tables with discounts. Okay. Now let's also look at as per segments. Let's look at each segment. See, there's any better difference. Consumer, no deal. Um, let's look at corporate home office. Okay, there it is. So, I mean, nothing much is coming out of my. Uh, I mean, if you look at each of that, consumer is the least uh, impacted. But if you look at your corporate and home office, they're very, very impacted, badly impacted. If you check this out, okay. So, I'm going to leave this as my insight and say, um, and say uh, tables. So, again, again, the segment didn't give me a great insight. So I'm not going to take it out. I'm going to leave it there. I mean, if they want to use it, let them use it. But all I'm going to say is discount impacts profits heavily for tables. So stop all discounts. That's my summarization. Okay. I'll call this dashboard as profits. Make sure that you name the sheet and the dashboard differently. Okay. Otherwise you'll have a, have a problem. That's why I call this versus and I call this and have some, at least one, Word of a difference. It'll throw back some error. It won't let you name it. Okay. Okay. Time to put this into a storyboard. All the basic building blocks have been done. We'll quickly arrange them into a slider, type in our captions, and we're done in another five minutes. Okay. Let's build a storyboard. Now to build this. So, okay. Uh, reality check. One more pitch stop. Is everybody here on the same page? Okay. We're now going to build a story and type captions. Okay. So, all right. Good. So to build a story, guys. Okay. The third, last, th the last thumbnail. After your dashboard, the one with the book symbol and a plus symbol, right? That's a story container. Hit that. It'll give you something like this. Okay. You'll see there's a place to add caption as well. We'll do that. Same rules apply for a dashboard as this as well. Container size to become automatic. So again, you see there's an option called size for your story. Just make sure that you hit this option and you first change this from a fixed size into an automatic size. Okay. So first change the size becomes all right. Okay, and let's sort of bring in one step at a time. Time to get your sales mix chart to drag a sheet here. Okay, sales mix chart. And let's click on this add a caption and type in our notes. I'm gonna say tables, fourth highest in terms of sales. Okay. And I'm just going to keep it clicked. Doesn't matter. So it's just a small thing. I'm going to keep it clicked like this. Okay. Now let's get in our next uh, part of our story. Like you're adding more sheets to your PPT. You see this option called blank, new story point, blank button. Give it a click. It's going to open up another page, by the way. And here we drag and drop sales and profit mix. Okay. Blank. Okay. And drag and drop sales and profit mix. Now let's add a caption. I'm going to say, however, tables have the highest loss. Okay. Tables have the highest loss. My second chart is also done. So as you notice, I'm actually following the blueprint. Okay. I'm just following the blueprint, nothing else. My planning work is done. So I'm done view one, view two. I'll still get my last three views and I'll type my captions and that's my plan. So that's the blueprint. Okay. One more blank point. And this time bring in the profits over time dashboard itself. Okay. And let's add a caption and say, uh, more you sell, more you lose. Loose spelling is right? No. 
No, the thing is, the more you sell, the more you lose, right? This, the trend is saying this. So the more, so more over time, the more you're selling, the more you lose. So that's what I hint by that. Or I say, uh, losses increase over time. No, no, here it is. In fact, no, the, the, as you're selling, I'm saying as you're selling because of time or, or let's rephrase it. Let's say, uh, losses, are, losses, losses have increased over time. Losses have gone up over time. Okay. Let's rephrase that. Okay. So. Fair enough. Loss has increased over time. Okay, that makes sense. I want to say 2018, the worst. Okay, I'll look at yours. Just by, keep that pending, I'll, I'll fix yours. I don't know what your issue is, but maybe you've done some back and drop mistake. I'll come there. You make the next year, then I'll, I'll fix yours. Okay, we'll uh, talk about this. So, um, okay. Let's get the next view, uh, which is your geospatial analysis. Get your geo analysis. Okay. And let's add a caption saying uh, state of WA and Virginia. Good examples. Oh, I'd say way, the way forward. The way forward. So that's my takeaway here. Okay. So say, look at these two states way forward. See, it's a high selling. Why do you want to scrap it? It's easy to say stop selling, but when it's high, high sales, why do you want to lose on your customer base? That's my logic. Selling is not easy as well. Okay. But yeah, put some conditions. So you at least make a profit. Okay. One last blank point. Profits and discounts. So I'm going to say very tables. Sensitive, very sensitive to discounts. Stop any discounting. Okay, that's it. Stop any discounting. And with that, that's my storyboard. Okay. So yeah, back to my presentation mode. Go back to my view in there. There it is. We're done. Tables, fourth highest in terms of sales. However, tables have the highest losses. Then talks about your time wise story. Okay. So the good thing is now while, see again, I reason why I brought this deliberate layout is or this deliberate interactivity is I have still maintained interactivity. If you think about it, I mean, I am not, uh, it's not a PPD. It is definitely a compelling story because I'll tell you why. The theme of my story is tables. Okay. And it's profitability while my audience have this as a default view, nothing really stops my user from saying, okay, you know what tables, that's a deal. Let's see what's a deal for say phones and they can click on other items and still take their own insights. So nothing really stops them from choosing any other things other than tables as well. So that's like really where I kind of sort of keep this option open. Same thing for my, um, geospatial mapping while people look at tables, they can still look at bookcases or copiers and say, Hey, that's the case for copiers and so on and so forth. Same thing for any of my discount items. They can click any variables. So I'll say, I'll say, keep the option open for audiences. Let them be able to explore multiple options at the cost of a story. You're going to make this into a much more enriching experience. That's something that I would do for a storyboard typically. Default, how many default charts do we have in total? What are the charts that are there by default? How many default charts do we have? No? 24. It's an open book question. Click on show me, you'll get the answers. Okay. Eight times three, 24 charts. Those are default charts you can create, but you can make a lot more than that. Many more than that. It's not just uh, default. It's not those. That's what I meant by default. So, uh, basically you can create many more custom charts. Um, like say your, have you all heard of, uh, Pareto charts? Waterfall charts, waterfall charts, uh, control charts, bump charts. Do you know what a bump chart is? Uh, funnels, say a funnel charts. Um, then we can create something, uh, uh, word clouds. I'm sure you must've heard of word clouds. You know, we can create all these custom, uh, fishbone as, as well. You can make one, but, uh, yeah. And then uh, candlestick charts, mastic charts, you know, Bollinger bands, all these are custom made charts. You can pretty much create these as well. Okay. So we'll do some today. We'll create some of these special charts. Fishbone as well. I need to, I can construct a fishbone. Um, 
that involves more a graphical part than a chart creation process. But it's much, it's doable. We can pretty much create anything. So we'll practice that today as well, okay? And with that, we'll be able to wrap up today's session. That'll be fair content for the whole day, okay? All right, so uh, what I want you all to do, so you all should have downloaded your um, self-help guides. If you open, again, I told you yesterday that uh, I have made some, um, I've got my own material, which I made many years back and all that stuff in here. So this is like a folder that will have a lot of subfolders. If you can just open this folder for a minute, okay? Um, you'll find a whole lot of uh, subfolders in here, okay? Which I'll kind of walk you folks through, okay? So typically what it does is all your major topics that we're going to be looking at, all your hands-on material that we're going to look at is all right in here. This is like a one shop guide for you, one stop guide for you. Now say for example, today we're going to talk about how to create some Pareto charts and all that, okay, at some point in time. Now, um, say you guys want to recreate it, okay? And if you want to look at some kind of a material and not your recording, you guys can still look at these files and photos as well. I'll say explore them, okay? Go through them so you know what is in here. Now, say for a minute, if you want to, uh, say, create a Pareto chart, I've kind of put them under a folder called uh, special chart type, okay? And all you have to do is, well, just go right in there. You'll find some PDF files and some which contains your guides. And there's also some may have, also have Excel files, a combination of all this. <laughs> if you want your guide, open up your PDF files, okay? That will contain your instructions on step-by-step -step instructions on what to do, uh, where to drag and drop, you know, just to, if you want to put it to, and I, I did them about uh, five, six years back, many long time back, I did it for somebody. So uh, I made them in the older version of Tableau, but it's still very relevant. So if you follow all these steps, and if you kind of pretty much work all this through, you guys should be able to recreate most of the content back here. So this is another extra uh, resource for you all, okay? But if you guys want to take your notes, please do that. That's again your choice, okay? This is something that I have made. Uh, it may not completely meet your requirement. So take your notes if required as well, okay? So <clears throat> anyways, this is the folder I'm, I'm re I was referring to. Let me uh, just open up, okay? Now, um, in this folder, okay? In this in this file, in, the, in this uh, main folder, you'll find another uh, subfolder called calculations, okay? So what I want you guys to do is in your calculations folder, you'll find something called as numeric calculations. Okay. So I want you all to import this file into Tableau. So open up your Tableau consoles. Please import this numeric calculation into it. Okay. Or if you do that, who in the yesterday, just look at your neighbors and just get connected. Okay. I know some of you may are seeing for the first time yesterday, you, you kind of lost a four hour content. If you are not familiar with it, just look at your neighbors or just, um, you guys need to slightly catch up with us. Okay because you might find things a little fast and that's something you'll have to kind of deal with, okay? I'll talk about that. So I'll talk about all that, don't worry, okay? So, numeric calculation, okay? I want you to import this file. Is anyone having trouble importing this? Anyone having issues importing this? Okay? <coughs> yeah, just give a hand, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay? So guys, if you notice here one thing, um, there is a difference between this uh, data set and the uh, sample superstore where we connected yesterday. Yesterday, if you remember, uh, when you import that sample superstore data set for the first time, um, this data preview was not available here, if you remember. Do you, why is this here? Why is this happening like this? This time you're getting the preview? So it's only one sheet. There's only one sheet, exactly. Yesterday, there were three sheets called orders and peoples and return. So you had to do a manual step of dragging and dropping here, right? Again, it doesn't matter whether you drag and drop or not. If you see the data that you want to analyze is here, you're good to go. That's your task, okay? So as you keep importing more and more files, if there are more sheets, if you find that you need to drag and drop them, make sure that you get something in this part of your console so you guys can see the data that we need for our analysis, okay? And let's go to sheet one. It'll take us right in there, okay? All right. Let's make a small bar chart first to start with, okay? Uh, this is some small dummy data that I made up, okay, for uh, just to kind of demonstrate some learnings and from there we'll uh, kind of take it from there. I plan on doing multiple things, okay. Uh, first of all, get you started with calculations. Give you how, show you how, get, get a special chart, learn how to interpret it and also how we can tweak it and manipulate it and all that for our requirement, okay. So that's like multiple small, small learnings and there's one little activity, okay. So, I'm going to drag and drop my dimension called uh, state, okay, into my field called rows. Okay. It's all dummy data. I made this up, so don't worry about the actual validity of numbers, okay. And you, amongst your measures called targets, I want you guys to simply drag and drop these targets into your columns shelf, please. Okay. Sort the data from high to low. Give it a descending order sort, okay. And let's also show the labels, okay. 
and uh, you know what i'll put this on a entire view so we can see all the bars nice and clean and here it is this is my data okay this is my my data actually here right so uh, we all see three null values yeah all of us okay so let's first handle that let's first kind of figure this out why do we normally get null values in data what is the, what are some causes for null values what are root causes for null values missing data is one okay if data is missing then you will be able to get the data and you can import the data you can type it in manually refresh it it will get rectified that is a data quality issue okay that's one cause what else what are some other reasons for null values no data available for that particular record yeah fair enough okay so um, which means um, you may either keep it as a null value or you may also treat it as a number of zero that's another option right so um, especially if it's a number okay now there are null values in two options okay you can have null values either in the dimension or you can have a null value in the measure they both possible if a null value is a dimension that means there is no entry okay i've had multiple records say i've got i've got 100 records suppose i have not forgot in if i've not inputted a dimension value in one of my records i have not put in the name of the person and i just got his score alone that's again a data quality issue those things you have to fix it yourself data has to be clean if it's garbage and garbage out you can't do anything about it okay that you have to clean but with the numbers part i'll be a little more careful okay uh, because especially when i'm having numbers and there are null values in it especially there's some sort of a mathematical calculation involved with the number this could be a problem why 1 plus 0 or say any number plus 0 equals that number okay 100 plus 0 equals 100 okay anything plus that number equals that number but if i say 100 plus null my answer comes out as null if i i do a million plus null it comes out as null if i do 500 point 500 plus null plus 25000 plus 5 plus 800 plus null becomes null there's one null the whole thing becomes a null that's a problem right you want to be able to ensure that those values are getting picked up as zeros instead so you can kind of use that for your analysis you don't lose any data in the process so that's something we've got to be uh, conscious about okay um so one time what happened i mean i i had this uh, real time problem okay uh, we were making a dashboard for one of our uh, clients which had like al almost about uh, 45 different data sources each of them they were all completely heterogeneous each of them were very very different sources it was to build one big dashboard for a client of us so there was uh, some people who were giving us uh, <clears throat> data from sap some of them from sql some of them from uh, uh, access database <clears throat> some even manual excel files uh, there were pdf tables uh, uh, sharepoint multiple sources we were getting data we had to pull in reports from a lot of areas and get to create a final dashboard okay now for the sake of our convenience um, we had to kind of come with an automation process because we could not follow and there were 40 people okay and every month on the third of every month i had to give this report to the ceo of the company so um, i could not i it was impossible for me to follow up with 40 different people there was no process it was very very manual first month we managed to send emails 40 emails and it became a bit of a pain for us so we said hey this is not our job to follow up for the emails if they don't send they don't send it i can't break my head over it right i am sitting in this country i'm saying somewhere else those guys need to be proactive they have not give the data they should answer the ceo and i can't keep answering for their uh, shock so i kind of put a system in place uh, we kind of uh, spoke to their in house team uh and we also had to kind of join the data some blending was required some had to be blended some had to be kept the way it is a lot of complications were there in that we came with a solution we said you know what uh, optimum solution is we'll create oracle tables we point all the data wherever it has to be blended into oracle tables so doesn't matter whichever platform is coming from you 40 people can send from wherever you can update whenever whatever i don't care but i'm going to ensure that don't change the location if your file is sitting on the c drive g drive whatever it is keep the file in the same place i'll ensure that i create a oracle a link between yours file to the oracle tables and you guys just have to keep refreshing data okay do that at some point in time and every month uh, data keeps coming in we'll hit a refresh button your my, all my data is going to come into oracle tables i'm going to point the oracle table to my workbook this was a plan really okay that's how we kind of constructed the whole process now while this was a great plan it worked very well and all that we realized that uh, <coughs> when you do a conversion from sap into oracle tables okay if there are numbers any numbers having zeros those zeros ended up getting converted into null values that happened 
and we were not able to control this. We didn't know what happened and we didn't expect this uh, thing to come up there for us now. Now this posed a problem because the company that I was working for was basically uh, dealing with uh, uh, power production plants. Okay, they have uh, different uh, uh, thermal plants, nuclear plants, uh, they do power generation basically. Okay, so for them one of the key metrics is to, cost, is to maintain costs. They have like uh, monthly expenditures, they have different line items, they have this item is to say spend for a turbine, this is for the fuel, this is for that part, and that's for our screws, you know, the different, different part things in there. Now they had budgets for everything, they had budgets for every kind of expenditure. Now there are certain uh, maintenance work that they would normally engage in for the power plants. They were uh, periodic, not regular, okay. Say for the month of Jan if they did the maintenance, for the month of Feb they didn't have to do some maintenance. So they had that kind of an approach. As a result, what happened was, and I had to, but I had tracked the entire payment, all the, all the, all the expenditures that they had, okay. So for the month of Jan, if they had spent $100,000, for the Feb, month of Feb, there was nothing. March, there was another $100,000. So there was transactions like these. It so happened that when I converted this data from Oracle, from SAP into Oracle tables, that 100,000 plus null plus another 100,000 plus null gave me a value of null. So I was not able to get the correct records. I was able, I lost the values in there, okay. So okay, we kind of figured how to really work this out. It was a pain point to solve this in Oracle tables. We rather figured Tableau could have done this in a much more simpler manner. So we kind of came with a very simple solution. All we did was why we have this, now, now think about this. After getting all that story that I've got here, I've got these null values. All I have to do is create a calculation, a very simple calculation, wherein I can say, hey, listen, if you find any legitimate number like these, keep them the way it is. But if we find any values having null values, convert them alone into zeros for me. That's the only logic that I had to pass. And there were some functions we could really, and, and I'll show you, it's really a very simple calculation. A very simple solution for a very difficult, complex problem like this happened. So trying to, you know, you know, the reason why I'm pointing this out is sometimes when you want to automate problems, okay, when you want to automate any problems or you want to kind of, one is to get some data that you don't have. You want to create a new field which is not available. Yes, a calculation is, is a great way. Sometimes even solving some problems to automate some kind of solutions, calculations can be the way to go. So it's good to kind of get comfortable working on calculations on different platforms, you know. Again, there is no hard and fast tool that you guys have to do the calculations only in a software that you're working on, okay. I'll say be smart about it. Whichever platform is convenient, it's lesser workload, wherever it's easy for you, um, kind of work that out and work smart. That's all I would tell you. In this particular case, in this situation that I told you, doing this math in Tableau was a lot more simpler. It was just one simple calculation, okay? Now, here I've got a field called targets. I'm gonna make a new field called corrected targets, which wherein it's gonna make sure that all these states, the same number, last three states alone gives me a number of value of zero, okay? We'll work this out now. So, we're gonna achieve this with the help of a calculation, okay? now. To create a calculated field inside Tableau, there are multiple ways to work it out. There's no one way or one right way. Whatever makes sense, whatever is easy for you that you can remember, work with that, okay? Now, in your meshes and dimensions, when you guys find any white space like this, and you do a right click, you'll find an option called create a calculated field, okay? Same thing, you click at your dimensions, you do a right click, you'll find your create a calculated field. Same thing in two places, okay? now. A third spot to find the exact same menu is if you actually look at your shelf, you know this word called dimension, against it there are three buttons, okay, one called view data, a second one with a search or a find field, third with an arrow that drops down. Click the arrow that drops down, that's the same thing, okay. That also gives you the calculation option. Third place. We look at a fourth place as well, one more place that I'm aware of, okay. If you go into a tab called analysis in your menus. Okay, your fourth last field says create a calculated field. Same thing. All the four places, they'll give you the same thing. So whichever you guys can remember, whatever you can work with, pick one of them. Okay, it'll open up a box like this. Okay, now, when you guys are going to create calculations in Tableau, you guys are going to be creating hypothetical fields. Okay, so why I mean, what I mean by that is, it's not a regular variable, it's a hypothetical variable. In the sense, uh, now I'm going to create a field called corrected targets, okay? I have targets. This contains null values. I want to be able to convert this with the nulls into zeros, okay? Now I'm going to get a new field here called corrected targets here, okay? It's like this, when you're going to create any kind of calculation, 
what happens is it's like saying column A plus column B equals column C. Same deal. You're going to have a new column. Your resulting variable can either be a dimension or a measure. If you have a string calculation, it will go into a dimension. If you have a number calculation meant for arithmetic math, it will come into your measures. Okay? You can also create um, number fields which are dimensions. Suppose I want to create categories are called 1, 2 and 3. They are numbers but they can be dimensions. Possible. I create an index, for example. That is a dimension. It will be a numeric field but it will be a dimension. Same logic. What we discussed yesterday first, the first thing, first step, same deal. Okay? We can then tell the tool whether it is a dimension or a measure, we can handle that accordingly. Okay, so output will come boolean, true, false will also come out. All these different options are possible. Okay, date fields, anything, geospatial, any variable is possible, string and all that. Now, calling this hypothetical field because when you are going to create a field, let's say instead of targets, I make one called corrected targets. Okay, this corrected target field will only stay inside this particular console. It does not by any chance interfere with back with your raw data. Now there's an Excel file which has just three fields, state, sales and targets. If you create a field here, you won't find your correct targets back in your Excel field. It will stay only inside this window. Hence I'm calling it a hypothetical field. Okay. And great for automation, solves multiple issues and all that of those sorts. Okay. Now let's see how to figure formulas, functions, syntaxes and all that and then we take on further. Okay. Always get into your habit of naming calculations guys okay I'm going to call this as corrected targets okay corrected targets okay and uh, in my corrected targets okay if you um, check this out in here okay if you check this out in here in the box in here this is the spot where you guys are going to be actually creating a calculation right here same spot okay now um, where do I find my functions Check this out. In the uh, box that I'm kind of clicking on right now, you see a small gray arrow that points to your right side. If you give that a click, you'll find your function library. Okay? All the functions that you need to be looking at is pretty much right in here. You'll find a lot of similarities to that of Excel. Okay? There are some things that this can do better than Excel. Some Excel can do better than here. Okay? Um, it, can, it can create all kinds of calculations as long as they're not statistical. Okay? If you need to perform statistical calculations, you then have to integrate an element like an R or a Python and then you can pass some calculations and commands, which we'll do the last day. We can also do that. Okay, but by, na by natively speaking, it does not have any stats functions to it. Okay. All right. Now, um, let's say for a minute, I want to kind of create a calculation which converts one null values into zeros. Okay. So, if you think about this, this is some kind of a logical function I've got to pass in here because it's going to take a number. If the number is not a null value, it keeps the number as it is. But if it finds a number to be zero, then it converts it into a null. If it finds it to be a null, then it converts that into a zero. So it's a logic. It's some kind of a logic. Yes, no logic. Okay. So I'm going to look at my logical functions to save some time in here. Okay. There it is. So all my different logical functions. Now, um, if in here, there are multiple functions I can use. Okay. Uh, there's, no, it's, there's no one right way. You have your um, if null, you got your is null. You also have something called as Zn, the last one. Okay. It stands for zero null. That's the function. That's what it's really called for. Okay. And the moment you give it a click, you'll find the syntax that needs to be used in here. And you guys will also find notes about what the function is meant to do. So read this. If you're seeing it for the first time, read these notes, look at the syntaxes and benefit from this. It kind of really helps you to get your syntaxes right. Okay. So here it's a very simple function. It's a very easy function. Zn within brackets, your expression. What's your expression here? Yeah, exactly. It's your targets. Okay. So let's get in your function. Let's type in Z in, open your parentheses. Okay. And input your targets. Now, now when you guys want to bring in variables into your functions, okay, there are two ways to do this. You can either do a type in like I did. Okay. Like if you, if that's, that's your comfort factor, you may do a type in. Okay. Or the other option that you guys can also do is you can also do a drag and drop. Whatever is your comfort factor, do that. Stick with your comfort factor. Okay. And yeah, I've got to close my brackets and with that, my function will be complete. Now, um, a, a simple example, okay, just so I can kind of take it easy. This is a very easy, simple example. I close your brackets, it will come right, syntax will be right, okay. But obviously when you guys make syntax errors, the tool is not going to let you proceed further. It's going to throw back an error like this. It says it has some errors in there, okay. Now, if you don't know what your error is, which I, I'm pretty sure can happen as you start to do more complex calculations, you will not know what has gone wrong. Try doing your nested if statement. 
which is going to be really, really long, like say 10 or 15 levels long, you're bound to miss some syntax, okay? Now, if you guys get your errors and how do you want to fix your syntaxes? Well, I've got a couple of tips to really work it out, okay? One is look for these jagged lines in here. That is a indicator, first of all. That's one way to know what your issue is. Your uh, second way to fix it up is click on the error itself. It'll tell you what the actual error message is, okay? And um, one more little help is, you know, if you still can't find out, click right on the error itself. It will try and, in many cases, highlight the actual part where the error is, okay? This is the maximum level of spoon feeding that you guys will get from the tool, okay? Be honest, God bless you, okay? Okay, now close your brackets and let's close your, and, 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 and hit, okay, yeah, and we get, we're done with this. If you guys want to type notes, okay, suppose you want to create a calculation, you want to put in notes in your calculation, that's also doable, okay? Just put in a couple of slashes in here, okay? And you can type in any notes in here, it will not interfere with your function as well, okay? So these are some tips that will sort of help you to work this out, okay? Done. Click on OK now, we're good to go. And that's your measure called corrected targets, okay? Let's now test it. Drag and drop your corrected targets in your columns as well. And if I check this out, there it is. I've got my corrected targets on the side here. So these are my original targets, same numbers, okay? And here, I've got my null values converted to zeros. So I'm kind of okay with this field. So now for all future purposes, I'm gonna ignore my targets and I'll just take my corrected targets. End of story, okay? Every time, this data is gonna keep coming in, even if it's a real-time database, it's a live da dashboard, this will keep coming in, but I'll ignore this and use this variable for all my purposes. That's it. Okay. You must have picked up the same va va value. Corrected targets. Take your corrected targets, the new field. Yeah, that's because of spacing issue. Doesn't matter. Same thing happened to me as well. Okay, so when you check this out, you might have issues like these. There, do you, do you have this, something like this? Do you have some zeros missing? Put them on a full screen. Put them on a full screen, it'll come. It'll be there. Put them on the presentation board, it'll come. So what can happen is, um, check this out. I mean, if you, if, you, if you look at my screen for a minute, okay, check this out. It will come, it will come. Sometimes this is gonna keep happening. You guys are gonna find some differences in your screen versus mine. All of our pixel settings are not the same, okay? So guys, guys, I'm telling this once and for all, so we'll not ever have this problem, okay? If our views look a little different from mine, some labels are missing in yours, some are looking different, this, your scale looks different, that is gonna keep happening. Yesterday somebody had some hundreds and thousands scales, mine had some hundreds, that is gonna keep happening. If your settings are different, your pixel size is different, then it is not gonna match, okay? Now if you notice in here, my screen, I don't know if you guys have the same issue, my second state is missing values. Label is missing in my second state. And if you look at my last state GH, the zero number is missing. It is not because of a problem, it's not because of any missing values. It just means that the, the tool has been designed in such a way that in case, while it puts labels, if the labels font sizes are too big and the tool detects that there is some sort of overlap on the labels from one label to the other, it hides one. So right now, the tool is being told that for IO, the label, if it does print, it might overlap on one of these labels. So it hides one, that's a deal. This is gonna keep happening constantly. So again, if I put this on a full screen mode, you get all, when there is more space, all the labels are here, okay? Data has not gone missing. No data is missing, but this is gonna keep happening constantly. So don't worry about that. Your spacing is different, your size is different. Your, your, your font size is way too big, that's the point. You've you got to make your, you've got to change your, con, your font size a little bit. That's your, that's your thing, okay? So that's the way it's going to keep working. So it doesn't matter, so you, so I, I can tell you from, at this very minute, from now till day four, you're going to have complete different views. Lots of views are going to differ from my screen because your, I can definitely say that your font is different, okay? Your size is different, or it's, that, that's fine. You don't need to worry about it, it's not a deal breaker. It's going to be a little different, okay? All right, time to now make a sensible chart out of this. The reason why I got you to do this was to make some charts out of this now. Open up a new sheet, guys. I want you guys to now create a chart, okay? Wherein I'd like to compare the targets for every single state. I have sales amounts. I've got the targets corrected. I have states. So for all my states, I want to see if I met my targets or not, okay? And I want to create a chart out of this. And I want to kind of understand 
how it goes where and how I can make this more effective, visually appealing to kind of get some answers. Okay, so this is a default chart. Luckily, it's not a, a custom chart. You guys can build it by just doing show me. So let's kind of work this out. Okay, what I want you guys to do is click on three fields. Guys, please look here. Okay, if you're doing something else, please drop what you're doing. Okay, and follow along. I want you folks to select your variable called state. Hold on to your control keys on your keyboard, select your corrected targets and select your sales. I want you to select three fields, all three. Okay, all the three. Go to show me once you're done. And I want you guys to choose this last but one chart called the bullet graph. Okay, it's a really powerful chart. Yet a cousin of the bar chart. Okay, Come, coming to our rescue. And don't uh, start interpreting it yet. Okay, do not interpret it yet. If something is wrong about this. I'll correct it. But you all should have a chart like this. Okay, now do not look at your computers. Okay, do not look, look at my board and answer because if you look at your computers, you'll give me the wrong answer. Okay, now let's say for a minute if I look at the first state AS. Okay, the blue part of the chart AS, what do you think it should stand for? What should it stand for? Sales. Okay, what should the black line represent? Targets. As per this chart that you see here, have you met targets? Targets for A's? No. So that's how you're supposed to read the chart. Okay. But the chart is not saying that. Okay, now look at your computers and look at what this black line is. Place your cursor on the black line. Look what it's telling you. Sales. It's going to say sales. Okay, so your black line is going to say sales. Yeah, average sales. It's not even saying sum of sales, it's saying sales. And your blue line is your targets. So your targets and sales have gotten interchanged. Okay, they've gotten kind of crisscrossed. Reasons best known to the software because of alphabetical order or something. Now, you guys, so here's the thing. Don't trust the software blindly. When you guys create some charts or whatever, first scrutinize it. See if it's doing the right thing. In this case, I don't have the right thing. Okay, so we're going to interchange this now. Okay, now it's a simple click. With one click, we'll fix it up now. Okay, so uh, now all these gray bands and these black lines are all coming in as a product of something called as reference lines. Okay, we'll talk how what we can ma 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 rectify that. Now, all I want you guys to do is in your x-axis, okay, what you see here is corrected targets. This has to mention sales, okay? And what you see here on your detail card right in here, if you see right in here, this card here, this must, say, this must have your targets. So targets has to come here and sales has to go here basically. They've got to be interchanged basically, okay? Again, target is in your columns. That has to get changed with your sales here. So there must be a swap of fields basically, okay? We'll fix it up. Right click on your x-axis. Right click on your x-axis and show, uh, select this option called swap reference line fields. So now with that, your data is looking accurate. So now let's uh, sort the data from high to low, okay? I'll put this on a full, full sort and let's now look at the data here. Okay. All right. Now let's analyze this chart. Your first state TY. Targets met. By what percent? By what percent approximately? Take a number, ballpark. Two and a half times. Okay. About 250% of uh, targets. Last state OP. Last state OP. Targets met. No. What percent of targets have you achieved in OP? About 10%, okay? Yeah, that's the way to read the chart now. Okay, now, a um, couple of more things now. Okay, if you notice on your all your, all your bars, there are some gray colored bands. There are two, and, and there are two, color, two gray colored bands. There's a dark gray and light gray. Okay, now that means something. So, let's, let's understand this for a minute now. Let's say this state OP, last state OP, okay? Your uh, sale is about uh, some amount X, about, about a very small amount, $10,000 or whatever, okay? Clearly, you've not met your targets. Your targets are here, okay? Now, if the sale amount, if the sale amount, had it been all the way up to the first dark gray band, till the end of the dark gray band, that means you would have achieved 60% of your set targets, okay? Had your sale amount gone all the way up to your second gray band, till the end of your second gray band, that means you would have achieved 80% of your set targets. And had you gone all the way up to your black line, you would have achieved 100% of your set targets. Okay? Is that okay? Does anybody want me to repeat that? 
actuals sales look here for a minute just keep keep your eyes here actuals if my sale amount had hit all the way up to the first gray band all the way end to the end of my first gray band that means i have achieved 60% of my overall set targets okay if my blue band has come all the way up to the end of the second gray band the light gray band that means i have achieved 80% of the overall set targets if it's gone to my black gray line black line 100% of my set targets this is the intent of your reference lines okay 6080 is a, is a default you can you can modify it okay that was my next thing i was going to modify what if i say you now that's what happened to one of our clients um but default we put in a 6080 now one client of ours uh, for them in their team apparently their team ends up doing 80% all of them end up achieving 80% of the targets that is not a challenge for them the real challenge is to bridge the 80 to 100 so she was more concerned about trying to see who is the guy who are these guys who are actually lagging in the 95 and 97% So for her requirement what we did was instead of 60 80% we made that into a 90% and a 95% and that kind of made sense for her and a 97 I think we did three bands or something for her so you can make any number of bands change the number change the value that is customizable it's not uh, set in stone okay how about we do a 50 70 90 we do a three band system here okay instead of 60 80 we'll modify it now okay now let's do one thing first is i want to change the this to instead of saying average corrected targets i want to say sum of targets okay i want to change this first and then i'll change this to a 67 50 70 90 okay now go back and right click on your sales access please go to edit reference lines there are two reference lines okay we'll fix up the average corrected to a sum of corrected targets because that makes more sense so let's go hit the average corrected targets to start with okay in here um again I'll, i'll 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 show you how to work this on a bit on on our another example right now just work this change out okay you see this values are sum of corrected targets that's fine and change the aggregation from an average to a sum okay and with that you click on okay you should be all right now check it out there your sum of corrected targets that's fixed as well now let's do the change the number instead of 60 80 let's make it 50 70 90 90 okay let's customize that so go back to your sales access and go back to your edit reference line choose that 60,80 reference line we're going to modify those values okay let's hit that okay and what i want you guys now to do is um we need to change the math the computation a little bit okay so it's pretty easy this option <clears throat> this option that you see value 60% 80% i want you to choose to hit that drop down okay select that drop down and again i'll i'll show you what these others are in some time but right now let's work this example where you see 60 comma 80 as percentages you can delete that and modify to say 50 comma 70 comma 90 i can keep adding my number of bands <clears throat> that kind of makes sense for me and i click on okay i should be good to go there it should be some over there as well um it it becomes it becomes some more well uh, 50% of the average corrected targets yeah it could be some yeah yeah that should also be some yeah we will we'll modify that yeah make it into some yeah makes sense okay now having said this let me ask you a question last but one state nm second last state what percent of targets have we achieved last la, state nm the last but one state what percent of targets have we achieved exactly around 55 exactly little more than 50% exactly okay so it's an indicator you know how, and what about uh, er <coughs> er the third last state but 80% yeah 80% yeah yeah fair deal yeah that's how this that's it that's how i read this chart okay <coughs> now let's do one more thing some states have met targets some have superseded targets okay like if you look at your first state ty it's done like a 250% of targets at least two and a half times okay if i look at the state let's say uh, we i've met my targets but i've just slightly exceeded targets okay so that's one way to look at it and if i look at my last three states not met my targets so i have states that have different levels of achievement some have over achieved some have just achieved some have under achieved and all that okay i want to show colors and i want to say states that have met the targets put them in a darker green color or a darker blue color that color line friendly color states that have not met the targets put them on a darker orange color 
Now, between states that have um, met targets better, who've done more than their targets, darker blue. Okay? State which is just about met a target, lighter blue. States that have not met targets, red. The one is like really, really bad, very dark red. So I want to have a converging scale of dark red or a dark orange to a dark blue. What do I do for this? But I want the, I want the, um, but states that have not met their targets, I need to find that out somehow. So, okay, so uh, again, what is the method for this? What's the logic that you'll apply for this? Okay, what's your calculation? Okay, or uh, rather uh, sales minus targets. Sales minus targets. Sales minus your corrected targets in this case, because null values are not there, okay? Then I'll be able to get different levels. Suppose the state where my sales minus my target is very, very high in positive. They've overachieved. Sales minus target is close to zero. That means they've just about met their target. Sales minus target is negative, which means the sale is lower than my target. They are negative. I've, I've underachieved. That'll be a color option. That's one way to do this. Okay. What's another option? So what is that option? That sub, uh, subtraction. Easy option, which we'll do. Give me another option. Yeah, you can kind of take a percentage, actual achievement to target percentage, right? Percentage achievement to targets. That's another option. Correct. What else? You can drag and drop sales to color, but that's not going to give you the impact that I want to. Okay, I can tell you that. That's not going to happen. It'll change some color, but it won't give you what we wanted. So it's not going to give us... It will, it'll not. It'll not. So I'm telling you it won't happen. There's one more option. One more option we can do here. What's that? Make buckets. Make like uh, if statement buckets. Okay, and then that's another possibility. Anything above a certain percent, uh, above a certain percent, show them in one bucket. You can create four or five buckets. That's another option. So you can you can pretty much work any option, anything that makes sense, logic that hits your brain at that point in time. The fastest option, work it out. Okay, let's now do a simple, easy one. Let's do a subtraction and, and carry on. Okay, create another calculation. <clears throat> Call this variance. Okay, and the variance formula is pretty simple. I'm just going to take in sales minus my corrected targets and that's my formula okay I'll just make this a little bigger for you guys so you can see it better sales minus your corrected targets and once you guys finish this formula drag and drop this to colors you'll get it get the formula click on okay and drag and drop the formula to colors it'll work variance formula goes into colors and with that there it is much more good use of a calculation a simple math can give you a nice good calculation like this okay so again guys to recap okay the reason i spent time on this small thing is to talk about multiple things get you guys started on how to make calculations okay how to understand the whole logic of calculations how to look for syntaxes how to get your syntaxes right okay uh, and also a special chart called a bullet chart this is a, a great use of a chart this is a, a fantastic chart uh, which will actually help you to get, gauge your variances Anytime you guys want to compare a target against any other metric or a metric against a target, this is probably the best chart choice you can think about. It's a fantastic chart. Uh, blindly use it, it works 10 out of 10 times. Okay, I can guarantee that. All right, let's do a few more, okay? Open up another sheet, please. I want you guys to import your uh, sample superstore <clears throat> back into this workbook, okay? For one more time. And I'll show you how to keep adding more and more databases. See, again... There is no limitation on how many uh, databases or how many sheets you want to bring it, bring it into one console. There's no limitation on how many databases you want to bring in. There is no limitation on number of records. There is no limitation on different types of data. Okay, meaning say for example here there's an Excel file. I want to bring in a CSV table, CSV file I can bring in. If I want to bring in another Salesforce report I can bring in. I want to bring in an SQL table I can bring in. It will not uh, reject any of those. As long as once you have identified that as data um, through a native character, it will not ever reject it. So again, there is no problem in that. Now, if you want to connect the two sheets, you can blend it. If you don't want to connect it, don't blend it. The choice is yours. So again, all these options are there. You have this flexibility. So okay, There's a primary key, you can connect it. Otherwise, don't connect it. Now let's um, import another file here. I'll show you how to do this. Okay, On your uh, toolbars, okay, next to your save button, there's a little icon with a cylinder in it. If you kind of give it a click, it'll become all familiar to you, okay? So there's your set of connectors again. You guys can pick up your Microsoft Excel again. And uh, let's go into documents, okay? Uh, my tableau repository, same thing. Yesterday's locations. Please go there again. Data sources, okay? 
sample hyphen superstore. And uh, what do you do next? Yeah, this time you drag and drop your order sheet because this time you didn't find it, it's coming automatically. The other database came on its own. Now you have to drag and drop your order sheet into your drag sheets here. Okay, this is a must. Do not skip this step. If you don't do this step, you'll have a problem. This is a compulsory step, okay? And go to your sheet. So now you can see both your databases are in the same console. If you check on your uh, right side, left side, topmost corner, this tab called data, the number calculation is right there. You also have your orders sample. You click on numbers, you find its relevant dimensions measures. Orders will have its relevant dimensions measures, okay? That's how it works now. Okay, let's make uh, a few more small calculations, okay? And then I'll uh, take on to the next uh, thing after that. Uh, let's create some simple text calculations, just to give you practice. We'll do a very simple thing. Let's join two strings, okay? How do you join strings in Excel? Excel, how do you join strings? So concatenate is one option, okay. The other option is, use the ampersand symbol, okay. I have the exact same relevance here as well. Tableau also has a concatenate function, by the way. I can use that. Now instead of the and symbol, I have to use a plus symbol in Tableau. That's the only difference, okay. So we'll do a plus and we'll carry on, okay. Let's uh, say I have a field called uh, category. I'll, I'm gonna create a simple chart here, okay. I'll drag and drop my categories to my rows for a minute. That's a bunch of strings. I'll drag and drop my subcategories also into my rows, okay? So I have two strings, okay? I'll now create a third string, which is going to merge a category with a subcategory. I'll make a third string also, okay? So let's create another calculation for this now, okay? So let's, 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 let's get cracking on that. Go ahead, create a calculation. Let's say I want to put a hyphen between my two fields, okay? So I can get them using quotes, like I do in Excel. In Excel, we use, we use double quotes, strictly, right? But here you can use single or double. It doesn't matter, you can use both. But if you start to use a single quote, stay consistent. If it's double quote, consistent, okay? So consistency is key here, but you can use both, okay? Let's say I put a hyphen there. Plus, the subcategory with that, I should have a valid calculation, okay? Once you have this done, click on OK, drag and drop to test it, it'll be all right, it should work. Okay, so that's your simple joining of strings. Here's your string one, I test it here in my rows, it'll work, my string is joined. Okay, that works. Okay, now let's look at cutting strings. That's slightly more challenging. Let's look at breaking strings, okay? That involves some logic. Let's kind of test your brains a little bit. This is too stupid, this is too easy. This is very, very rudimentary, okay? Open up another sheet, please. Open up another new sheet. Okay, now guys, guys leave that, okay, let's look at this, okay, so go ahead focus here, customer name, drag and drop your customer names to your rows please, okay, let's cut the first name and last name, slightly more interesting, okay, give me the logic first, what is your logic of cutting these things, split is a function, give me, uh, give me more options, space, okay, space, your space is a delimiter, if I can detect the position of space in all the words, or if I can find the first space in all the words, in other words, okay? Then I can, uh, what, I can find the first name and last name. Let's say I go to my first customer called Aaron Bergman for a minute, okay? And I say, uh, I want to find the space for this guy. So let's say his first name is A-A-R-O-N, so that's five characters. So if I need to find his space, it's in the sixth character, okay? If I look at, say, Adam Bellavance, the space is, a, is my fifth character. Each word has a unique space for its space. So how about we do this? We find, use a calculation wherein we detect the first space in all the names. Once we find the space position, I'll say all the words from the left of the space is what? First name. Balance is my last name. So can we use that logic to cut it? This is actually the hardest approach. I'm doing this deliberately so you guys can do three or four calculations, okay? Split can happen in no time at all. There are multiple ways to work this out, but I'm deliberately making you guys take the hardest approach just for now, okay? Then you'll get comfortable. So, the first part, I'm gonna help you, okay? I'll help you all find the names, the space of the names, between the names. I'll also cut the first name for you, okay? 
you guys can then try the last thing yourself in a few minutes. Okay, let's first cut the space now. Let's find the space. Create a calculation, guys. Okay. Let's call this finding space. Okay. Finding space. Okay. Now, there is a function called find. In all my strings, okay, in my strings, I, I've got a function called find, okay? So, um, I'm just going to hit that. And here's a find function. I'm going to use this function. Now, check this out. If you actually want to look for your functions, okay, when you, when you guys are doing your calculations for the first time, um, you if you're not sure of what functions to pick up, I'm saying please look at the function library, okay? Go through all these functions. Give it a click and see what it is. Read the description. The reading is very, very important, especially if you're not familiar with all this. Once you get a hang of all these functions, then I think you'll be pretty comfortable, okay? So here is my deal. It says it returns the position of a substring within a string. Now that's what I want, okay? Now let's look at the syntax. It's a find function. It is gonna ask you to input a string and a substring and a starting point to start counting. What is your string here? What's your substring? Space. Do we have a starting position or we can just take the default? We take the default, so I'm gonna ignore my start. Now start comes in a square bracket. What does square bracket Excel mean? In Excel, when you have optional fields, right? Excel has square brackets too. Same thing, here I can skip this. Similar similarities, okay? So let's now really get that going, okay? Now, let's type this and say find. The string is my customer name. Comma. I'm going to put in a space within a quote. Make sure in your quote there's only one space, otherwise you're going to have an error, okay? Be very conscious about it. In your quote, exactly put in one space. If there's more than one space, you're going to find something that is not in there, okay? And that's it. Close your bracket. We're good to go. You'll have a valid calculation. Click on OK. That's your finding space. Okay, now I've got a question. This finding space, is this a dimension or a measure? So I'm saying not a measure. I'm saying dimension. Why dimension? The answer is a dimension by dimension. It's not about the name, it's a number, but I, I, I just wonder why the number is, a, is to be kept as a dimension, not a measure. You're going to count it. So you're going to have a discrete point. It's discrete, isn't it? Think about it. Is it discrete or continuous? Answer that. Then you can ask yourself, you'll be all right. It's an exact specific point in all the customer names. So I want to use it as a point, and from there I want to get all the values on the right and the left. So it's, a, it's an exact specific point, okay? So it's clearly not a measure, but it's a dimension. So you know what, now if, you, now if you guys did not treat it, this is going to have a problem, and I'll prove it to you. Right now, just keep it as your dimension, as a measure. Keep it the way it is, okay? And it, let's now test it to see if this is working well or not. If I drag and drop my finding space into my text box for a minute, look at, look at what's going to happen. It's going to perform some level of aggregation. And as per this logic, it says that your 36th character in your first name is your first space. Now that doesn't make sense. I don't have 36 characters in my first name, but it says my 36th character is my space, which is obviously not right, okay? But now let's do one thing. I'm gonna take it out of here and I'm gonna drag and drop this finding space into my dimension, what I was supposed to do with my row IDs. Okay, treat it and now test it. <coughs> Put your finding space back into your text box. It is going to work right. Okay. <coughs> so as far as your logic is concerned, you are completely right. You do not mess up with the formula. Just that you had to treat it as a dimension. If you don't do a treatment here, it's going to have wrong values through the end. So make sure whenever you guys make any calculations, you find something into a measure or a dimension first, ask yourself the same question. Should that be a dimension or a measure? Okay. Great. Now we're good. Let's now cut the first name, okay? It's doing some aggregation. It's doing some math on its own. Some stupid math, which I've not bothered to break my head over here. Yeah, but there's something happening. It's not doing the right thing. So, all right. Now let's cut the first name, okay? Let's cut the first name, guys, okay? So create another calculation, please. Have you all used um, left, right, mid functions? Have you all done left functions, right functions, all that? Who is not, anyone not used left, right here? Left and right and mid, anyone here? Just give me a show of hands. Yeah, Excel has these text functions called left functions and right functions. So we'll make one. All I'm going to do here is, 
I've got the space in all my names. Space is here, all my names. Okay. Now, I want to say, suppose let's say Alan Huang, this guy. Okay. I know that the space is the fifth character. All the characters from the left of the space is my first name. So my left function will help me get that. Okay. We're going to now get this function here. So let's try that. Type in left. It is asking for a string. What's your string here? Customer, Customer name it is, right. And what's your uh, string? Right, I'm going to say, hang on, I'm going to say finding space. Not done yet, hang on, finding space. Minus one. Why minus one? Exactly, if I don't put the minus one, it's going to have the space along with it. I know there is one space in all my words. So if I can minus that one number against everything, It'll just be a the first name alone. Otherwise, I have to put a trim function, cut the space out, one more extra task. So, you know, once and for all, let's kind of uh, solve it. Okay. Close your brackets. Click on OK. And let's test your first name in here. It should work. Okay. <clears throat> there it is. All the first names are being cut. Okay. Now, you guys do the next one yourself. Cut the last name. Try it yourself now. Cut the last name from the given name. You've been told exactly what to do. Okay. I've done most of your work for you. It's just one small formula. Please work it. But guys, now here's the deal. You guys can't, uh, you need to be able to figure it out. When you guys make mistakes, okay, this is going to keep happening a lot. Uh, you must be able to develop your own skills to find logics and test your logic and, and rectify this, okay? Otherwise, you're never going to make it right. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you my simple logic, okay? Uh, some of you are trying length and some of you have done split. I will go with a different function altogether, okay? Look look at mine, and mine is pretty simple. I'll, I'll actually first make your mistake, then I'll explain to you what you guys have done. So that I can kind of take it forward. I'm going to create a calculation, call it last name. Okay, and I know you all did this. You all went in, put up the right function. You all must have done this. Customer name, comma, finding space. Did you all say plus one? Did you all try? Oh, that's even better, okay? Okay. All right, so some, who, who, who put a plus one? Okay, so I'm also going to put a, put a plus one. Okay, and well, if I'm going to click on okay, well, plus one or plus two, you guys are going to have something like this. Many of you would have got this. Okay, now, the logic is the first two names came right. But you realize the third and fourth onwards, it was all going messed up. Okay, now, when you guys have issues like these, okay, it could be because your logic is wrong, or use a wrong function, or something has gone wrong, okay? One of my ways to handle this is, I'll go back to my function right there, okay? And see what this deal is all about. Now, don't waste too much time looking at this, because all you can see here is syntax. Syntax is right. There's nothing to really break your head over this. Now, I would, if I were you, I would have actually real quick gone into my actual right function and see what it does, okay? And here it is. If I read my right function, it specifies a number of characters from the end of the string. The word is end. The key word is end. It goes all the way to the end of your string and from the end it pulls so many from the right. So if I look at say uh, Alex Russell, okay? Alex Russell. You guys were expecting to go from this space onwards and make sure all the words from the right came in here. It doesn't do that by the way. It takes a character, it goes all the way to the end and from the end it takes in those many characters. So I gave what a finding space plus one in my logic. So if it's Alex Russell, okay, here's my number of five. So five, five plus one, six. So all I should have is say L L E S S U, six words. So that's what I have. Instead of Russell, it's U S S E L. So I don't want my function to go to the end. I want it to basically catch it from this space onwards. That's my logic. If I can fix that, I'll be good to go. So all I'm going to do is just one thing. Instead of a write function, if I use the mid function and click on OK and get it. Also works. This also works. Okay. So a little bit of logic is required, a bit of kind of familiarity of the functions is important. If you are, or if you read what the issue is, guilty is charged. When I did this the first time, I made the same mistake. Okay. 10 years back. But um, yeah, as you kind of practice it more, you guys will get a hang of it. That's how you guys, you need to kind of really work this out. Okay. See, at the end of it, if your answer comes right, that's all matters. It doesn't matter what approach you take. If you get the right answer, you're good to go. Okay. All right. So I'll just take one more example for a calculation. And with that, we'll move on to our next topic. 
I'd like to work on uh, something called, I'd like to take a date calculation, okay? A date calculation, and let's do a small case out of it. So let's assume that here's a data set. Okay, we have uh, operations in different states in the US. Let's assume I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm selling, a, I'm some kind of an e-commerce guy, okay? So um, what I would like to see here is um, how quickly am I selling my goods to my customers, okay? Let's say I have a standard which I plan to stick on, okay? When you look at your Amazon Prime, for example, it gives you a same day delivery, okay? No matter what you do, one day delivery, two day, there's a, there are multiple options to kind of really pick on that. If they are able to give you that quick delivery time, obviously there is something to it. What does you pay? What does you pay for it, right? The other option is uh, they should be able to deliver to you in that speed, right? Now, now you might be willing to pay that kind of money, but what if I don't have the bandwidth to send things in a day's time, okay? So there are a couple of things that I need to kind of be prepared with before I make a promise to you, okay? I can just say I'll give you in a day and if I give it in three days and you travel somewhere and you guys are going to miss the package, it's going to be a case of, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a poor service from my side. I can't do that. So I want to make sure that I have the service guarantee. Okay, I'd like to now test and see how my standard is right now before I make any tweaks to this, okay? Let's assume that in all my states in the US, I've got multiple warehouses, okay? And um, I'd like to say that uh, a decent delivery time is about three and a half days. Okay, three and a half days from the time of delivering. So what I would like to see here is that any state takes more than three and a half days on an average to deliver items to customers. That's a bad thing. Okay, anything less than three and a half days is a good thing. So in this case, I'm gonna do some calculation, put this in the map, on colors, states which are more than three and a half days, red color, states less than three and a half days, green color. Reverse, lower the number green, darker the number red, okay? It's a reverse metric. How do we start working this logic out? What's the first step for this? What is the calculation for you? What, what, what date? Exactly, you do your ship date minus your order date, you guys will get this, okay? Now here it's very simple, if you just subtract ship date minus order date, your answer will come out pretty simply, okay? But um, what if I say I want the output in, uh, if, I, if I want to get my output in terms of months, what do I do typically? If Suppose I have two dates, okay? I've got a start date, end date. I'm saying I want to estimate all the output in terms of months. If I subtract ship date minus order date, I'll get the number of days. Okay, in case you, uh, do you guys know what's the first date in Excel? Excel's first date is what, you know? 1-1? One, one. 1-1-1900. One, one, in Excel, you cannot have a date before 1-1-1900, one, one, by the way, okay? Uh, so if you guys actually put in a, a number one in Excel, okay? And convert that to a date format, it picks up 1-1-1900. One, one, so if you type in a number of two, it is the 2nd of Jan, 1900. If you type in a number of 366, it's the 31st of December, 1900. So every day a number keeps getting added on in the Excel date format, basically, okay? So from the first date of Excel, 1-1-1900 till date, you've had about some 43,000 dates, approximately, okay? So uh, here's the deal. Suppose I have an order date and a ship date. My ship date is always going to be higher or the same to my order date. It can't be lower, so that's a given, right? So, um, so if I'm gonna subtract ship date minus an order date, technically all I'm doing is subtracting a higher number from a smaller number. It's like subtracting 43,201 minus 43,000. Okay, and then I'll get the numbers, basically. And I'll get some number of 201, 202, whatever number. Okay, so that's my, that's my date. So again, when I just do an actual subtraction, ship date minus order date, I get the output in terms of days. Yeah, makes sense, days. What if I want my output in terms of months? What do I do? Divided by? What about 31 days? What about 28 days? What about 29 days? What about uh, years? I can't do 365, why? Because I have 366 as well, okay? So I've got a way to handle this now, okay? There's a function, uh, Excel, every tool has this, so does Tableau. There's a function called date diff. Have you all done the date diff in Excel? Yeah? So has anyone else done the date diff in Excel? It's a hidden function. It's a hidden function, by the way, okay? It's a brilliant function. All it does is now this exact issue. This 30 days, 31 days, 28 days, 29 days of the month. Just think about this, if that software had a calendar in front of it, and it's able to look at the number of days and give it a denominator based on the calendar. Now that's fantastic, okay? That's exactly what's gonna happen in the date diff formula. 
all i'm going to do is understand the syntax and tell it that hey listen i want the output in days or months or weeks or quarters or anything okay i'm going to input my parametrics and it gives me the answer i can get the same days output months years and all that right now i want to get the output in days but i'm going to show you the date diff function and we'll get the math out okay so you guys can use the same logic for months quarters as well okay So let's get cracking on this now. Let's first get a map of the US, okay? So if you all can just uh, double click on your state field, just double click on a state field, okay? And uh, rectify the unknowns, guys. We did this yesterday. Fix up the unknowns, and let's also change the mark type from this automatic mark into a state mark. Same as what we did yesterday. Sorry, map mark. Sorry, map mark. We should just have the atlas of the US ready. Nothing else but the atlas. Let's now do the calculation. Okay. Ship date minus order date using the date diff function. And I want the output in days. So I'm going to create a calculation for that now. So let's go ahead. Create a calculated field. Okay. Create a calculated field. Let's call this days to ship. Days to ship, okay. And just to again induct you on the on using syntaxes. If you don't know a syntax, you're seeing for the first time. I would strongly recommend that you guys use the library and let that guide you. Okay. And here it is. If I look at these functions, this is a date type function. So I'm going to pick up date functions, and I have something called as date diff. D a t d i f f. Okay. Now when I Look at date diff at this minute. I see what the function tells me here, pretty much. It says you need a date part. You want a start date. There is an end date. And it's also starting of the week. Okay? Start of the week is square bracket. So what does that mean? Option. So I'm going to skip it. I don't have a starting day of the week. Okay? All I want is to get the start date end date. Date part is the output I want to see it. If I want to say months, I put in month. If I want to say day, day, if it's year, year, quarter, quarter. Okay. Now let's really use this function logic and we'll now get going here now. Okay. So date diff. Okay. I'll hide this for the minute. Okay. I don't want this. I'll make more space here for us. Okay. Date diff. Okay. Now the date part is what you need first. To bring in a date part, there is a syntax that you have to follow. Okay. Open a single quote single quote okay and type in your date aggregation all in small caps all in small if you want a day if you want it in days type in day if it's month if it's month in small if it's year year in small quarter quarter in small no capitals all small words okay all lower cases that's the only syntax that you have to keep in mind so that's your day comma it's asking for your start date what's your start date yeah so let's get your order date and it's gone into measure. This days to ship, is it a dimension or a measure? This time fell right. So you first ask your question, scrutinize it, this time it is a measure. Where would you apply this now? Colors, okay. Drag and drop your days to ship your color card. Okay, let's see if it's doing things right. Okay. Okay. And the color legend tells me five days to seven, seven, three, eight days. So let's look at California. It takes almost 7,738 days. Are you kidding me? It takes 20 years to get a product in California. Okay, that can't be right. What's wrong here? Exactly. The aggregation is some because California has more sales. There's a good chance it has more number of transactions. So it's doing all adding up all the date differences. What do you need instead? Average. Exactly. If I can change my aggregation from a sum to an average, that will be fine. So I'll go to my colors card where I have my sum of days to ship. Okay. And I'm going to give it a click right here. And I change the aggregation from a sum measure sum to that of an average with that. I should have correct values. Hopefully. So now my numbers look all right. I see 2.857 days to 5.7 days. That looks more reasonable. Okay. That looks more sensible. Okay. But I still don't have the coloring effect the way I saw expected. I mean, I've not got that impact. We'll get that going. I gave a standard. What's my standard you said? When we started, I said that there's a standard we're looking at. There's a standard for number of days. I, I gave you guys a standard here. Remember that? Three and a half days. I said 3.5 days. Okay. 
So that's my standard. Let me do something. I'm going to go and edit my colors. Okay, let's go and edit colors. Okay, let's first change the color scheme, guys. Guys, look here, please. Change your color scheme. And see, I wish I had a green to red, but I don't have that. So my nearest option is a red to green. Okay, I'm going to choose a red to green. And I have an option to reverse my colors. Okay. Still not done yet. My standard of 3.5. Where do I put it now? Yeah, in my center value. Yesterday we had a center value of 0. Today if I say my advanced, if I can take my center value to 3.5, my standard gets incorporated right there. So let's change this number from a 4.2 whatever into a 3.5 and click on OK. Now I can see exactly how my states are faring in terms of that standard. Here it is. This is the real picture. Okay. So not very promising. Three and a half days. If I need to give a commitment, given my current conditions, I don't think that's very feasible. I don't think I can really go this approach. Maybe I've got to tweak it a little bit. I have to kind of, before I make a commitment, see now this involves multiple things. For me, just making a promise of four days or five days or something, it's easier said than done. I have to do a lot of research. Okay. I'm a store owner. I'm not the logistics guy. I don't own planes and cars and trucks to deliver goods on time. Okay, that is not my business. I have to talk to multiple vendors and say, hey, is it possible without adding extra cost? A lot of factors are there for me now. So I want to be able to make sure that I get this right. Now, let's do one thing. Okay, let's try something. Um, let's try and tweak the standard a bit. My logic is that if I promise you an item in three and a half days, if I can, and let me assume that I'm largely catering to office goers. If I'm promising my item in three and a half days, there's a good chance that in that half a day time, you're going to be in office. So what if I can take an extra half a day and say instead of three and a half, I'll try and make it to a four day and let's see what that looks like. Okay. So let's look at that option instead and change your center value to four days. See if that is any better. That's a C change of a difference. A whole lot of states have gone to green. So it looks like maybe that's like a much more reasonable bet. And states which are looking red, I treat them as individual cases. So maybe four days is a much more acceptable time. So basically, I just went and stumbled upon a very rudimentary what if analysis, if you think about it. If it's four days, it looks better. Three days, it's pretty much bad. That half a day made a difference. A very simple rudimentary approach. But I can do a much better approach, but this is a very simple approach. Okay. Which are my worst states? Wyoming and? And main. Okay. But what's your uh, color legend telling you? What's your highest value? 5.7. Look at Wyoming main. It's 5. So something is more than 5. These look worst. Visually, they look like the worst, darkest, right? But there's something on a 5.7. I've seen this data, so I know where it is. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. See, there, there you go. Yeah. There. You know, a very tiny spot. If you look at DC, that's like a 5.7 days. It's a very small, tiny state. This can happen in maps, by the way. This could happen in maps. When you guys are working for maps, typically be careful about this. That's a pitfall that you might have a problem. So be aware. Be conscious about all your numbers. Look at all your values and then take a call. Okay. So yeah, just a, it's a DC. Yeah. I'll uh, stop with my calculations here now. Okay. I've got more examples, more applications at that time. We'll use them, but right now we're good to go. We'll, we'll stop with this now. Uh, before we take a break, okay, I'd like to give you guys uh, talk about something else. Okay, um, I want to give you guys a little fair introduction about parameters. At least discuss a couple of examples now. Okay, and we'll come back and then we'll uh, have some more applications on that. Okay, now uh, I want you to go to your yesterday's workbooks, please, because I want to apply a couple of applications there. The ones who didn't come yesterday, you guys can work on the same file because you're going to miss a few steps. Okay. But uh, the ones who were there yesterday, you guys open up yesterday's workbook. See, I'll tell you what, I want you guys to have the workbook that contains uh, the first dashboard we did. Because I'm going to make an application here eventually, okay? So again, the ones who don't have it, guys, uh, you're going to miss one step later. That's okay. You can still most, do most of the steps. You'll miss one step. Okay? Whoever has this file saved from yesterday's work, please uh, have this workbook open. You, you can close the other one, okay? You can shut the other one. Okay, the ones who have two files, please close today's file. You are going to get confused if you do that, okay? The reason why I'm making you do this is we can save some time. So we can, we don't have to keep doing the same thing multiple times. So have this workbook open. <laughs> Whoever has this. 
If you don't have it, doesn't matter. You you're going to miss one step. That's all. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to ask you all to open up a new free, new sheet here, a fresh new sheet. We'll come back to this in the end. Okay. Open up a new sheet. Okay, new sheet. Let's first uh, practice a small parameter, and then we'll come back to this. Okay. Now, um, see these parameters that I'm going to give you guys a little preview about. These are some features which can um, do some pretty. Um, it can do some pretty complex analysis for us. It can do things like um, just to give you some little perspective. Different kinds of what-if analysis can be done. Okay. You want to replace measures with measures. You want to bring in multiple drop downs. Um, you can do that. You can sort your data dynamically. For example, you can replace a chart with another chart. You can replace any item with another item using parameters. Basically, they look like filters. They look like drop downs. You can use a whole lot of things with that. You can use them as filters. You can, if in case you have multiple data sets, you can actually combine them using parameters. There are so many things you can do with parameters. It's a pretty vast area to look at. Okay. Um, another small example. Say, for example, I have say. Um, 1,000 customers. I just want to look at my top customers. Okay, I can use a parameter to pick my top five or top seven, top ten, top n customers. Basically, instead of just choosing a number of five or seven or ten, I can give my user the option to choose any number that he wishes to see. Basically, okay, a very easy parameter. Let's try that example now. So basically, here's what's going to happen. It's going to happen. You guys are going to have a chart like this. Okay, you're going to have a bar chart like this. Let's say I'm going to have my customer names. Okay, and let's say I have sales or something in here. Okay, it's going to have a bar chart like this. Okay, I have about one thousand customers per se. Now I've also got a filter box here. If you all notice in your screens, there's a filter box in here in Tableau. That's key. Okay, so all I'm going to have eventually here is a box. Okay, which is my parameter. Okay, I'll call this as my top n by sales or whatever. Okay, now if I type in any number. I feel like let's say I type in a number of say 15, for example here. Okay, this command will be passed back to a filter. Okay, and it will just pick my top 15 customers. If I change this number to say 150, it passes back a command, gives you top 150 customers. Whatever numbers that I wish to see, it will basically keep passing back a command to give us those many items that you wish to see. Okay, if I can pick up a top end, I can even do a bottom end. Similar logic will happen. Same thing. Okay, so we'll take this example now to start with. And also discuss some applications for it. Okay, so this is a very easy parameter, very simple parameter. Let's first make a bar chart. Okay, drag and drop your customer names into your rows. How many customers do we have in the data set? Unique customers, seven ninety customers. Okay, yeah. Now don't count. Okay, drag and drop your sales to your columns. And uh, sort the data from high to low. Okay, give it a sorting order. Okay, let's do another thing here. Okay, now I am going to have the parameter here in a few minutes. Before that, uh, just one more thing. Uh, Sean Miller, my first customer, I want to be able to say that he is one. Okay, uh, Tamara is two, Raymond is three, Tom Ashbrook is four. So I want to have a number against all these customers. Their position, basically, one call it rank or position or whatever it is. I want to have those numbers against all these customers, almost from one down to seven hundred ninety-three. Okay, I've got to use some kind of a field here to get these numbers. Okay, do I have any fields in my dimensions I can use? Row ID is close, but think about row ID. How many row IDs do we have in Excel? Ten thousand. Your customer ID must be saying like 5175ABQ or VIV741 or something of those sorts. So no, in fact, the closest can be row ID. But your row ID uh, won't make sense. Why? Because there are 10,000 records in Excel, but here there's only 793 customers. So I need to find something else. Find something else for this now. Ideas. Maybe, maybe you can. I don't know the logic, but I'm sure if there is something, then perhaps yes. Give me some more obvious uh, recommendations. Rank is one option, correct? Yeah. Rank is one. What else? Number of records. It's not. It's it's total sales. It's not number of records. Rank is one. Rank by sales. Ranking customers by top sales is one option. What is the other option? Easy option. 
descending is already here. I just want a number. What if I make an index? An index for anything by default. So I'm going to make a function. Sorry? Row ID is 1 to how many items? 1 to 9994. But how many customers do I have here? I'll make some index. That's an index for the Excel file. But I want an index for how many items I have. Index for this view or any view. I just want to have an index as a record. Okay. So I'm going to create an index, by the way, for this. Okay. Which can be used as an index for any view. Okay. This is a simple function. We're going to create that formula right now. Okay. So create a calculation. Call this index. Okay. And the function is pretty easy. Okay. Just type the word index, open close brackets. That's it. That's your function. Index open close brackets. Very simple function. Okay. Okay. That's it. Click on okay. Index now sits in your measure. Okay, question. Is this index a dimension or a measure? Okay, so now you're gonna have a new problem. Try treating it. Look what happens. You guys try putting it back to your dimensions. For some reason, this doesn't happen. I don't know why it doesn't happen, okay? But I know how to fix it. This also happens sometimes, okay? So uh, now, if I don't treat this, if I keep this index the way as it is, as a measure, it's going to throw back some funny results <clears throat> because the treatment has not been done. Now check it out. If I try dragging and dropping index into my rows and do this, I'll if you try this, okay? Put it in your rows, look what happens. It's going to completely distort your chart. It's going to make a funny chart, by the way. What chart is this, by the way? What chart is this? Scatter plot. Okay, let's, let's think. If I need to make a chart for two measures, what's the chart choice? Two measures, just two measures. Yesterday we made this chart, two measures. We made a chart for discount versus your profits when you came with the recommendation, scatter plot. The tool now thinks that we are now trying to make a chart using index and sales. So it's made a scatter for us. Because your index has been picked up as a measure. But if you can treat your index into a dimension, yeah, but if you make your index into a dimension or have dimension properties, then we don't have this problem. Dimensions are what? Discrete. Measures are continuous. So here's what I'm going to do. In my index, if I just do a right click on it, there is an option to convert this into a discrete variable as well. So let's choose discrete. It will then rectify the problem there. So guys are being exceptionally quiet. I don't know if that means something. You guys are getting nothing or you got everything, okay? So there's no response. So I don't know, especially that side. No one's even responding there. So. No, but at least, at least it's giving me what I wanted. Even though it's not become a dimension, it's not happening for some reason. At least it is behaving the way I want it to behave. That's all matters. Okay. Let's now slightly move them aside. Okay. Let's put the index first and the customer names here. There, that is done. Let's now make the parameter. Okay. This is a very simple parameter, easy kind of a parameter, very easy parameter. Okay. Now, if I told you, if you look, if you look at the whiteboard for a minute, okay, this white, this box that you're going to have is going to keep getting controlled with your filter back and forth. So your key is to actually make a parameter that talks back to your filter back and forth and throws back a result. Okay. Now here's what we got to do. Okay. Now I need to create a filter from a filter, make a parameter and that's what's going to happen for me. Okay. Now yesterday we made a simple filter. Okay. I just want you guys to focus on this for a minute. Now here is a deal. There are three kinds of variables in the data. In any kind of data, you have discrete variables, you have continuous variables, you also have date fields. Why date? Date can be both discrete and continuous. Three kinds of data. Okay. There is a, so in other words, there's a dimension, there is a measure, and there's a date field. Okay. Three kinds. Date can behave both as a measure or a, di or a dimension because it can behave both ways. Now, you guys will experience this in just a minute. If I drag and drop, say, any dimension. Just watch for a minute. Don't do this. I drag and drop any regular dimension. Now, except for a date, say I pick up my field called category. In the filter looks different. Check this out. It gives you options called general, wildcard, condition, and top. The filter is something. Okay. Again, I'm, I'm repeating it's general, wildcard, condition, top. If I drag and drop, say, a measure into my filter, there's no general, wildcard, condition, top because it's not a measure. It behaves differently. Date can behave both ways. And I'll show you that, okay? Date can behave both ways. Now, check this out. If I drag and drop a date 
into my filter and here is where I can either, let's first make it into a general condition top. If I click on say the years for a minute, okay. And I choose next, there you go, general condition and top. It's not behaving like a dimension. If I drag and drop my date and say call it a range of dates for a minute here, it will look like a dimension. It behaves differently. So same uh, like a measure. So dates have the properties of behaving both ways. Okay. So good to know this. Again, the reason I'm pointing this out is you guys can, you need to do this yourself. You need to practice and play around with these, play with these filters, drag and drop every different field, click on something, play with it. That's your only way to handle this. No one's going to, it's not going to come in just like that. Okay. Now, for this parameter, where I want to get a top parameter, top end parameter, I am going to drive this using my customer names. Okay. So go ahead. All of you drag and drop your customer names into your filter box. Please do this. I see this tab called top. I'm going to go right into this top tab. Okay. And let's kind of play around with this a little bit. In my top tab, I want to say, hey, listen, let me make this uh, with the help of a field. Okay. My field is sales. I want my top customers depending on the sales. Okay. So top. The number 10 is ever default. It will become dynamic soon. This field called category, make this into sales. So if I click on OK right now, I'll get my top 10 customers. But I want top N customers. That's going to come with the parameter. N, N, any number that I wish to choose. Can be 5 or a 10 or a 17, 25, any number that I wish to see at, at random. So I don't want to restrict my views to a number like this, to a 10 or a 15, okay? So I want to create a parameter for this now. Now, here's what we do for this. In this option, near this number called 10, there's an arrow which drops down. If you select on this arrow that drops down, there's an option called create a parameter. Choose that. It's going to throw a box like this for us. Okay. We're now going to give some conditions and we're going to set this in about a minute. This will work for us. Now get into your habit of naming parameters guys, because you'll realize in some time as we start to do more parameters, one parameter can do so many different tasks. So if your audience sees a box like this on the screen, tell them very clearly what it means, what it's intended to do. So when you name it, name it smartly well, okay? Here I'm going to call this top n customers by sales. Customers by sales. Okay. I'll just say top customers by sales. N is not required as well. Top customers by sales. Okay. I'm calling this parameter that. Okay. All right. A few rules to keep in mind. <coughs> Display format, uh, sorry, data type has become an integer. Um, why not a float? Why can't we a float? Exactly. There's no 2.5 customers, right? So that's the logic here. So it's, it's an integer. So that's given. It's a set number. So it's already done. Okay. All right. Current value is 10. Ignore it for the moment. Doesn't matter. Your display format in this case, you don't have to change. Keep it as automatic. When required, we'll change it. Okay. Now, this option called allowable values. There are three radio buttons. Each of these radio buttons will give you a different kind of a parameter. Each one is something different. We pick the easiest of all now. The first one called all values. Select that. Nothing more to do. Click on OK. Click on OK one more time. And that's your top end parameter. So now by default, number 10 got picked up. Change a number from 10. Type this number to say some number of your choice, 25 or 30 or whatever, okay? Type any number. You'll find those many customers are getting populated. Every time you type in a new number, those many customers will get appeared on the screen here. Okay, I have a story to share this. It's a rather, well, I'm not proud of it, but I have a story to share about this, okay? Uh, we wasted millions of dollars because of this parameter. I have to bring this out. Not me, but my clients. Um, so one of my clients, um, <clears throat> what they do is, uh, well, they, it's a semi, uh, let's say semi government owned entity in the U S okay. So what they do is, I mean, they have, uh, for them, employee satisfaction is very, very important is very important. It's one of the top KPIs for a CEO in her top five, it's zero maybe. Okay. They don't care if they make money or not. They don't care whether they are um, optimized, having optimized outputs of their power and all that. But if their employees are unhappy, she's in trouble basically. Okay. 
So they're very, very particular that employees has to be the same. So you guys can have a great ball of a time. If you work there, your life is set. They take such good care of you that employees come first. Nothing matters. Customers, they don't care, but employees first. I can't tell you who the company is, okay? But yeah, but, uh, but it's, a, it's an awesome company. I love them, okay? So uh, they have a couple of ways to gauge employee satisfaction scores. Have you all, uh, has anyone given Gallup surveys here? Gallup, have you, anybody? Yeah, so do you guys work for a Tata company? Do you guys work for the Tatas, anyone? There it's very widely used. Which, uh, whom do you work for, you guys? They use Gallup, is it? Okay, all right, okay, so I didn't know that, okay. So Gallup has been there in this business for a long time. Gallup is a third party, uh, uh, third party enterprise that helps in customers, in, in surveys, different kinds of surveys. Employee satisfaction surveys is one of the services that they offer, okay? So if you don't know what that is, say for example, um, let's say I'm your immediate supervisor, okay? And I'm a complete jerk. And I don't let you progress. I'll take credit for all your work and I kind of, I know I'm one of those kinds. Now you're scared to bypass me and go to my boss and say that he's an idiot, okay? So uh, here's what Gallup does for people like you all. And you're a good employee and I'm the black sheep. So for people like you, they kind of pick people at random in different levels in the organization. And they give you surveys discreetly without their bosses knowing. So suppose you're my reportee, I would not know that you have got the survey, but you'll be given questions to talk about your boss and all that, okay? So it's a nice way, yeah? Yeah, anonymous, totally anonymous. It's very strictly anonymous, okay? So they have different questions. There are 12 questions. Uh, in, I, mean, I don't know how many you saw. There were 12 questions. 12, same thing. It's not changed. There are 12 questions in uh, Gallup by default, okay? All the questions are uh, Likert scale ratings on a scale of 1 to 5. Are you happy with your boss? Are you happy with your job roles? Are you content? You know, are you motivated? You know, that kind of questions, 1 to 5. Where 5 is the highest and 1 is the lowest. So uh, a standard regulated by the municipality is that employees must at least have a satisfaction rate of three and a half on five. At least 70% of satisfaction rates, okay? So just imagine, I mean, that's like an idiotic, most idiotic rule. And for that, the company goes all out to make sure that these guys give the surveys right. And they just, and towards the end of the surveys, they are sucking up the left, right, center, ensuring that the surveys goes high and all that, okay? So we got this data, okay? And uh, we got it for about four or five years data. We put this into a dashboard. All I did was made a bullet chart, a very simple bullet chart. I said for every question, there was a score on a scale of one to five. My bullet chart target was three and a half. So any chart, any bar that was more than three and a half, I showed that in a green color, less than three and a half in a red color. Okay, I did this and I gave it to her. So I also decided that I'll use this parameter for some reason and I did that. So I said, okay, instead of a top end parameter, I'll do a bottom end parameter. We'll find the worst performing metrics. My logic was that if I need to rectify something in the team, okay, genuinely, if my employees are not happy, I can pick up the lowest performing metric and I can work on that. That was my logic. So I intended with a very, I had a very good intention. Okay. So I gave it to them and she was very happy. She saw that and all this went on well. We realized after further analyzing all the departments and teams across, across every department, and I'm not joking, every department, there was one idiotic question that said, I lack you, you uh, do, do you have a best friend in the organization? People said one out of five. So just imagine, just imagine, there are two guys, okay, these two guys, grown-ups, they're the same department. If he does not have a best friend or these two are not friends, how is it my responsibility, okay? So that's exactly what happened. So the CEO panicked. They said, oh my God, this is like the worst performing metric. And it came across all the departments. So she thought something is wrong on her part. She's a very sensible lady, but for once she acted like a complete cuckoo. I said, I said, no, no, it's not your. I said, how is this your mistake? Grown-ups, they're not children, they're not kindergartners now, say shake hands and you know, now, you know, go, you guys share your lunch boxes and all that. They're not that kids. I said, they are not friends. Let them not be friends. How is that our problem or your problem? She said, no, no, you don't understand. It's going to become a big thing. So, you know, they panicked and all that. They had this actually, they actually had a big meeting for this. They had a, they had a real C-suite meeting. All the directors were there. I was also there because I made the dashboards. They were calling me for this, okay? To me, it was complete fun and drama. I just wanted popcorn and some soda there to drink and watch there. So, and they were panicking and they were strategizing how to make this better. Complete waste of two hours, but it was complete solid entertainment. Okay, so they, okay, they came with a hyper strategy. They said, okay, if these two buggers have to become friends and they can't talk to each other, okay, and they're grown ups, let's involve their spouses, okay, then they become friends. Yeah, yeah, that was their strategy, okay, that's their strategy, okay. They said, if we can get their wives to mingle, these two idiots will also mingle, okay. So I was like, okay, this is getting better. I said, okay, so what, what's happening next, okay? So they said, okay, you know what? They had a regatta, they had a sailing happening in that part. There was a lake there, there was a sailing event happening there. We'll sponsor a mega tent, okay? We'll call people in random and we'll, you know, take, take in turns and we'll make sure we'll have black tie events. 
it was a Sunday evening. We'll call them all, and spouses have to come. So in one table, these guys in the same department will sit there with their wives. So they were called and they were called. Their wives were called. They, those guys were drinking. They made merry. They were like so happy. They had a huge fat bill. Champagne was pouring everywhere. I was there for that event as well. Okay, I went for the black tie event as well. For me, I was just watching and full fun. People in tuxedos and all these. They were coming in there all over left. They, they spent money left, right, center. Okay, and next year this went up. Then they figured, okay, one more idea. Next year let's do a, a Christmas carnival for them. So they had another huge carnival. They called the kids and all that, and this went on and on and on. And I think it is still going on, by the way. It is still going on. So there, and then of course their thing went up. But you know, I felt this one parameter did all this thing. Till date, if I think about this, the actual bottom end parameter brought this simple idiotic problem, and we wasted millions of dollars wasting money just to make them drink. Finally, that's what happened. So it's a story I'm not very proud of, but I just can't help but talk about this. So yeah, it worked, but it worked for them. So yeah, okay. Well, I was having fun. Yeah, I was lucky. I was laughing, but I also felt guilty. So that was my point. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's make another quick parameter. Take a break. Then. Okay. One more small example. I'd like to bring in another option called a drop down, like a multi, like a list kind of a drop down. Okay. So this time, what I'm planning here is say a chart like this. Okay. Let's see a chart like this. Let's say these are my different subcategories for a minute. Okay, and let's say here is a bar chart. Okay, okay. Now, all I want to have here is a drop down that involves two options: sales or a profit. Okay, let's say two metrics. So when I choose this drop down, one of these words will pop up: list. Okay. Now, if I choose sale, this metric will become a sale. If I choose a profit, this metric becomes a profit. This. external box is going to control this chart for me basically okay so i'm now <clears throat> trying to replace a value with the help of this parameter okay now think about what i'm trying to achieve i'm trying to basically replace a column if i need, if, if if i think about this i'm trying to replace one variable with a completely different variable that is the intent of this parameter okay and if i can make this in one chart i can make this anywhere i can make this happen anywhere primarily okay we in fact make this change in the dashboard eventually okay but let's first make the one chart we'll take a break and come back and work on the dashboard i'll show you some tweaks and some more tricks there okay now there are uh, let's first make a chart here to start with the dragon drop your sub category into your rows for a minute okay and uh, drag and drop say your sales for the moment for the moment just bring sales to your columns like this okay just for the minute now I'd like to give you guys a small checklist. Make a note of this. I would recommend you do this. Write it down. It will help you out. If you follow these four steps, your parameters will always work. Okay? These are broad guidelines. The how and what will change as per every scenario. Okay? Just I'll give you these four broad lines. Step one, just mention create parameter. Create parameter. So in other words, you're trying to create a button. Okay. Step two: show parameter control, so that I can use it. Okay. Step three: create a calculated field using the parameter. Step one: you create parameter. Step two: show parameter control. Step three. create a calculated field using the parameter okay so write it down give you a minute create a calculation using the parameter and the last step you apply that calculation on a worksheet the how and what will differ as per scenarios everything will differ but if you follow these four steps if you give a thought about these four ideas your parameters will work Okay, let's now do this. We'll create the parameter right now, wherein we're going to make the button to start with a drop-down option. Okay, now here's what it is. You guys are going to create a parameter from scratch this time. Okay, now to create a parameter, the same place where you guys were trying to create a calculation, go back to the same drop-down. You'll find an option called create parameter. Okay. 
this will look very similar to your top end parameter basically okay now let's start to name the parameter okay i'm going to call this sales slash profit okay now i'm doing nothing but creating a button right now when i'm creating a parameter it's just a button creation process okay it's not doing any actual math it's just a button creation now i need to define the data type for my parameter or for the button what do you think is an appropriate data type for the button boolean okay uh, something okay string i'm saying it's a string do you, you know why because i'm going to input two words i'm right now think about this i'm only making a button i'm not bringing any variables yet okay my third step i'll get the actual variables but right now i'm just making the button i'm calling that a parameter okay so i'm going to input make a button with two words as options one called sales other one called profit okay so choose your data type called string your current value ignore it doesn't matter display format nothing in this case to worry about okay now in case of your allowable values okay like i said each radio button gives you a different kind of an experience the previous case we used all values now this time we choose list okay now word of caution this parameter is not case sensitive it is not sensitive in any means it will not throw back any syntax error no matter what you put in okay but we're going to follow four steps we're going to create the parameter and in the third step when you make a calculation in order for your logic to work you need to maintain consistency in step 1 and step 3 in step 3 i'm going to use a calculation logic a switch function which is sensitive by the way it needs an exact match to match so whatever i input in my first step should also be repeated in my third step exactly without a single iota of change that's important okay now here's what i'm proposing to kind of ensure it's full proof now the thing is if you don't follow the step it will not throw back any syntax error at any given time everything will go as per plan but when you guys are testing your actual parameter it will not work and then you'll be wondering what you've got to rectify clean it either here or there make one thing consistent it's a pain might as well just um, get it right the first time so just take a bit of caution right now okay now just to maintain discipline while we're doing this i'm recommending the the following approach now i'm going to input two words sales and a word called profit there's a word called sales it has s with a capital there's a capital s there's profit in singular and with a capital p i'm going to copy the spellings exactly the way it is in all the steps so i'll make sure that this will never go wrong that's my approach towards ensuring that all of us are consistent in this okay now click to add a new value and let's type in the word called sales this is a little manual approach but it's a it's a small task s a l e s okay and click anywhere inside this box it will also do display as sales and it's add one more called profit capital p so again guys make sure that your spelling is right just quick real quick check your system once okay it's sales with the capital s okay profit with the capital p ensure that you have the same spelling so you guys can follow exactly what i'm doing okay if it's different in case if it's wrong please uh, close it and do it again okay all right step one is complete click on okay step one complete what is your second step for the parameter you should show or uh, display the parameter or show the parameter control yeah pretty easy easiest of steps very straight forward notice in your um, shelves to your left side where your dimensions and measures are there all your parameters are also getting listed one below the other okay now go to your sales slash profit parameter just do a right click on it you'll find the option called show parameter control okay right here that's your second step so step one and step two is complete okay and here it is your drop down but right now this will not work because it's a, nothing but a dummy text box you need to activate this by doing steps 3 and 4 okay let's do a third step now where we create a calculation this is actually the actual logic that you got to inc incorporate now it's a simple logic but we'll use it create a calculation guys all of you create a calculation we'll call this calculation as 2 in 1 okay 2 in 1 have you all has anyone used uh, switch function switch case function here yeah the ones who have used that will know what i'm talking about i'm going to use a similar kind of function in tableau right now it is called case it performs what the switch function does okay and uh, in case you have not used it 
well let's use it then you will understand what it is okay now you need to type this formula for me okay type in the word case which is the function case okay and i'm going to get the parameter okay i'm going to say when within quotes sales with a capital s then get the actual sales variable okay first copy the formula then i'll explain to you the logic if you don't get it okay when within quotes profit then the actual profit variable and end the syntax with the end operator just copy this formula and then i'll just walk you through the logic okay so <coughs> So here's the deal. Okay, now um, I've got a parameter called sales slash profit right here. It's a text box. Okay, I've I I entered these words in here myself, sales and profits. Okay, now my step one is complete. Step two, I've shown the parameter. Step three, here's my calculation. Now the case is your switch case function basically. Okay, now that is first going to scrutinize what is in your parameter. This purple colored variable is your parameter. This has two options as a list. Called sales and profit. Again, I'm repeating. You got to be consistent. Sales with a capital S, profit with a capital P. Okay. So that's what I have here now. When I make a selection here in one of these drop downs, it is going to be either a sale or a profit. Okay. Now let's say if it is sales to start with. So the case function is going to see what is the content in this as my selection. So it's going to expect a match for a sale. So it's going to come to your first line, and this sales is going to match with your. Choice that you made in your parameter. The moment this match meets the condition, it's going to bring the actual sales variable in that position. And if I choose a profit, the case is going to have a profit. It looks at the first match. Sale won't match with the profit, so it is going to ignore this line. It's going to come to your second line. If it finds an exact match to match, it's going to throw back a profit. Now, if you guys have made a mismatch of spelling, say in your parameter. Instead of a capital S, you put a small s in your parameter. Then your case is going to look for a sales with a small s. Just imagine hypothetically. Okay, it's going to come to your first line. This sales won't match with the smallest sales. So guess what? What you thought was going to match is going to go down. This also won't match. It go and end it. So your parameter won't work. Hence, that consistency matters. Okay. Is this, is this clear? The logic clear? Okay. Any 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 questions on the logic? Okay. Okay. So we're done. The third step is complete. Click on okay. Your last step is to apply this calculation. Okay. Where do you think it makes sense in this case to apply this calculation? In your columns, exactly. When I have a two in one, who cares about sales anymore, right? So you know what? Let's throw sales away from columns. Don't care about this. Instead, let's take my two in one to my columns. And now it's going to work. And now change your parameter. It's going to change your metric depending on the selection of the variable that you make. Okay, that's what a two-in-one or a let's say a multi-measure or a multi-dimension selection parameter. All right, so um, we'll uh, make some good use of this parameter. Now, this is nothing. This is really to me, it's a one chart. It makes no big deal at all. Uh, this power will become a lot more magnified once you can actually transfer this back to a dashboard. See how this works. So yesterday we made a dashboard. The first one that had like your four metrics, you know, like the four in uh, four four views, your category, your trend, your two maps, and all that. How about we make that into a two in one dashboard now? Okay, and with the help of this parameter, I'm going to pretty much get that now. Okay, so we're going <coughs> to apply this parameter to this dashboard. Okay, all right. So uh, again, four steps of your parameter is going to work. Step one, you're going to create the parameter. In this case, the fact that you worked on the same workbook. You don't have to repeat this one more time. Okay, that's why I made you work on this workbook. Step two will show the parameter. Pretty easy step. Step three, creating a calculator field. Again, you guys don't have to repeat this again because you've just got this on the same workbook. It is lying in here. We don't have to repeat that as well. The last step is what? What's the last step for the parameter? You apply the calculation. Now you got to make sure that you apply the calculation on all the sheets wherever relevant. There are four sheets, <clears throat> so each of the four sheets in its customized spot, you have to.
applied. That's the only thing that you have to do. With that, your dashboard will become a two-in-one dashboard. Okay, and then we do some multiple uh, small small tweaks in that, and we make it better. Okay, so again, um, again, just a quick story. Okay, if I look at my category sales chart here, okay, check this out. Your sales slash profit parameter is there. It will stay consistent. It is per workbook. If you, I mean, it doesn't matter. You can have as many sheets as you want to. You make it one time. You can keep reusing it as many times as you want to. Okay, so that's done here. Step one, it's already made here. It's there in this workbook. Now, step two, <clears throat> I have to show the parameter. Now, all the four charts, okay, the category sales or the trend or the state or the city map, all the four charts, they have access to that parameter. It's a common sense thing because they all, it's the same workbook. They all have access to this. So I can actually use any of the charts to bring it into my report here. That's exactly what I'm going to do now. Okay, now, what I want you guys to do is click on any chart, okay? Choose any chart. Okay, I'm choosing the state map. You may choose anything. Click any other chart. Choose something else. Don't choose the state map, okay? And go to this arrow for more options. <clears throat> and you'll find a tab called parameters. And pick your sales slash profit parameter. Select that. It'll come into your screen and you've shown your parameter, okay? So your step one is done. Your step two is done. Your step three of creating a calculated field is also done because you have a field called two in one, okay? All you have to, you know what, I'll just do one thing. I'll make it into a floating parameter, okay? I don't want to waste space. I'll make it floating. So at least I don't waste space. Okay, yeah. I'll keep it somewhere here, okay? Right, so <clears throat> step one complete, step two complete, step three is also complete. Field called two in one is ready to be used. All I have to do is my last step. The last step is gotta be done four times because there are four charts. Each chart you will individually apply wherever you think it is relevant. So let's go, let's do this together, okay? Let's work uh, along. Even if you know this, just work along with me, okay? I'll go to my first sheet called category sales. Where will I apply the two in one here? In this chart, where will I apply two in one? Where? Where? Sorry? Yes, in the columns. Exactly. Your uh, category sales chart that you guys created yesterday in the first hour. Uh, remove the sales from your columns. Instead, replace that field with your field called two in one. That is step 4A. Step 4A is done. Okay. Let's go to the sales trend chart. Where will you now apply your two in one here? This time, where? In the? In the rows, exactly. Just put your two, take off your sales from your rows and replace that with your two in one. That's your step four B. In your state sales, where will you apply two in one? State sales, where will you apply it? Exactly in the color card, where you have sales in your color card. Just replace your put your two in one in your color card. It will automatically replace it for you. Okay. Don't worry about the colors. If my colors look different, doesn't matter. Yours is the blue and mine is changing colors, doesn't matter. Okay. Just keep applying it. And okay, last chart, city sales. Where would you apply the two in one? Six. Really? Six. Six. Really? I'm saying no. Sorry. Why color? Exactly, there is an, there's an element of profit. Some cities can have negative values as well. Same thing we discussed yesterday. Yes. The story board, you remember we decided not to use size, but to use color for the city. So same logic. Now the fact that I have a two in one metric, I've got to be sensitive where I use it. So if I can use it on color, nothing will go size, nothing will go wrong. I mean, in the sense, it'll not, it's, not, it's not going to throw back an error, but you'll have a silly view, which is not going to make sense. So, well, let's remove sales from the size, okay? Instead, just put the tool on your color card. And again, we discussed this. You guys didn't like the chart. It's again, not about pleasing anyone. It's about being efficient, okay? Even though it's looking light, doesn't matter. And now let's go back to our dashboard and now let's check it out. Okay, now check it out. My metric is saying profit. If I change it to a sale, my whole metric becomes a sale. If I change it to a profit, the whole thing becomes a profit. So in principle, what I've done here is using that one parameter, I've managed to be able to bring in a two-in-one report by just using my parameter. So, I mean, it becomes a lot more powerful. Your dashboard now has two angles to look at. You can use both of the same template and that's a pretty powerful thing to look at. Okay, so... I still want to show you some more last minute tweaks. I want you to focus on my screen for a minute. Okay, look at my screen. 
my screen has a couple of so my present view okay <clears throat> i don't know what your present view is but look at my screen there are a couple of errors there are two, there are a few things that has to be tweaked has to be worked on help me spot the issues here you mentioned one so i'll, I'll let you do not mention okay well I'll, i want the others to uh, kind of plus more point it there are two, huh? yeah what about the titles see exactly it has a change the title has a change all the four titles is talking about category sales or state sales city sales or tri- sales trend it has to now but they're saying profit so that is a big problem okay what's the other issue what he mentioned he mentioned another thing before the break there's a field called uh, two in one do you see that on your x axis two charts have two in one the two in one was done purely for our convenience it was just because we did not know what to name it better so we call it two in one that was our convenience okay now here's the deal as far as two in one is concerned i can't do anything about it i cannot make a change dynamic so i want to hide it i want to hide it okay instead i'm going to make the title change so that's going to be good enough it's going to be better so i'm going to see nice big font the titles will say category sales or profit you know the main title will change names the two in one i'm going to hide it that is what my way to approach this is okay so let's uh, first fix up the two in ones let's first take out the two in ones guys okay so on your x axis for your category sales chart okay just do a right click on the x axis please right click on this and select edit axis okay you're going to have a box to modify the titles of the box you notice here right below axis titles says two in one just uh, clear it from your screen just like backspace it out and close the box it's gone repeat this for the line chart also please the line chart has a two in one metric on your line chart same thing just this time it's a y axis yeah right click on it and repeat the edit axis again one more time okay and just uh select it and just do a backspace it goes off okay and you make close this box that's it so your two ones have been removed it's now making more sense now all we have to do is make the titles to change which we'll do in a minute okay that's easy part so now this word category sales where am i getting this word from where is this coming from the sheet name exactly so currently my sheet name is acting as my title name sheet title okay now that's not going to work that's not going to fly because that is stuck it is set with one metric but i have a two in one metric so i cannot let the sheet name drive the title of my charts i uh, have to construct a sheet name with a dynamic variable now for the sake of constructing the title okay let's see how this works there's a field called category sales now whether i change this metric to a profit or a law or a sale or whatever the word category will remain same it's only the word sale has to become dynamic so one static word one dynamic word similarly this word sale becomes dynamic trend is static state is uh, static the sale is dynamic city is static sale is dynamic so i've got to kind of construct four titles like this for each of these charts easy task so just go to your actual sheet name so you guys can just go take your cursor right on top of your field called category sales just double click over it please it's going to throw the actual title okay or the sheet name that's causing that uh, title delete this this is of no good to us take it out remove this okay let's reconstruct this from scratch type the word category okay that's your static word set from scratch okay and to get the word sale or profit i'm going to now make it dynamic so i'm going to go to this box called insert in the same box in here and you'll find there's a parameter called sales slash profit which by the way contains words called sales and profits whatever we input in the text as text boxes that's the same deal when you hit a selection and just click on okay you'll find that your metric will now change now this has been constructed to work dynamically now check it out if i do a testing if i change this parameter from a sale to a profit look what's going to happen this is going to become dynamic because this is now talking basis your constructed reconstruct title change for the other three charts also repeat this for the other three charts guys okay insert your parameter space trend instead of calling it state sales call it state space and insert the parameter and this is city and you insert your parameter 
So that is my recommended solution for your metrics. It'll change. Now it'll change. Now the dashboard will change. It will. It will change if you construct it like this. You got to change it. You got to make them. You got to do do it four times. Do, repeat this four times. What you did for the first chart, do this four times. For all the charts, you have to individually reconstruct it because each one has a different setting, right? So you have to do the same step four times. That's when it's going to work. Okay. That's it. With that, your dashboard is a lot more efficient and bug free. Okay. Okay. So uh, I want to show one more use of this parameter. Same parameter. Now, see, I told you guys. When you start with parameters, name it right. There's a reason why I made you name it right. Because your one parameter, if you notice, is able to control four charts. Is able to control four titles. So you've already done eight controls. Okay. I'll show you a completely different use for the same parameter. Completely very different. Right now, we're just changing the metric. I'll show you a feature how I can sort the data using parameters. Same parameter. Same parameter. Okay. Just to give you another idea of what all it can do. I mean, again, it's just a very simple example, but there's so many more things you can do. It's like it's like mind blowing. Okay, so let's do one thing. Is everyone done here? Is, can I move on from here? Have you all finished this uh, this change? Okay, yeah. All right. Open up another chart, please. Make another chart. I want you guys to make a bar chart for me. Okay, drag and drop your sub categories to your rows, please. Okay. Drag and drop your sales to your columns. Okay. And uh, drag and drop your profit to your color. The same bar chart we made yesterday. We saw this chart yesterday so many times. Okay. Now, I have two metrics, sales and profits. So suppose if I decide to sort this bar chart in the descending order of sales, which item would go on top? Phones. Okay. Okay. Now let's rechange. Suppose I decide to sort this in the descending order of profit. Which item would go on top? Profit. Copiers. Copiers. Right. I can use this parameter to do this for me. Same parameter. I'll show this to you. Okay. Let's work on the same thing. Again, four steps. Step one, you create the parameter. Step two, you show the parameter. Let's show the parameter here. Sales says profit. So please go ahead, guys. Right click and show this parameter control. Okay, so your step one is done. Step two is also done. Step three, you made this formula called two and one. I'll use that. Same formula, same exact same formula. Just the place in which I'm going to apply is going to differ, and that will give you a complete different feel altogether. Okay, so check out for a minute. Okay, now, see here I'm not trying to replace this column with another column, but I just want that parameter to be sorting my They chart for me. So I'm going to show you something now. Yesterday when I sorted the data, I told you that there are multiple ways of sorting. I don't know if you guys are correct. There are two ways of sorting data, by the way. Okay. There is a static sorting technique. There's also a dynamic sorting technique. Okay. Now, the toolbars that we've been sorting so far, they are static. So you guys don't use that technique right now. Now this can either do a descending or descending. Okay, doesn't matter. It's one of these two. There are a couple of more places to do the same kind of sorting, and that is if you actually hover on top of your bar here. Just check it out, F figure it out. Okay, this will give you a static, ascending, descending, and alphabetical. Same thing if you click on the sale axis or the x-axis. Same thing, ascending, descending, and alphabetical. You can get all these sorts. Okay, now all these three sorts are static sorts. I will not sort it. Now here's the thing: the ones I, I make you guys do a dynamic sort. After that. Don't do a static sort because then your static will replace your dynamic. If you set your dynamic, take your hands off the sorting button once and for all. Okay, that's the that's the thing. Now I'll show you how to do a dynamic sort. Okay. Now I want you guys to and, and again I want you guys to right click on your dimension called subcategory. You'll find an option called sort. Select that. Okay. Now. Once you guys are in the sorting control box in here, okay, you can sort it based on multiple techniques. Let's just say I want to sort it not on the data source order, but I want to sort the data using a field. My field is called two and one. There, it picked up the field name, the first one. So that's my two and one. Okay, so that's done by default. And you want to keep it ascending? Keep it ascending. Doesn't matter. No harm. Okay. And close this box, please. 
So now check it out. You have done a sorting ascending order of profit and automatically your orange, darkest orange has gone on top because table is the least profit maker and your copy is the highest profit maker. It has taken the ascending gradual sort of your profits. And now when I make it to a sale, you notice that the length of the bar will do the dominate, will, will kind of do the sorting. So now it's doing a sorting as per your sales. And it's a parameter doing this. So the same parameter is actually even helping you sort data. So the point I'm trying to make here is name your parameters right. And I just gave, I just gave you a little very brief thing. I mean, if you keep exploring, there are so many more things parameters can do. It's, it can do crazy things. Okay. Um, so naming your parameters very, very important. Naming it right is very important. Okay. So that's the deal. All right. So let's uh, do one thing. Let's now create some special charts, custom special charts. Okay. And a uh, couple of them, uh, quite a few of them are there. In fact, let's explore them all. Open up a new sheet, guys. Before we start creating these custom charts, okay, uh, a little bit of background or a bit of uh, working on some fields will help you guys out. So I'm going to introduce you to something called as something called as quick table calculations. They are inbuilt calculations. Unlike what you did in the first half today, you guys don't have to create manual calculations. Okay, that's the good part. You just need to understand simple English and understand what math that is doing for you when you read it, okay? And if you all have uh, worked on pivot tables a lot, you would have seen these functions before. This will not seem very unfamiliar to you. So I'll, I'll show you what it is, okay? But let's first do one thing. I first want to construct a table and I want you guys to do it yourself, the ones who at, at, at least, okay? So what I want you guys to do is in your columns, in your columns, I want to see all the four years of data, okay? 15, 16, 17, 18, four years. In my rows, I want to have months from Jan through December. Okay, so in my rows, again, just make a mental note. In my rows, Jan through December. In my columns, 2015, 16, 17, 18. I'll have a structure of a table. Make a pivot table for sales. Please make it yourself. Columns is years. Rows is months. In the pivot, and then you'll have a structure. Make a pivot table for sales. Columns will be years. Rows is months and uh, a pivot table for sales, okay? How many, any more done? How many more? Just give me a tally, okay? Okay, some more numbers are going up. Okay, that's right, no one there? there. Who is not even where to start? Give me a show of hands, who's not even started yet? So guys, I'll give you a clue. The ones who are uh, uh, still not gone, I'll give you a clue. You've got to choose the correct field. The field is a date field. A date field contains years and months. That's the clue. From there, try and get it out. Take the error date. Take order date, that's good enough. Can I just see one more time how many if you got it? Just one more time just to get a... Okay, good. Okay, good deal. Okay. Let me give you the answer. The ones who haven't got it, guys, you can now look at me. Okay? Guys, the ones who haven't got it, please... Uh, yeah, once who haven't got it, please look at me and, and get it out. Okay? I'm going to work it out now. So let's not waste more time. Drag and drop your order date into your columns. You're going to see years. There are my four years. I click on the plus symbol twice. I get years and quarters. Year, quarter, month. I don't need the quarters, so I'm going to get through the quarters away. I've got year and month. I just put a months to my rows. I have the structure of my table done. And I bring in sales inside this box called ABC. And that's my pivot table. Okay. It's a two second task. Okay. Now, I'd like to perform some, some simple calculations here. Okay. Let's just say when I have this data, okay, now I'm going to give you some, um, again, if you, again, you just got to understand simple English. You don't need to really worry about what math is happening because you try and do the math yourself or the logic yourself, it's going to be pretty complex. It can do some really complicated formulas by just doing some simple clicks. So you've got to kind of navigate a little bit here. We will really figure it out. It's pretty easy. Okay. It's just about comfort factor. Now, these are called as quick table calculations. You don't have to create a conventional calculation like we did in the morning. Okay, now, the way this works here is, if you see any measure that is being applied on a chart, you'll drive a calculation from that measure. Okay, now say sales is my measure, which is currently being used as a text field in my chart, hence it's come as a pivot table. Okay, so I'm going to go and right click on the sales in here. Okay, now, once I give it a click, I notice something called as quick table calculation, my last but one option. And when I actually look at that tab there, I see all the calculations. This is it. 
it's really about trying to get comfortable with this. This is all it is. Okay. Now, let me th- throw a small situation and see if you guys can guess it right. What I'm interested here is to do a couple of things. I want to see if I'm, if I have, if I have shown. I mean, I want to create a couple of views, two views. Okay. One separate time. I want to see if I've been able to have, if I'm able to find a growth over the same period last month, month on month growth. Okay. I'd also like to see if I'm able to see if I'm growing over year over year or whatever kinds in here. What function do you think you might want to show here? Person difference. Okay. Okay. Let's say, okay, let's for a minute, um, say between the month of Jan and Feb, okay, the first year to 2015, Jan uh, to 2015 was $14,237. Okay. Feb was 4520. There's been a degrowth. Okay. If I need to show this as a percentage, what's the actual formula in here? Exactly, Feb minus Jan divided by Jan, the whole thing has a percentage, okay? Okay, Feb minus Jan, current period minus the previous period divided by the previous period, it times 100 is your percentage difference. If you had a growth, it'll be positive. If you had a degrowth, it'll be negative. That's the other actual math in here, okay? I'm going to now construct this now. So I can do the same thing for, uh, if I go on left to right, it becomes year to date. If I go down, it becomes month to date. So I'm going to look at both options and play around with this. Let's do the person difference. Whenever you guys use your quick table calculation, just kind of scrutinize it. Okay, don't just blindly trust it because you know you never know what settings it might pick up by default. If especially if, if you don't know the first time. Okay. Now um, year on year, but I don't know. Okay, now again, okay. Why it's taken year on year? I have another question for you. Okay, now that you're mentioning it, this number of one thirty-seven point one percent that you said is year on year. Okay, how do you interpret this number? How do you interpret this number? Has it, okay, uh, my question is, do you think it has it grown from a period of 2017 or 15? Absolutely, can't say, Ex- that's the response, I can't say, yeah, can't say is the response is exactly what you should be saying, okay? You got to find that out, exactly what I wanted. Okay, now, let's see how, I, I can do both, by the way. The ones who said 17, I can make it 15. The ones who said uh, 15, I can make it 17. I can make it even 16, I can make any number or some number of my choice. I can put any number, okay? Now, I want to know how to get this, how to really crack this. Let's see first what the deal is, then we can change it. Now, once you guys create this, go back to your, okay, one more thing. This is, by the way, uh, a calculation that is basically embedded. Now, this has done some math. Current year divided by the previous year, uh, current year minus the previous year divided by the previous year times 100. That formula is done here, right? Which is why you see them from actual dollars into percentages. You will not find a calculation for this. But you notice one thing about this chart. Your sum of sales contains a triangular icon in it. It has an embedded calculation within it. That's what it is. Okay. And hence, this person difference. And if I want to tweak it to 2015 or 16 or 18 or whatever, I can tweak it. Now, go back to your sum of sales. A couple of things to play with. Just two places. You can either look at a compute using. Okay. Table across. That's fine. Table across is year to date. Okay. There's an option called relative to. And it tells me exactly what is my comparison against. So it says it's your previous cell as your comparison. And hence, now you can answer your question with, with, with 100% assurance. Now I know for a fact exactly how it's happening. If I wanted 2015, I can still make it here. If I wanted 20s, uh, the previous year, I can still do whatever. So I pretty much have what my choices are. So now I know it's the previous year. So 137.1% is a growth over 2017. So I know this now. Okay, great. Now, 2015 obviously won't have because it does not have a 2014 as a comparison against. That's the deal. Okay, let's do a month on month growth now. Okay, same same data. Go back to your sum of sales. Let's do a compute using table down. That's going to give me a month on month difference. Month over, okay. So now I can tell, I can exactly tell you what is my growth over same period last month. Okay. Great. Now, just one other point. While I have this view, period over last month is good. See, now, in my previous data where I had the year over year growth, 2015 did not have a 14 to compare it. So I was not going to get any values for 2015. But now, um, I can see that all my jans have gone blank. Okay? Because every year is taken as a discrete point. That's the deal. But I don't want that to happen. I want to say, hey, listen, Jan 2015 is the only exception where I'm where is the only place where I'm willing to make an exception. All the other months, I have a month to try to compare it against. Your Jan 2016 has a December 2015. Your Jan 17 has a December 16. So everything has a previous month to compare it against. I want to use those values to compare it now. I want to get that. 